This is Never Fall for Your One That Got Away, book four in the It's Complicated series, written by Kate O'Keefe, narrated by Holly Warren, produced by Blake Long Audio. Chapter One Don't panic. Don't panic. I've got to keep it together. I take a steadying breath as I glance over at him once more, and my heart leaps into my mouth. Dang it! I'm panicking. Don't get me wrong. I'm trying to stay cool, calm, and collected. Really trying. But right now... My brain is sparking alert messages at multiple synapses. My heart is racing like it's a greyhound at the track, and my urge to run is almost overwhelming. He's here, right in front of me. The one that got away. The one I haven't seen since, well, it's been a while. Almost twelve years, in fact. I blink a few times hoping he's a mere figment of my imagination, that I've had too much champagne, despite the fact I know I've been sipping a lemonade all evening. Perhaps I've somehow dreamt him up and he's not really here in this room, mingling with the other wedding guests. The thought has my hopes rising. But each time I open my eyes, there he is, staring right back at me. Noah Grant. What's more, he looks ridiculously handsome in a navy suit and tie, his crisp white shirt showing off his gorgeous olive complexion. His dark hair is longer than I remember, but his eyes are just as piercing, his features so familiar, but somehow different. Grown up, I suppose. There have got to be worse things in this life than the guy who stole your heart turning up out of the blue, right? Only, I'm finding it hard to think what, exactly. Maybe having all your teeth pulled out by a jittery octogenarian with a pair of rusty pliers. Or giving birth to a set of ten-pound quadruplets on the dirt floor of an African hut, with flies buzzing around your head and dung beetles dive-bombing your face. Yup. Worse. You see, the thing is, Noah Grant may be the one that got away, but it's me who let him go, me who ended things with him, me who broke my own heart. And right now, that past is about to walk across the room towards me. I've got no choice. Really, I don't. I do what any self-respecting coward would do. I run. Fast. There's no time to even mutter a word to my friend Lottie or any of the other wedding guests. No time. I turn on my heel and stumble through the crowd in search of the exit. Luckily, since it's my local pub, I know the black cat like the back of my hand. And before you can say, the one that got away is back, I've made my way through the hot, aromatic kitchen and out into the warm summer evening in the alleyway. I don't pause to take in the less than salubrious sights. I kick off my heels and collect them in one hand as I bunch up the long skirt of my Kate Middleton-inspired evening dress in the other. Without a backward glance, I sprint across the cobblestones, down the thin alleyway and out onto the adjacent street. I don't stop until I get several streets away, until I'm sure he's not following me. But then why would he follow me, the crazy ex-girlfriend who bolted at the first sight of him? He's probably back at the pub, smiling to himself as he shakes his head over what a lucky escape he had back then. I reach a small park where I come to a stop, panting hard, my heart pounding so hard it's in danger of bruising my ribs. I can't believe Noah is here. And he looked good. So good. Too good, if you ask me. I mean, of course he was always a thoroughly handsome guy. Even Prue agreed, despite what she referred to as his rough-and-ready working-class roots. So Prue. 
With his dark features, strong jawline, thick scruffy hair and deep soulful eyes, he looks like he's still in the great shape he was as a teenager. Back when he took my breath away, that fateful day my car broke down when I was just sixteen. It was the start of something big, something I've never been able to get over. Don't get me wrong, I never believed in anything as wishy-washy as love at first sight, so not my style. I'm Tabitha Green, queen of the skeptics, one snarky girl who doesn't suffer fools. But that day, on the quiet country lane lined with stone fences, the rolling green hills bathed in the soft summer sun, when he appeared in a pair of form-hugging jeans and a t-shirt, his hair scruffy and sexy, well, let's just say this cynic became a believer, and I swear I began to fall for him before he'd even uttered a single word. He was the local mechanics boy, an only child who would one day grow up to walk in his father's footsteps. Grant Motors was not only his namesake, but his destiny too. We all knew it. He had his life mapped out for him, just like I did. I might have been the girl from the big house down the road. I might have come from another world. But that day on the country lane, none of that mattered. I shake my head and huff out a breath. I refuse to go back there. I refuse to allow myself to feel those feelings, to remember what it was like to be with Noah Grant, to want him again. I've spent too many years trying to forget him, trying to forget that I threw it all away. Only now that I've seen him once again, the one thing I feared is banging loudly on my door, determined to break down my walls, determined to get in the fear that has haunted me all this time. I'm still not over, Noah Grant. Chapter Two Thirteen Years Ago I let out a light laugh as my car careens around a corner on the familiar, narrow, winding country road. I'm enjoying the wind in my hair, and the sense of total freedom that comes with being 16 and having the whole summer before me, and in possession of my full driver's license and first ever car at that bliss. I adore my yellow convertible VW Beetle with its bud vase on the dashboard in which I always make sure to have my favourite flower. It's the little things, you know. And then he asked me whether I wanted to go out for supper, Prue says. And I looked at him and said, Supper? Have you utterly lost your mind? I don't like you and I'm fairly certain you don't like me. I flick my gaze briefly at my friend sitting in the passenger seat. Prudence Cosworth Farnham, although I call her Prue because seriously, what a mouthful. And I have been friends since we suffered through Madame Janique's French class at boarding school together. Now that summer's here, we are planning on having some serious fun together, particularly since I just got my license. That's all very well and good, Prue, but there's one problem, I tell her as I turn off one country lane and onto another. You do like him and you are fairly certain he likes you, and I'm absolutely certain you would love to have any meal with him. She beams at me. That's precisely why we kissed. You kissed? I guffaw, as my wheels roll over the grass verge and I narrowly miss scraping the side of the car against the stone fence that lines the road. Prue grips the door handle. Oops. I'll try harder to stay on the road, shall I? Good plan, she replies with a laugh. Oh, Tabby, it was wonderful, just as I imagined. Prue gushes. His lips were soft and full and he smelt of a summer meadow. 
Is that because you were in a summer meadow at the time? Prue crosses her arms across her chest and fixes me with her glare. Don't be so cynical. It was marvellous, and we're going out again on Friday. She gazes out the window. Isn't summer the best? I imagine it is when you're dating Angus Blythe Jones, the most handsome and popular boy we know, I reply with a sardonic smile. Oh, he is handsome, isn't he? His father is the richest person in the country, after the Queen and a handful of others you know. Isn't that fantastic? My friend Prue is deeply impressed by wealth. So it'll be champagne and caviar for breakfast, lunch and dinner for Prue from now on, will it? She lets out a contented sigh. I can only hope. As I round the next corner, the road widens and I press my foot down on the accelerator pedal, telling her, Hold on to your hat. We're going to see what this baby can do. Are you sure? She asks, her voice tinged with concern. Absolutely. But instead of lurching ahead, my car does the exact opposite, gradually slowing as though someone has ripped the power from its engine and it's suddenly forgotten how to propel itself forward. I pump the accelerator. Nothing. I pump it again. Still nothing. Uh-oh. What is it? The car slows until it finally comes to a grinding halt, right in the middle of the quiet country lane. The engine cuts out, and the only sound is a chewing sound coming from a cow watching us from the adjacent field. What's happened to your car? It stopped. I can see that. Try turning the key off and on again. See if that works. It's not a computer that needs rebooting. I do it anyway. I get nothing. Not even the engine turning over. It's completely dead. You'll need to look at the engine and find out what's wrong. I give her a sideways glance. How many engines have you fixed in your life? The problem might be obvious. Something might have come loose or a cap has fallen off or something like that. I pull my lips into a dubious line. I'm not sure caps falling off things in engines is such a common issue. Come on, let's at least take a look. Prue climbs out of the car. Pop the bonnet, will you? I scan the dashboard. How? I don't know, it's your car. I've had it for three days, you know that. I reply in irritation because where the heck is the bonnet popper button thingamajig when you actually need it? Come on, Tabby. We need to be at the party in less than half an hour, Prue complains. Finally, I locate a lever that has an image of a car with an open bonnet on it, and I pull. The bonnet makes a clicking sound and I leap out of the car and pull it open remembering how Mrs. Barton had taught us how to use the metal stick to hold it open in that boring car maintenance lesson last term, the lesson I now wish I'd paid significantly more attention to. You look like you know what you're doing, Prue says, as she and I both peer in at the hot engine, emitting a strong aroma of metal and petrol and engine. Believe me, I don't. What's wrong with it? I've got no idea. I chew on the inside of my mouth as I regard it through an inexpert eye. Nothing steaming, nothing looks broken, and there are certainly no lids missing from anything. Maybe we should call someone, I suggest. Good idea. Call your dad. He can pick us up and take us to the party. I collect my mobile from my handbag on the back seat and press my dad's number. It doesn't ring. I pull my brows together and look back at the screen. Great, no service. Give it to me. Prue snatches the phone from my hand and paces the empty road, holding it up in the air and squinting at it. Anything? Nothing, 
Not even one solitary bar. What are we going to do? We could walk. We both look down at our feet. We're wearing high-heeled strappy sandals, built for short, tottering walks and making our legs look good. Not traipsing along country lanes, miles from anywhere. The cow in the field gazes at us, still chewing on her cud. What are you looking at? I ask her peevishly. There's a roll of thunder as dark clouds appear over the horizon, a cool wind whipping up around us, coming out of seemingly nowhere. You have got to be kidding me, I growl as I shiver in my summer dress. I push out a defeated breath. No car and no phone coverage mean we're simply going to have to walk. We can't wait here and expect some knight in shining armour to roll up and save us. Or can we? No, Prue, we can't, no matter how many rom-coms you've watched. Prue nudges me with her elbow. Look. She's staring in the direction from which we came, and a new sound enters my consciousness. A low hum, like an engine. I turn to see a vehicle moving slowly towards us as it winds along the road. Oh, thank goodness! I reach up and wave my arms in the air to signal the driver. See? Knight in shining armour, Prue says with a smirk. As the vehicle comes to a stop, I let out a relieved puff of air. It's a truck. That's a good sign. A very good sign, babe. Let's hope the guy driving is hot. As the words leave her mouth, the door to the truck swings open and down steps a young guy with tanned skin, tussled hair, and the kind of sexy confidence you get from knowing who you are and what you're about. Wearing an ill-advised white t-shirt with smears of oil across the chest, his muscular arms look strong and dependable as he saunters towards us in a pair of slim-fitting jeans and sturdy work boots. Car trouble? He asks in a deep, velvety American voice, and as his eyes lock onto mine, my belly does a Herculean flip. I know him. Yeah, we, uh, broke down, I reply, my mind scrambling. He looks so familiar, different, like I know him from somewhere, but I can't quite place him. And then it clicks. Noah Grant. The boy who moved to Marlingworth from America when we were ten. The boy who put a warm, muddy worm down the back of my dress, making me scream. Back then, he was the new boy with an accent I'd only ever heard on TV. Sure, he was cute, but there were only hints of the guy he'd turn into. And now here he is, seven years later, looking every inch like a dependable and deeply sexy working-class hero here to save us. Really, it's enough to make a girl swoon. Not that I go for that kind of thing, you understand. I'm far too mature and sophisticated. I know you. You're Tabitha Green, right? He asks. Noah? I question. His gaze intensifies for a beat before his face creases in recognition. It's been a while. It has. It's been a long while. You... You grew up, I say, and instantly regret it. I mean, who says something like that? An idiot, that's who. Noah's mouth curves into a relaxed smile that somehow reaches inside of me and tugs at my belly. Hard. I see you grew up too, he replies his eyes skimming briefly over me, making every part of my body tingle. I gesture at his truck. No worms in there? He pulls his brows together. Worms? You put one down the back of my dress when we were ten. 
His lips curve into a sexy smile, and I swear, my heart skips a beat. Sorry about that. It's fine, I shrug, trying my best to appear as though standing on this country lane, talking to the hottest guy I've seen in the flesh in my life, is no big deal. No worms, he tells me. We stand and gaze at one another as a bunch of memories flood my mind. He was a cute ten-year-old when he arrived in the village, but now? Now he's a tall, strong guy with bulging biceps and wide shoulders, his t-shirt doing little to conceal his taut chest and belly. A guy who is currently staring at me as though he could devour me in one bite. I swallow. Tabby, you know this guy? Prue asks, snapping me out of my Noah Grant-induced daze. And oh my, what a daze. I offer her a sheepish grin as I reluctantly pull my eyes from his. I knew Noah before I left for boarding school. He's from Marlingworth. She used to tease me and the other boys, Noah says. Prue cocks an eyebrow. That sounds like Tabby. My cheeks warm. How have you been? I ask him. It's been what, seven years since I last saw you? About that? I've been good. Life, you know. You? Good, great. Just finished school for the summer, which I imagine you have too. No, I left a while back. You did? Not much point in sticking around, really. I knew what I wanted to do with my life, and I couldn't see how algebra could help me in the real world. No one can, I reply, and we share a smile that sets my heart racing. Wow, Noah Grant, here, looking like that. Did I die and go to hot guy heaven? I clear my throat. <clears> throat> Are you working for your dad? Yeah, as you can see. He gestures at the truck behind him, and for the first time I read the words Grant Motors, written in bold navy lettering across the side. You're a mechanic. Training to be one. You always wanted to take over your dad's business, and now here you are doing it. It's impressive. Prue snorts beside me. Prue, the friend I had completely forgotten about while I basked in Noah's attention. I glare at her. What? She asks innocently. She knows what. She's being a snob. He nods at the bonnet, held in place by the metal rod. You broken down? He's awfully pretty, but not so bright, Prue says as she taps the side of her head but she says it so sweetly I can tell Noah isn't sure whether she's serious or not. I grind my teeth and glare at her. I know exactly how she means it. The car just sort of stopped for no reason, I tell him. It's brand new, so I don't know what's going on. Do you think you could have a look at it for us? Of course I can. He saunters over to my car and I try my best not to notice how he moves. Okay, I don't really try that hard, or at all, really. Sue me, the guy is ridiculously good to look at. Let me see. He begins to check things in the engine. Close your mouth, you're drooling, Prue whispers, and I instantly clamp my mouth shut because she's probably right. We wait as he inspects the engine, leaning his hands on the edge of the car. After a while, he strides around to the driver's side of the car, pulls the door open, and slips inside, his bulk filling the small space. Your boyhood friend grew up nicely, Prue tells me, as she waggles her brows at me. Shh, he'll hear you. So what? He might be a bit of eye candy, but it's not like he's in your league, babe. I pull my brows together. How so? A trainee mechanic. Please, 
He's no Magnus Gainsborough, that's for certain. I think of Magnus with his ready smile and mop of pale blonde hair. Although he's as tall as Noah, he lacks his muscularity and presence, and Magnus, sure as heck, doesn't look at me the way Noah did just now. Noah's a great guy, and he's trying to help us right now. Just stating the facts, babe. You know you're blushing. My hand flies to my cheeks. No, I'm not. It's hot in the sun, that's all. As though to mock me, the dark clouds amassing above our heads rumble, and a couple of large plops of rain fall on us. Noah emerges from the car. I've worked out the problem. That was quick. Wait here. He goes over to his truck and pulls out a red can with a long spout, which he proceeds to pour into the tank of my car. Realization dawns on me. It's official. I'm an idiot. As Noah clicks the petrol cap into place, I say, I was out of petrol, wasn't I? Yep. Oh, Tabby, Prue complains. He slides into the driver's seat and turns the ignition. My car starts up immediately. I scrunch my eyes shut in embarrassment. You've got enough to get to the nearest petrol station in Marlingworth. He leaves the car running and climbs out, rising to his full height beside me. My heart rate peaks as I stare up at him. I'm really dumb, aren't I? I give him a self-deprecating smile because running out of petrol on day three of car ownership is nothing if not totally dumb. His smile is soft and kind. It's an easy mistake to make. Yeah, if you're an imbecile, Prue says as she pulls the passenger door open and climbs in. I raise my eyes to Noah's once more and notice him watching me closely. There's a softness in his eyes that has my throat drying. It was good to see you again, he says. As I gaze at him, my breath hitches in my throat. I've never been one to believe in fairy tales. I've never even believed in happily ever afters. My parents' marriage put paid to any fantasies about that many years ago. They're Mr. and Mrs. barely tolerating one another even though they're still married. But as I stand and gaze into Noah's eyes on the country lane, with rain beginning to fall down around us, and the cow with the big brown eyes observing our every move, I know I believe in fate. Fate made me forget to put petrol in my car. Fate had Noah driving down this country lane at the exact time I needed him. Fate brought us together. Tell me if I've read this wrong, but would you like to get together later? He asks. I've got a party with Prue and... I press my lips together. What am I doing? I can blow off a party at Magnus Gainsborough's place. He's nothing to Noah. Hey, I just thought I'd ask. He shoots me a smile and then turns to leave. I place my hand on his arm and he looks back at me. I'd love to get together with you. Meet me under the old oak tree down by the river at eight? Sure. His face breaks into a smile that has me melting, and I smile back at him, my mind filled with the oddest thought that somehow... I'm meant to be with Noah Grant forever, and I couldn't wait for forever to begin. Chapter Three Who knows? It could just be indigestion. The wedding food was awfully rich, Lottie offers, as she leans back against my sofa cushion, propped up against the wall in my small garden flat a glass of wine in her hand. Indigestion? Zara questions, her brows raised. Lottie, no one in their right mind confuses indigestion with the whirlpool of emotions involved in bumping into your ex. Indigestion affects your chest, 
just like love does, she explains with a sardonic smile that tells us she's not exactly serious about her proposed hypothesis. That is the craziest thing I've heard all day, Zara replies with a head shake, clearly not catching Lottie's tone. It's not like Tabitha can just drink some Gaviscon and be done with it. But wouldn't that be amazing if she could? Lottie says. It'd be called Exicon. Gaviscon and X mashed together. Exicon. Kennedy regards us through amused, expectant eyes. Zara has just taken a sip of her wine, and as she snort giggles, she spits some of it. Nicey, Kennedy complains. It's your fault for making a joke while I'm drinking, Zara complains. I can't schedule my comedic brilliance with your sipping schedule, you know, Kennedy replies. I push out a breath. I could do with some exicon. Right now, I would give anything to be able to take some sweet, chalky medicine to deal with my Noah Grant reappearing suddenly in my life induced symptoms. I was right that day on the country lane. Well, I was right for 15 months anyway. After Prue and I had driven away, I'd put in the briefest of appearances at Magnus's party before I left to meet Noah. After filling up at the local petrol station, of course. There was no way I was going to have that embarrassment twice. We'd spent the evening talking holding hands and sharing our hopes for the future, and when we said goodnight, I'd hoped we might kiss. But I had to wait for that. Instead, he told me he could meet me after work the following day, and that summer, and the year afterwards, we spent as much time as possible together, sharing everything. Fifteen months of Noah. Fifteen months of love. I'll just pop down to Boots the chemist to see what they've got, shall I? Zara teases, pulling me back from my memories. Kennedy smiles. I wonder which aisle they'd have Exicon in. Exes and other nuisances, I bet. Zara lets out another giggle. Oh no, it'd probably be in hair removal. You could get an ex-boyfriend wax strip to rip those feelings right out. She mimics waxing. Ouch! Lottie declares with a giggle, and all three of them erupt into peals of laughter. I, on the other hand, pull my lips into a grim line. I'm so pleased my current heart-wrenching predicament is the cause for such enjoyment for you all, I grump. Sorry, babe, Lottie replies. More chocolate? She thrusts one of the bars of creamy galaxy chocolate at me that we've been munching on for the last half hour. Really, I should be on a sugar high right now, but it's not even touching the sides. Wow, who knew chocolate was no match for the reappearance of Noah Grant? I did, people, I did. Why did I give up alcohol again? I ask more to myself than anyone else. I could really do with a drink about now. Because you were partying way too much and we were worried about you, Lottie says, and my other two friends nod their agreement. I know she's right. I had found that I was enjoying a glass or two a little too much of an evening, as in a lot too much. All my friends had noticed and Lottie had given me the hard word on more than one occasion. The problem was, I found it much easier to loosen up and forget about everything with a glass of wine in my hand. Back in February, it hit me. I was in the last year of my twenties and was still acting like I was a student. Sure, I didn't have a man in my life the way my friends all did, and I'm not all loved up and happy either. But waking up with a hangover far too regularly wasn't how I expected to be living my life at 29. Something had to give, and for me, 
going cold turkey was the most sensible thing to do. I gave up my parting ways. I grew up, I suppose. Don't get me wrong, I didn't have some huge drinking problem. I wasn't about to get carted off to a rehab facility somewhere and have to bear my soul about everything in my life. I just never really stopped when my friends had. But now I had, and I was so much happier with my life. There's no way I'm going back to those days, not even with the sudden and unexpected reappearance of one Noah Grant, even though I'd be lying if I said that losing Noah wasn't a huge part of that. You see, it's hard to move on when you realise you've made the biggest mistake of your life. Perhaps I should have scheduled my life-changing epiphany for after my ex showed up. I tell my friends. Don't be silly. You're doing so much better now, babe, Lottie says. Eat chocolate instead. I snap off a piece and shove it in my mouth, allowing the milky, creamy treat to melt. Kennedy's Boston Terrier, Lady M, watches me closely as I chew. Sorry, girl. Dog poison. I tell her, and she seems to understand, lowering her head back down and letting out a snort before she resumes sleeping. All jokes aside, with this guy now here in London, we need to come up with a strategy to help Tabitha deal with him, Kennedy proclaims. We don't know that he's actually living here. I mean, of course he's here right now because he was at Stanley's wedding tonight, but he might have just been visiting. Lottie says, and my hopes surge before they plummet once more. Seeing him again would be hard, unsettling, nerve-wracking. But equally, part of me wants to see him again, and that part needs to be immediately smashed with the world's largest flyswat. I'm not a masochist. Zara pats her dog Stevie, who's curled up next to her on the sofa. Who knows? He could have hopped on a train after we followed Tabitha here and already be back where he came from by now. Lottie gives a firm nod of her head. People travel from all over the country to go to weddings. And anyway, even if he does live in London now, it's a big city. Tabitha can go the rest of her life without ever seeing the guy again. Isn't that right? Oh, completely right. I reply, my mood lightening at the thought. The odds you'll see him again are so low, babe, Zara confirms with a sage nod of her head. You'll probably go another twelve years without having to see the guy. By then you'll be over forty, Kennedy says, winning a glare from me. I cross my arms. I'm still only twenty-nine, thank you very much. Not for long. Lottie trills with a grin, as though me turning 30 in a couple of weeks is a good thing. Because it's not. Not in the least. When you're 30, you're supposed to have your life together. And my life is still a major work in progress. Ralph, the British bulldog, snorts loudly in his sleep by Lottie's feet, temporarily grabbing our attention. Although Ralph is Lottie's boyfriend's dog... He adores both Lottie and visiting Stevie and Lady M, the three canine besties. Kennedy raises a finger, and we all turn to look at her. One problem. What? I don't want problems, I say. I think you might have to see him again, she replies, her pretty face scrunched up. Kennedy, why would you say something like that? Lottie scolds. Why, indeed. She shrugs. Because it might be the truth. You know how I've been living in the flat above the black cat? I'm pretty sure Noah lives nearby. I've seen him at the pub. She pulls an, I'm sorry to have to tell you this face. More than once. What? I ask, my voice breathless as my pulse quickens. The lightness I was feeling only moments ago fills with lead and plummets to the floor. The black cat is only three blocks from where we're sitting right now.
Three blocks isn't very far, especially not for a long-limbed man in great shape like Noah Grant. I swallow. When have you seen him? Well, you know how much Charlie loves the black cat's cottage pie? Kennedy questions and we all nod. Everyone knows how much Charlie likes the black cat's cottage pie. Well, we eat at the pub most Tuesday evenings and sometimes at the weekend, too. Seriously, I think I've had enough cottage pie to last me a lifetime. I mean, I like it, don't get me wrong, but it's not like it's a burrito. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you definitely have to be in the mood for cottage pie, Zara agrees. And it's a winter meal more than a summer one, don't you think? Too heavy, Lottie states. Charlie thinks it's a meal for all seasons. I'm thinking of getting him a bumper sticker that says that for his birthday. Kennedy replies. Lottie scrunches up her nose. That's too cute. Ahem. I clear my throat to put a stop to this irrelevant cottage pie conversation right now. Shall we focus on the real point here? Right. Sorry. Kennedy replies. We've seen your Noah there a bunch of times. He's not my Noah, I snap. Not anymore, anyway. Okay, we've seen the Noah. Is that better? No, I grump. None of this is better. We actually had a brief chat with him one time at the bar when we were ordering. But of course, I had no clue who he was. I figured that he was just some friendly local guy, and then when I saw him tonight, I remembered. Wha- what did you talk about? I ask, not even sure I want to know. Cottage pie? Kennedy replies. Zara rolls her eyes. Of course you did. When you seen him, was he on his own or with someone? Lottie asks. What a weird question. Why are you asking that? Zara questions. Isn't it obvious? If he's on his own, it could mean he's single, which could be of interest to certain people in this room. Lottie flicks her gaze to me. I cock an eyebrow in her direction. You're matchmaking me with my ex now. You cannot be serious. Zara shoots Lottie a pointed look. She's not serious, are you? She shrugs. I think it'd be awfully romantic. The guy who stole your heart all those years ago is back to claim you as his forever love. It's like a plot to a movie. I snort. A horror movie? I was envisioning it more as a rom-com, not a horror, Lottie replies. I can tell you one thing for certain. Noah Grant doesn't want to come within a 50-mile radius of me, let alone claim me as his forever love. I make the bunny ears gesture. It looked to me like he was going to come over to talk to you at the wedding reception, Lottie replies. An image of Noah looking outrageously handsome in his dapper, slim-fitting navy suit, his eyes locked with intent on mine, flashes through my mind. Lottie's right. He was coming to talk to me. I know it. But why? To tell me he's happy I broke up with him back when we were 18. I can only imagine it wasn't to chat about the weather or cottage freaking pie. James and I were only just telling Tabitha how well she's doing these days. Because you are, babe, Lottie adds as she smiles at me. And... She was saying how she would like to find the one. And then, like magic, there Noah was in the flesh. Tell me that's not fate. It's not fate, I say blandly. You think there's some kind of psychic link between Tabitha deciding she's ready to meet a guy and her ex showing up at a wedding? Zara questions, her brows arched. Sounds kind of coincidental to me. Kennedy replies. But what if it's not coincidental? What if he's back and he still loves her and... Excuse me, I interrupt, and Lottie clamps her mouth closed. 
I'm sitting right here, you know. We know, Lottie replies, as though talking about my life like I'm in another room is perfectly fine. Look, it's all very well to guess at some romantic story here. But I'm sorry to tell you that this isn't a rom-com. It's my life. And Noah Grant just happened to be at the same wedding reception as me. That's all. End of story. And now, by the sounds of it, I'll have to become a hermit to avoid having to see the guy eating cottage pie and chatting with Kennedy and Charlie at my local. I let out a heavy sigh. You could always get your parents to buy you a new place somewhere else, Zara suggests. Great idea, Lottie proclaims. Only then you won't be in Notting Hill and we'd miss you. You're so lucky, Kennedy says, as she looks around my living room. I'd love to have my own place. Living above the black cat is fine, but owning a place to call home would be amazing. I wish my parents could afford to buy me a flat and buy me a gallery, Lottie says with a sigh. Oh, to have rich parents who live in a castle. It's not a castle. It used to be, but it was converted into a stately home a long time ago, I reply. But all three of my friends are giving me a look. I know, I hear it. I sound like the cliché of a poor little rich girl sitting in my comfortable flat, working at my gallery, all paid for by my father. Kennedy arches a brow. Daddy paying your bills isn't as terrific as you thought? I think of all the strings my parents attach to my lifestyle, how they constantly compare me to my younger, toe-the-line-like-a-pro sister. Hint. I'm never the winner in that little scenario. Not when it's my father, it's not, I reply through tight lips. Zara gives my arm a squeeze. She gets it. Of the four of us, we've been friends the longest. She knows all about my family, the family who takes the fun from dysfunctional. Let's have a change of subject, shall we? She suggests, and I shoot her a grateful look. Back to that ex, Lottie says with a grin. I groan. Do we have to? We need to prepare you in case you see him again. Kennedy asks. Can I ask a dumb question? Why are you so hung up on this guy you dated as a teenager? I mean, it's been what? Ten years since you broke up? Twelve, I correct. Twelve? That is a long time, girl. A long time. I know. I'm pathetic, I tell them, and all three of them jump on my words, reassuring me that I'm not. But I know I am. Noah and I were together for one year and three months. That's only fifteen months, which in the scheme of my life is not exactly long. Plus, our relationship was over by the time I left home for university, before I became an adult. Any reasonable person would have moved on a long time ago. And I tried to. Really, I did. I dated other guys. Cute guys, smart guys. Guys who were totally into me. I even got engaged to one of them, although that fell apart pretty dang fast. But not one of them could measure up to Noah. Noah Grant was a big deal, Zara explains to Kennedy. It might have been a teenage love affair, but no one's compared to him since. Isn't that right, Tabitha? My throat tightens. I give a brief nod. Kennedy shoots me a knowing look. Oh, I get it. He was your big love. The guy you've compared everyone against, and they've always fallen short. The one that got away, Lottie muses. I open my mouth to protest, but no words form. She's right. Noah is my one that got away. There's no denying it. And now he's back, and I'm a mess. We've all got one. Mine was Samuel Donovan. I was 13. 
He was fifteen. He was a great kisser, and I thought he was the one. Zara tells us. What happened? Lottie asks. When he was eighteen, I hear he discovered his one was a burly plumber called Antonio. Lottie lets out a light laugh. Ouch. Yup, Zara replies. Okay, so let's say Noah is Tabitha's one that got away. That makes him a super ex, not just your everyday garden variety ex. She needs to be ready in case she sees him again. Problem is, you always see exes when you're looking crappy with unwashed hair and one of those big boy-like zits on the end of your nose. Lottie regards us through wide eyes. What? That happened to me one time and it was terrible. Focus, Lottie, Kennedy instructs. My point is, all you've got to do is make sure you look super cute every time you step out of your flat and have something prepared to say to him if you happen to see him. Like what? Hi, remember me? The girl who dumped you after we said we'd be together forever? I suggest. Oh, and I've never stopped thinking about you either. Kennedy scrunches her nose. Maybe don't lead with that. You could just pass the time of day with him. Talk about the weather. This from Zara. What is it with British people and talking about the weather? Kennedy asks. I don't get it. It rained yesterday. It's raining today. And guess what? It's probably going to rain tomorrow. Really, what's to discuss? I'm not going to talk to Noah about the weather, or anything, for that matter. The very thought has me wanting to run and hide under a big rock and never come out. Would it really be that bad? Kennedy asks. Yes, it would. He, he can't think good things about me. Because you dumped him when you were 18? Honey, people move on. Kennedy's right. You were kids back then. Now he's all grown up, just like you are, Zara says. He grew up good, Lottie tells us, and I shoot her a look. What? You might have kicked him to the curb, but you've got to admit the guy is hot. Super hot, Kennedy confirms. My belly does weird, unwelcome things. Not that I was looking, you understand. James is more than enough man for me, Lottie continues, her cheeks blushing. He looks like that guy from The Matrix. You know, the one that saves everyone. Keanu Reeves? Yeah, I can totally see that, Kennedy says. I raise my hands in exasperation. Can we please stop talking about how handsome my ex is? I'm trying not to think about him. How's that working out for you? Kennedy asks with a wry smile. Not so well. I cross my arms and huff out a breath. Seeing Noah again has made me realize the awful truth. I'm not over him. And seeing him tonight has brought every feeling I ever had about him right back. Chapter 4 I slot my key into the lock on the heavy glass door and push my way inside. As usual, I'm the first one at the gallery, which is just the way I like it. I close the door over and snib the lock before I make my way across the polished concrete floor, past the stands displaying the art pieces and sculptures, the paintings hung carefully at exactly the right viewing height on the plain white walls. I walk through a white, handleless door to the back room, where I flick on the light and shrug off my linen blazer. With my warm takeaway cup of coffee in hand, I make my way back into the gallery and wander over to my most prized possession of all, the artwork no one can ever buy. I stand and gaze at the painting, a small smile creeping over my face. Whenever I'm worried or scared, whenever I'm feeling down, this painting picks me up. I can't put my finger on why. Something to do with the abstract pattern or the colour palette of greens and blues. Whatever it is, 
It evokes memories of happy times, of long, carefree summer days with nothing to do but simply be. I need it today, more than I have for a while. I don't let my thoughts turn to Noah Grant. This is my favourite time of the day at 496, the gallery I run. It's named after the street number, and I work with my school friend, Prue. At university, I majored in marine biology, more to make my father despair of me than any real plan to actually be a marine biologist, and Prue majored in art history. So when my father fronted up with the offer of a gallery, I asked Prue to work with me. And together, we've been buying and selling artwork to the rich and richer of London ever since. Better I use the family money for something I enjoy than it gets spent on a new Range Rover for my little sister, Fenella, to haul her brood around in, I say. I know, I know, I'm lucky, really lucky. Not everyone gets gifted a gallery or a brand new Range Rover for that matter. But the thing is, it comes at a price. My family's not exactly easygoing. We're not the type to get together for Christmas and happily sing carols around the piano. I mean, we do get together for Christmas, but no one actually wants to. Movement out of the corner of my eye grabs my attention, and I look over to see Prue bustling into the gallery, her new Louis Vuitton handbag slung over one shoulder. She gets one every season, and a pastry box balanced in the other. Why must people insist on lumbering down the street like they're on holiday and have all the time in the world to stop and gaze in at shop windows, she complains, as the door swings over behind her. Honestly, don't they know some of us have lives we need to live? I have children and responsibilities and places to be, important places. Thank goodness for Nanny, that's all I'll say. And good morning to you too, I reply with a smile. Darling Tabby, she air kisses me and then sails past to the back room. You're obsessed with that painting. I wish you'd sell it. I'm sure you could make some decent money from it. I trail behind her and lean up against the doorframe as she dumps everything on her desk. The thought of not being able to get lost in the painting every day is not a thought I relish. Not selling, I tell her. You're too sentimental about it. You need to think with your head. I do, all the time. That's what heads are for. But that painting is off limits, and you know it. Suit yourself, she lets out a sigh and declares. I hate London in the summer. I hate, hate, hate it. At least the conversation has moved on from selling my beloved painting, even if it is back to her complaining. So, no firm opinion on summer in London, then. She gives me a peeved look. Remind me to go home to Mummy and Daddy for all of August next year. I simply cannot do another summer here. Where have you been this morning that's put you in such a foul mood already? Jane's Pastries. Prue, that's literally right next to your flat, which is only a block away. Seriously, how bad a morning could you have had? Utterly horrid. Weren't you listening to me? All those dreadful people out there getting in my way. I've made up my mind. I'm taking the boys and going to Devon next summer. Decision made. I roll my eyes in good humour at her. Prue and I have been friends since we suffered through boarding school together, and I'm used to her drama queen ways. Upping sticks and moving to Devon for the summer doesn't sound very Prue to me. She's more of a dinner at Nobu, drinks overlooking the Thames, and shopping in Knightsbridge than a pair of wellies and gardening gloves kind of girl. All that dirt. She heaves out a breath. You're right. Devon in summer is even worse than here. How about New York? I snort laugh. What? New York's so fun. You're hilarious. I flick open the lid on the pastry box and count four chocolate eclairs, 
two jam donuts and six macaroons. Who are all the pastries for? Her features morph from peeved to excited in two seconds flat. We had a call after you'd left early to go to that wedding on Friday. We've got a new art dealer coming in and he wants to take a look at our collection. Apparently he works for an awfully wealthy Saudi businessman who's bored with collecting Hockneys and Hearsts. I blink at her. How can you be bored with collecting Hockneys and Hearsts? And if he's buying artwork that insanely priced, what does he want with a gallery as small as 496? Who knows? He's probably a friend of Daddy Warbucks. You do know your dad's just as wealthy as mine. Yes, but he doesn't finance me in this place and send his friends here to buy the art. Kappa? I've just had a coffee, I reply absentmindedly. I watch her fill the kettle with water from the tap. We do sell artwork to people other than my dad's friends, you know. There's a defensive tone in my voice. Prue opens the cupboard over the bench and pulls out the box of teas. What should I have? Earl Grey, English breakfast, or one of those vile new herbal things you've taken to lately? They're not vile. They're good for you. She holds up a tea bag encased in a seal pouch. How can nettles be good for you? I don't know. Lottie suggested I drink it, and you missed my point. We've sold stacks of art to people who don't even know who my dad is. Sure we have, she replies, giving me a doe-eyed look. I knit my brows together. What does that mean? It means if you don't like your dad keeping this place afloat, then maybe it's time to cut the purse strings. I don't need to cut any strings of any kind. The gallery's profitable, all on its own, I reply with a sense of pride. I might have been handed this place on a silver platter, but I've been working hard to make it a success. It was part of the new Tabitha I've been dedicating myself to over the last six months. No more parting and a lot more focusing on making 496 a success. Daddy might have handed me my life on a silver platter, but I can at least show that I'm worth it. Prue turns back to the bench and busies herself with the tea making. Whether this new art dealer is one of your dad's cronies or not is irrelevant right now. He told me he wants some newer, more up-and-coming names to add to this guy's collection. I told him you have exactly what he's looking for here at the gallery and to come in today. He sounds like a big deal. I regard the box she walked in with. You want to give this dealer, who works for some super wealthy Saudi businessman, pastries. Oh, I got chocolate-coated coffee beans, too, she replies, as though chocolate-coated coffee beans will clinch the deal. When is he here? 2.30, so enough time to pull some pieces from the vault. I chew on my lip. Off the top of my head, I'm thinking work by Ibrahim Kim Ackerman Adabisi. He mentioned Adabisi and Kim. Great. We've got that mixed media piece by Kim. I can grab that. Have we got anything by that weird scruffy one with the shoes? That literally sums up all the artists we've ever worked with. Oh, you know who I mean. The one who took a fancy to you. What was his name? Do you mean Jed? The artist who paints those huge, beautiful, abstract paintings with the little people. Oh, I love those little people. She gushes. They're so cute, like Smurfs, only not blue. Clearly. I lift my lips into a wry smile. I'm sure Jed's goal was to create non-blue Smurf art. What's his surname? Just Jed. Is he the one with the bulging frog eyes and the wild hair? He's missing some teeth as well. She shudders. Missing teeth, wild hair, and bulging frog eyes are clearly not Prue's thing. That sounds like Jed. He's the one who will only deal with you because you get him. Well, I wouldn't put it quite like that, although she's totally right. Jed, first name only, like Beyonce, might be a great artist, but he refuses to deal with Prue. 
But then again, that may very well be because she thinks his art looks like non-blue Smurfs. He only deals with me thanks to a random comment I made about one of his paintings looking like a giant wave after I'd had a glass of wine one evening. He thought I said rave, and he'd just been to Glastonbury for the first time in his life at the age of 40-something, so he told me I get him. But the point is, Prue, he's an amazing up-and-coming artist with huge potential, so he can look however he likes. It makes zero difference to us or the gallery. I suppose, although if they can manage it at all, it'd be rather nice if they could be better looking, don't you think? My friend Prue, concerned with the important things in life. Besides, you're only saying that because you're his favourite. I shrug. The man has taste, what can I say? You call it taste, I call it eccentricity. An eccentric artist, can you imagine that? Eccentric artists are a norm here at 496, some more so than others. Jed is probably mid-range eccentric. There are some artists who refuse to even speak to us, let alone have a favourite. I put it down to the weight of their creative brilliance, like their brains are so busy creating great works of art, they've got no room to be normal. She gestures at my favourite painting, hanging in its special spot by the back door. You'll have to move that. I hear it's not for sale. I roll my eyes at her. Wouldn't it be amazing to get the artist in here for a full gallery takeover? But whenever I email, all I get is some assistant telling me he doesn't do public appearances. I bet we're just too small for him. It's probably because he looks like Frog Eyes Jed. I let out a giggle. He probably does. We don't even know if it's a he. I return my attention to the painting. It's a he, I say with assuredness. Masculine brushstrokes? Prue asks with a giggle. I don't know, just something about it tells me Frisksits is a man. A man I'd love to meet. You might get the chance one day. Keep emailing him. We spend the rest of the morning and into the early afternoon ensuring we have the most exciting and up-and-coming artists displayed on our walls, with a number of alternative options stored carefully out the back so we can easily pull them out if the dealer wants to see them. How was the old people wedding? Prue asks as I stand back and look at the last of the paintings on the wall. An image of Noah crashes into my consciousness, like a ball through glass. It was lovely, I reply, trying to push him from my mind. Prue snorts. So convincing. They kissed in front of you, didn't they? Old people type kissing with their dry lips and droopy jaws. You are a truly terrible, terrible person, I say, which is something I tell her most days, really. Prue might be one of my oldest friends, but she's also easily the most judgmental, too. No, I'm not. I'm lovely, she tells me, and I know she genuinely thinks so. But really, if you have to tell people how nice you are, does that mean you are actually nice? Was it the old person kissing that made you turn all pale? Oh, do you need a spray tan? We could grab one when we close up, if you like. I could do with a top-up. I don't need a spray tan, and it wasn't Evelyn and Stanley kissing, because they are an absolutely lovely couple, and they're deeply in love, and it was a privilege to be a part of their ceremony. I tell her, lathering it on thicker than Dad lathers butter on his scones, which is jolly thick, I can tell you. It was something else. Or rather, someone else. What? I bite down on my lip. Prue might judge people before you can say latest Gucci handbag, but she always tells me like it is. No sugarcoating. What's more, she was there the day I fell for him. And she was one of the friends who told me to forget about him too. Noah Grant turned up at the wedding, I tell her trying to keep my voice even. She tilts her head and frowns at me. Who? 
You know Noah Grant, the guy I went out with when we were teenagers. She looks at me blankly. The hot guy who fixed my car? Oh, I remember him. He was your ill-advised fling. I pull my lips into a line. Yes, he was. Are you telling me he was there at the wedding? How odd. That's what I thought. I don't know quite what to make of it. What's a mechanic doing at a London wedding? She asks, as though Noah being a mechanic precludes him from attending someone's nuptials. Doesn't he live in your village? I look down at my hands as memories wash over me. He moved away, remember? He moved away and I couldn't find him. She flicks her wrist in the air. Oh, darling, I can't keep track of all your men. All my men? I guffaw. You make it sound like it's an extremely long list. You've been out with a few, Tabby. You've got to admit it. Poor Magnus. I'm quite sure he's never managed to get over you. Magnus is just fine, I'm sure. Prue laughs, and I regard her in surprise. What's so funny? I ask. You seeing that guy last night? Oh, seeing him was hilarious. A laugh a minute. Yes, my tone is awash with sarcasm. She waves her hand in the air. Not because of that. Because Noah Grant is this new art advisor's name. I blink at her a few times, my mouth forming an O shape. It is. She gives a nonchalant shrug. What are the chances? What are the chances? I murmur, hoping it is just a coincidence. I'm not sure I could cope with seeing Noah twice after all this time. But Noah's a mechanic. I know he is. He's not an art dealer working for some wealthy guy in the Middle East. I'm sure it won't be your Noah Grant. Who knows? This new dealer might be related to Hugh Grant. How exciting would that be? Does he have a grown son? I pull my brows together. Who? Hugh Grant. Hugh Grant? Yes. Does he have a grown son? How would I know that? Oh, Tabby, keep up, will you? She scoffs. She wanders off towards the back room. The glass door to the gallery creaks open, and a figure appears in a dark suit and tie, with a thick mop of hair pushed back, to reveal a handsome face with dark features. It's a handsome face with familiar dark features. And as I flick my gaze to his, my pulse picks up and everything around us begins to blur. It's him. It's Noah. Hello, Tabitha, he murmurs, his eyes boring into me as though he can see my very thoughts, thoughts that right now are screaming at me to run far, far away from him, just like I did on Friday night, summoning every inch of courage inside of me. I lift my chin, my chest tight, as I put my all into not fleeing. It's a monumental struggle, and one I'm only just managing to control. I swallow as I keep my voice as steady as I can. Hello, Noah. Chapter 5 Noah Grant is here, here, in my gallery the only man I've ever loved. What are you trying to do to me, universe? I haven't laid eyes on the guy for over a decade, and now I've seen him not once in 24 hours, but twice, both times totally unprepared. A heads up would have been nice. Not seeing him at all would have been super. Maybe someone can get me a pair of red slippers to click together and mutter, there's no place like home so I can get back to reality. Whatever I do, I definitely need Ms. Universe to get on my side, fast. But she's not playing ball. Noah is still here, and he's still looking at me like he's not experiencing the swirl of emotions his sudden reappearance has elicited in me. Oh no, he is in total command of himself. Carefree, comfortable, 
confident. The trifecta of how to behave around an ex. The trifecta I'm most definitely not right now. I bet to him I'm just a girl he once knew. A girl long forgotten. Relegated to the past along with high school pimples and puberty. It's nice to see you again, Tabitha, he says in a smooth, familiar voice, his American accent stronger than I remember. Tabitha, not Duchess. But then why would he use his nickname for me after all this time? It would be inappropriate, far too familiar. You're the Noah Grant who's come to see our collection? I question, blinking at him in disbelief. Noah's not an art dealer, working for some wealthy foreign businessman. He was training to become a mechanic, following in his dad's footsteps, taking over Grant Motors. He's a small-town guy with grease under his nails, his whole life mapped out. Or at least that's the Noah Grant I once knew. He inclines his head. You look surprised. I open my mouth to reply, but no words come out. Of course I'm surprised. Noah's reappearance is one thing, but his reappearance as an art dealer is quite another. I, I am, I manage. Funny how things work out, isn't it? He says with an easy smile. Funny? Funny? Of all the words I could use to describe this, funny is not one of them. I suppose. Prue's voice rings out from behind me. Hello there. Prue waltzes across the gallery, the clicking of her heels reverberating around the room. She comes to a stop beside me, her welcoming smile in place as she shoots me a questioning look. I get it. I'm standing here gawking at a strange but admittedly extraordinarily handsome man. She must be wondering whether I've been struck dumb by lightning. Which, in a way, I have. Noah slides his gaze from me to Prue, and the breath I didn't even know I was holding comes whooshing out. Hi there, he says. Has Tabby helped you? She asks Noah. We were just chatting, weren't we, Tabby? His eyes dance as they find mine once more. Tabby? He always said that was the most ridiculous name for me, and he refused to use it. Instead, he gave me a nickname, one only he ever used. Duchess. A joke about the family I came from. Not that I'm a duchess, of course, and I didn't exactly love the moniker. It only served to show the gulf between our different worlds. Were you, Tabby? Chatting? Prue asks, and I realise with a start that I'm still gawking at Noah, not having uttered a word. Uh, yeah, chatting, that's right, I mumble, winning a furrowed brow from Prue. She must be wondering what the heck has got into her normally together boss. I need to get a grip. Actually, I've come to see your collection. I'm Noah Grant, he tells her. Prue extends her hand towards him. Mr. Grant, it's lovely to meet you. I'm Prunella Cosworth Farnham. We talked on the phone yesterday. Please, call me Noah. And actually, you and I already met some years ago. He tells her pleasantly. Prue's eyes slide from his to mine. Oh, she questions, her face bright. She's clearly put two and two together to work out that this Noah Grant is not the son of a famous London-based movie star and is, in fact, my Noah. Not that he's mine anymore. We were teenagers when we met, so it was a long time ago now, he adds. Teenagers? You know, Noah, now that I think about it, that does ring a bell, Prue replies. Remind me, where was that exactly? I dart her a look. She knows exactly where it was. In Marlingworth, the village I grew up in. 
We met when your car had broken down, if I recall correctly. Hadn't it, Tabby? He turns to look at me, and I press my lips together and nod. Oh, Marlingworth, that's where Tabby's from, Prue replies, turning to me. It is. I'm feeling as awkward as a cat in a pond. As I said, it was so long ago now. Another life. He replies smoothly, his features relaxed. Another life. And just like that, everything we were to one another is relegated to insignificant history. I tighten my mouth. How nice to see you again, Noah, Prue replies, the brightness of her eyes telling me how much she's enjoying this. To her, Noah was my ill-advised boyfriend, someone to chalk up to experience before I moved on to real guys. Guys from our background who went to Cambridge and Oxford. Guys who had bright futures ahead of them in the law or politics. Guys my parents would approve of. And you're an art dealer now by the looks of things, Prue continues. That's a bit of a step up for you, isn't it? I scrunch my eyes shut. Prue has never been one to keep her thoughts to herself. You were a mechanic, weren't you? You fixed Tabby's car when it broke down, I remember, she continues. The image of Noah getting out of his truck and sauntering over to us, looking sexier than every fireman on every calendar combined, flashes before my eyes. My belly tightens. Nope, not going back there. Thinking of Noah as all sexy and muscled is not helpful right now. Or at any time. I was training as a mechanic then, he replies. So, what made you go from oil changes and fixing engines to working with fine art? It seems so disparate. Prue, I warn under my breath. Although she's echoing my thoughts exactly, she has a tone of voice that's coming across as a touch condescending. It can't be lost on Noah. He offers her an impassive smile. A lot can happen in 15 years, he replies evasively, not satisfying us with a response. Twelve years, I correct, and immediately press my lips together. Is it only twelve? He asks. I widen my eyes at him. I remember the exact date and time my car broke down, how he'd produced a can of petrol from the back of his truck, to fill my empty tank. How he'd told me he'd be waiting under the old oak tree by the river for me that evening if I wanted to see him again. How I did want to see him again, so very much. And then, I remember that summer, how we'd spent as much time as we could together, how we lay on blankets in the shade of that tree, making out like our lives depended on it, basking in our newfound love. Because I had loved Noah. He was my first, my only love. And here he stands in my gallery, chalking it all up to ancient history. Irrelevant. Done. I paced on a smile, my resolve hardening to stone. Twelve, maybe thirteen? I'm not exactly sure. A long time ago, as you say. You're right. It was a long time ago, however you look at it. I can feel Prue's eyes boring into me, and I resist the urge to swat her away like a pesky fly. I had heard through the grapevine you were a gallerist in London, but I didn't know where, he says. I shoot him an uncertain look. Could this really be some kind of coincidence? Could he really not have known I would be here today? But then, maybe that's why he was so relaxed seeing me. He knew I'd be here, and he was okay with it. I let the thought sink in for a moment. He knew I would be here today, and wasn't in the least bit concerned by it. Seeing me is not a big deal to him. Well, you found me, I reply with a shrug, before I quickly add, 
which makes it sound like you were looking for me, and of course you weren't, because that would be odd, so... The edges of his mouth curl into a smile, and it's hard not to feel as though it's at my expense. So, he repeats. He diverts his eyes from mine to regard the gallery. I'm very interested to see your collection, and I do appreciate you making the time for me with such short notice. My client is very interested in what you have to offer. Of course, we're more than happy to accommodate you, I reply smoothly. I understand you are particularly interested in the pieces we have by Adebisi and Kim. I am indeed. This way. I gesture at the artwork at the other end of the gallery, and he shoots me a bland smile as he brushes past me. I can't help but breathe in his scent. It's a mixture of pine and a crisp winter's day, and Noah. It catches me off guard. I rub at my nose as if I can wipe it away. It doesn't work, unsurprisingly. What's got into you? Prue hisses under her breath, as Noah examines the largest painting in the room, an abstract in black and white. I'm fine, I quip, quite clearly not. Pull it together, will you? I glare at her. You're the one questioning why he's an art dealer. You're the one looking like you've seen a ghost. I press my lips together. That's exactly what Lottie said to me at Stanley's wedding. Get over it. It was half a lifetime ago. We need to try to sell him some artwork. I stretch my lips into a line. I know, I reply with a firm nod of my head. I know she's right. It should be no big deal that he's here. People run into their exes every day of the week. It's to be expected, really. An everyday occurrence. I see you have a piece by Leslie Bukenya. Her work is very interesting, Noah says, turning to us. It's quite striking, isn't it? Prue shoots me one final look before she walks over to join him, and I force myself to trail behind. And this... It's a jet, isn't it? He states, as he regards the much larger painting beside it. Prue stands beside him. That's right. I know my client would be interested in work by Jed. Noah replies. Oh, you'll have to talk to Tabby about that. She's the only one the artist will work with. Is that so? Isn't that right, Tabby? They both turn to look at me. I pull on my game face, professional gallerist mode. Jed has a certain way he likes to work, and we're happy to accommodate him, I say. An artist who is particular about things. How unusual, Noah replies, and the skin around his eyes crinkles as he smiles at me. It strikes me afresh how he looks older, more mature, like he's settled into his features. Although he still looks like the Noah I once knew, he's more solid, more him, if that makes any sense at all. Yes, fancy that, <laughs> I reply with a laugh that makes me sound like I've been sucking on helium. I clear my throat. Apparently, Tabby gets him, Prue continues with a wave of her hand. He'll only ever deal with her. It's all very cliché artist. Now, Noah, would you like some refreshments? A pastry, a coffee, a glass of champagne? Do you have all of those things? He asks. Absolutely, she replies. Well, perhaps you can get me a cup of coffee while I chat with Jed's favoured gallerist. Of course, I'll be back in a jiffy. She breezes from the room and with a clunk of the door, Noah and I are instantly alone in the cavernous room, and I thought I was nervous before. Noah raises an eyebrow at me. So, one of the most exciting up-and-coming British artists thinks you get him. My cheeks heat. I offer him a pleasant, professional smile. He mentions something along those lines. 
His eyes seem to appraise me. I try to swallow down the deeply loaded awkwardness between us. I know my client will be very interested in any work you have by Jed. Do you have others? As Prue said, just the one piece right now. And it's sold, I see. He gestures at the red sticker I placed on the artwork on Friday. It is, I'm afraid, just sold. He turns his attention from the painting back to me once more. Do you think you could find out if you will be getting any more artwork from him soon? I don't know. He's a little erratic, should we say. But you have a special relationship with him. I'm not sure it's that special, actually, I reply, feeling thoroughly self-conscious. It's not like we have an exclusive deal with him or anything. But you'd like one. What sort of a question is that? Of course we want an exclusive relationship with Jed. People have started to pay a lot of money for his work. It's my turn to throw an assessing look at Noah. Of course we would. You have access to him. Perhaps you could tell him that my client is in the market for some of his work, and that he'll pay well for it. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Good. I'll follow up with you shortly, he says brusquely. So, it's going to be all business by the looks of things. That's fine. Totally fine. If you give me your card, I'll get in touch once I've got some info for you. He reaches into the inside pocket of his jacket, and I notice the distinctive silk lining always used by a top Savile Row suit maker. Whatever Noah has done with the last twelve years of his life, he's done well enough to buy expensive suits from fancy pants designers. He pulls out a card and offers it to me. As I take it in my hand, I make sure our fingers don't touch. I read the name, Noah Grant, Art Dealer, written in simple black lettering against a white background. Thanks, I'll be in touch, I tell him. Prue bustles back into the room, holding a tray with coffee, milk, and sugar. I didn't know how you took it. Actually, I'm sorry, I need to go. Oh, she replies as though she's gone to some huge effort in producing this coffee, rather than the fact she's put a teaspoon of instant granule in a mug of boiling water. It was nice to see you both again. Tabitha, I'll look forward to hearing from you. Yes. I say. He offers us both a smile before he strides from the gallery, the door swinging closed behind him. I watch his dark figure disappear from sight. I let out a breath of air, my rigid body relaxing for the first time since he stepped inside. Prue is smirking at me. Well, this is going to be interesting. No, it's not. It's going to be the very opposite of interesting, I quip. All she does is raise her brows at me in response. Prue, I am a professional gallerist. I can deal with the likes of Noah Grant. The all-new version of Noah Grant, you mean? So much yummier when a man is in a suit. Whatever version. We were teenagers when we were together. It's ancient history. If you say so, I give a firm head nod, resolute. I do. So what if I once thought he was my soulmate? So what if I thought fate had brought us together that day on the country lane? So what if I'd thought we were meant to be together forever? It was all just a youthful fantasy, a fiction, a fairy tale, and... If Noah's reappearance in my life tells me anything, it's that fairy tales are most definitely not real, even if he once made me think they could be. Chapter 6 Thirteen Years Ago Come with me. Noah takes my hand in his, his touch sparking the butterflies in my belly into full flight as we step over the low hedge and onto the thick green grass. Where are we going? I ask him, 
not really caring what he replies. All I want is to be with him, ever since that day by the side of the road a week ago, ever since the very sight of him had taken my breath away. You'll see, is his elusive reply. Ellie bounds through the grass beside us, her tail wagging ferociously with the glee of being free. I can't blame her. She spends most of her days tethered to a pole at Noah's dad's garage, itching to play with the people who drop their cars off to be serviced, convinced each and every one is there just for her. Ellie, fetch. Noah throws a bright pink ball with his free hand, and the dog races after it. She's obsessed with that ball, I say, as we slow our pace. We're down by the river, across the bridge from the village. We've talked about having a picnic here, but the grass was too long. So instead, we'd sat at one of the pub tables at the Noble Pigeon, overlooking the river, and eaten the sandwiches and cut fruit Noah had prepared, before Mrs. Mayhew told us to either hurry up and buy their food or hurry up and leave. Pleading no money, Noah told her we'd leave just as soon as I'd eaten one of the strawberries he'd personally chocolate-dipped that morning, since he had wanted today to be special. Today was our first official date. I'd snuck away from the party to meet him the night we met on that country lane, but he told me to dress up for an actual date tonight. It seemed like a big deal. We weren't just hanging out, talking and enjoying one another's company. We were on a date. I'd blushed and Mrs. Mayhew had agreed we could stay until actual paying customers needed the table. And now, here we find ourselves, standing under the oak tree by the water's edge, the pub's windows catching the light on the other side of the river, standing closer than we've ever been in our lives. My heart is going all kinds of crazy. Noah watches Ellie collect the ball before she runs back to us and drops it at his feet. He picks it up and hurls it across the field for her, and she bounds after it once more. I know what it's like to feel obsessed with something, Noah says, his eyes focused intensely on mine, or rather with someone. My heart begins to thud against my ribs. I lift my chin, determined to appear as mature as my 16 years will allow me. Are you telling me you're obsessed with me, Noah Grant? My tone belies the nervousness I'm feeling. He reaches his hand up to my face and touches my cheek with feather-light fingers. Tell me it's not just me. You feel it too, don't you? His voice is low and gravelly, full of the lust he has for me, and I know what he says is true. Ever since he stopped to help us at the side of the country lane, he's been filling my thoughts and interrupting my sleep. Last night, as I wrote in my diary... I doodled his name next to mine, encircling it with a heart like I was thirteen. My voice is full of air when I reply. I feel it too. The heat of his body so close to mine and the intensity of his gaze makes my throat dry, and as he leans closer to me, his head tilting down, I lift my chin to meet his soft, pillowy lips. His kiss is soft, Tentative, and it's over far too quickly. He lifts his head and looks over my shoulder at the pub across the river. I feel like they're watching us. I glance over at the pub. Every outdoor table is filled now, and soft 90s pop music floats in the air. I'm sure they're not watching, I reply, wishing he would spend a whole lot less time worrying about the pub patrons and a whole lot more time kissing me. I've got an idea. He leads me around the tree until it obscures the view. I grin up at him, those butterflies amping things up in my belly at the prospect of what's about to happen between us. Better? I ask with a smile. Not yet. Without another word, he loops both hands around my waist and pulls me into him. 
pressing his firm jean and t-shirt clad body against mine. Before I know it, he presses his lips against mine once more, and I breathe in his intoxicating scent as I taste him for the very first time. This kiss isn't like the first. It's bold, it's insistent, and it tells me exactly what he feels for me. As we come up for air, his breath mingles with mine as he tells me, I can't stop thinking about you, Duchess. Duchess? I question. His face colors. It's what I've always called you. In my head, anyway. He's always had a nickname for me. I bite down on my lip. You know I'm not actually a Duchess, don't you? Let me see. You live in the big house. You've got the money. You go to that fancy boarding school. You... It's not my money, you know, I interrupt. Tomato, tomato, Duchess. His lips curve into a smile, and I can't help but return it. You're Duchess to me. What do I call you, then? How about Noah? That's not very original. It's your name. I toy with the hem of his T-shirt the edge of my hand resting tantalizingly against the warm, firm skin of his belly. Is that so? He slips his hand behind my head and tangles his fingers in my hair, his mouth against mine once more. I melt like ice cream on a hot summer's day. And that night, we never did come up with a nickname for him. Chapter 7 The black wrought iron gate creaks loudly as I close it behind me and take the steps down to my flat, reminding me for the gazillionth time that I need to oil it. Well, I need to buy some oil and then oil it. Neither of these things are at the top of my list. I dump my handbag on the side table by the door. As I kick off my heels... My feet thank me for releasing them from their torture chamber, and I pad down the hardwood floor of my flat and into the kitchen that opens out into my small garden. Lately, I've got what my friends describe as an unhealthy obsession with my garden. They don't know what they're talking about. Tending to plants is the opposite of unhealthy, although I do admit to spending way too much time sitting in it, reading. There are worse things. Things like the love of my life reappearing and acting like I'm irrelevant history to him. Yeah, that. After Noah left the gallery this afternoon and I'd sufficiently recovered, I left a voicemail for Jed, asking him whether he had any works he was looking to sell. Half of me... The sensible, logical half that knows how risky it would be for me to spend any more time with Noah than I already have, hoped he'd flatly refuse and that would be the end of it. The other half? Well, let's just say that's the silly, romantic half with its head in the clouds that needs to be dealt to swiftly with a ballistic missile. I change into my sneakers and check the time. I'm eating Kennedy outside the Black Cat at 6.30, but first I need to collect a very important package. I climb my steps up onto the street level and press the button next to flat 1A and wait. A moment later, a voice says, Who is it? And I can hear the familiar barks of the dog who resides at the place. It's Tabitha. Oh, hi. Come on in. The intercom buzzes and I pull the door open and enter the old converted house. The door to flat 1A is ajar, and I poke my head inside, calling, OK if I come in. I'm immediately set upon by one enthusiastic dog who leaps up and tries to lick my face. Hello, girl, I say, as I lean down and pat the enthusiastic dog, currently a blur of brown fur at my knees. Do you want to go on a walk with Auntie Tabitha? Her response is to reach her long pink tongue out to lick my face, 
and I narrowly avoid my cheek being covered in a thin layer of dog slobber. Always delightful. Now, Echo, we talked about this, I say to her sternly, and she immediately sits down on her doggy bum and stares up at me, her ears held back. Echo is the sweetest dog on the face of the planet, and the reason I'm at my neighbour's place. She's an Australian Kelpie, which basically means she was built to herd sheep in the wide expanses of the outback, under the hot, blazing sun. Quite a different life from a small urban London flat filled with humans, two of them under three feet tall. Maya has two young children, both of them gorgeous but demanding, because, well, they're young children. Millie is now three, and a half, I've been told off before, for forgetting that part, and her little brother Timmy turned two last weekend. Echo got her name because every time Millie cried, she would echo it with a whine. Apparently, Millie was not an easy child, so Echo spent most of her time whining, Dealing with a newborn and a dog who insisted on empathising with her can't have been a dance party for Maya. She adores you, Tabitha, Maya says, and I look up from my spot on the ground to see her with a child on a hip and another clutching onto the hem of her baggy T-shirt. They both have the biggest brown eyes I've seen, which they currently have trained on me and the dog. Echo go walkieth with Miss Tabitha? Millie asks me. That's right. How are you, Millie? Good, she tells me in a serious voice, with a firm nod of her head. Her brother reaches up and gives a yank on his mum's hair. Ow, Timmy, that hurts, Maya complains, as she attempts to release her hair from his grasp without any hands. Timmy tugs harder. Seriously, Timmy, stop that or I'll have to put you down, Maya warns. Timmy, stop that, his older sister instructs, sounding exactly like her mum. Well, other than the lisp, that is. But I know Timmy, and he is definitely the contrary type. He takes a firm grip on his poor mum's hair and tugs, hard. That's it, you're on the floor. Maya tells him, and immediately places him on the carpeted hallway floor, untangling Timmy's sticky fingers from her hair. He is not impressed with this turn of events, and lets us all know with a loud wail that pierces my eardrums and makes Echo bolt down the hall to hide somewhere. Sensible dog. You're so silly, Millie tells him before she places her hands over her ears and yells, Stop it! Stop it! With a quick shove, she pushes her brother over, and he lands on his nappied butt and immediately turns the volume up on his cries to damage ears level. Millie, leave your brother alone, Maya scolds, and Timmy, come here. She picks her son off the floor, who is now a wet, snotty, screaming pink mess. His cries reduce to whimpers as she bounces him up and down. Smiling through the noise, I take in Maya's circles under her eyes and limp hair. Rough day. Just like every other one, she replies. Okay if I give them a S-T-R-A-W-B-E-R-R-Y each, I spell out, confident neither Timmy nor his sister have learnt to spell since I was here yesterday. She looks at me blankly. You lost me at S-T-R. Strawberry, I mouth. Maya shrugs, pulling her mouth up on one side. I'm all for bribery and corruption if it brings some peace and quiet. I reach into my crossbody handbag and grab a punnet of strawberries I picked up from Marks and Spencer on my way home today. I like to bring the children treats sometimes when I come to collect Echo for her walk. I open the punnet, quietly pull out two rather glorious-looking bright red glossy strawberries, and hold them behind my back. Hey, Timmy, I brought you something. 
His simpering abates abruptly as his curiosity gets the better of him. Tweet? He asks, his eyes wide. Treat, I confirm, but you have to guess which hand it's in. His eyes dart excitedly from one of my arms to the other before he points at my left side and exclaims, That one! I pull my hand out from behind my back to reveal one of the strawberries, and he immediately snatches it from my hand. Timmy, where are your manners? Maya quips, but Timmy's too busy shoving the fruit in his mouth with his chubby fingers to care one iota about manners. Would you like to check my other hand, Millie? I ask his sister. Yes, please, she replies, beaming up at me. I offer her the other strawberry. She takes it and says, Thank you so much, Miss Tabitha. You're very welcome, Miss Millie, I tell her with a grin, before she too busies herself with eating. Do you hear that? Maya says as I straighten up. What? Her face lights up in the first smile she's had since I got here. Exactly. The children finish their strawberries and drop the stems on the floor. I lean down and collect them up and then check with Maya before I give each child two more strawberries. Sorry about the sugar. I can never resist. It's their big brown eyes. They get me every time. She waves my concern away with a flick of her wrist. It's fruit and they've eaten their carrot sticks today, so it's fine. Well, Millie ate them. Timmy pushed his up his nose until he cried. Always a good idea. I'll find Echo. She'll be hiding from the savages under the dining room table if I know her. I follow her down the hallway towards the dining room. Clever dog. Any word from Stephen? What do you think? I scrunch up my nose. He's still being a pillock. Stephen Fincher is the king of pillocks. Believe me, gone for four months and I've got a fistful of nothing from him. She leans in and adds in a low voice, he's seen his children three times, three times. What an ass, an ass like pillock. She pats her leg and calls, come on girl. Echo comes out from under the table, her tail wagging, and I stroke her fur. Why do some men think it's okay to do that? Have kids and then leave them when the new shiny thing comes along? I don't get it. Because they're pillocks, the lot of them. Great, big, smelly, hairy pillocks. And I would use more appropriately colourful language if the savages weren't within earshot. Text me. I'll do that. Maya laughs along with me before her face drops and my heart goes out to her. Stephen and Maya have been my neighbours for some years now, and although I'd never say it to Maya, I always found Stephen to be a nice guy. Very neighbourly and polite with a ready smile, he would bring my rubbish bin in for me and had helped me sort out my recycling on more than one occasion. I liked him. Well, that is, until he left Maya and his two young children for one of the barmaids from the pub down the road four months ago. As we've discussed, the guy's a great, big, smelly, hairy pillock. Timmy comes toddling into the room and proceeds to pick up a wooden spoon and thrash it loudly against a metal pot. It's my cue to leave. Maya pulls Echo's lead from a hook in the adjacent kitchen and hands it to me. Spying it in my hand, Echo bounds over to me, her tail thrashing against my leg in anticipation. Be good for Tabitha, Maya says over the noise. Timmy, why don't you make something with the Play-Doh? Millie, get it for your brother. It's in the tub on the bookcase. I will, Mummy, Millie replies. I click on Echo's lead and begin to walk down the hallway towards the front door, trailed by Maya. She holds the door open for me and rests her forehead on the jam, looking utterly weary. Thanks for this, she says on a sigh. I wish you'd let me pay you. 
Don't be silly. I love Echo and I'm more than happy to help. Speaking of which, how about I take the kids to the playground this weekend for you? Give you a break. I couldn't ask you to do that. You're not asking. How about ten on Saturday? Her face lights up. I could meet a friend for coffee. I could wear a dress. I could brush my hair. I laugh. Steady on there. You don't want to pack too much excitement into one morning. When you're a mum, you'll understand, Tabitha. Believe me. I smile at her, despite the sinking feeling I have inside. I would dearly love to be a mum one day. Only with no relationship worth spitting at, it feels like an unattainable dream right now. I think I'd have to fall in love with a man before I become a mum, and the chances of that happening feel about as high as Jed getting his teeth fixed. She shoots me a confused look. Who the heck is Jed? He's an artist I work with. He's teeth challenged, should we say. Let me give you some advice. Stay single. Trust me. It's a whole lot easier. No cheating scumbags for a start. I thought we'd settled on Pillock. Oh, that man is many, many things. None of them good. Anyway, I can't ask you to take the children. Timmy needs watching, and he seems to be back in that phase where everything goes in his mouth. And I mean everything. That does not sound good. It's not, believe me. He ate a snail last week. A whole snail? Yup, and it was alive. Perhaps he was French in another life? Or Japanese? Japanese? Snail sushi. It could really take off. I win a smile from her. With her ex-husband literally leaving her holding the baby. Okay, toddler and young child, but still. He's a pillock and her family in another city. I imagine the only time Maya gets to herself is when she's asleep. And we all know that doesn't count. We're off then. Time to run around the park and eat the children's discarded snacks at the playground, bloodhound, I say to the non-bloodhound Kelpie. Maya pulls a face. That's worse than eating live snails. No, Maya, it's not worse than eating live snails. I glance down at Echo and see her gazing up at me, as though willing me to put an immediate stop to this ridiculous human interaction, so that we can get on with the all-important business of the evening, namely going for a walk. I'd best get going. We're meeting a friend and her dog. See you in about an hour. There's a loud crashing sound coming from down the hall. Maya shoots me a look. I'd better go and deal with that. Good luck. Chapter 8 Maya closes the door to the sound of wailing, and Echo and I begin our walk towards the Black Cat, the pub over which Kennedy rents a flat. She's lived there ever since she and Charlie got back from their tour of the Americas, so she and Zara and Lottie and I have spent quite a few evenings there over the past months, not to mention that it was the scene of the first Noah sighting at Stanley and Evelyn's wedding reception. The thought has my pace slowing. Kennedy mentioned she and her boyfriend, Charlie, had seen Noah at the pub a few times and had even had a conversation with him on one occasion. As I round the corner onto the street, I feel my body tensing at the prospect Noah might be there right now, which I know is thilly, as Millie would put it. But when you've seen your ex unexpectedly, twice in the last few days, you begin to think he'll be everywhere you ever go. I spot Kennedy with her dog, Lady M, who's bouncing around excitedly at the prospect of the walk. When her little eyes land on Echo, her ears immediately prick up, and she begins to whine in her weird, characteristic way, making Echo pull on her lead to get to her faster. Remind me to bring earplugs the next time we agree to meet, I say, as I greet my friend with a hug, 
Echo and Lady M doing their usual sniff, wine, dance, sniff, wine, dance, hello. Against my better judgment, I glance inside the pub window and am relieved not to see Noah's face staring back at me. Relieved and disappointed. Wait, what? I can't be disappointed not to happen to see Noah. His reappearance has completely stirred things up for me, things I don't want to have to deal with again. I need to get a grip on myself, and I need to do it yesterday. Kennedy shrugs. You get used to the whining when you've got the world's weirdest dog, she says loudly over the cacophony. An elderly couple shoots us an irritated look as they cross the street to the other side. I regard the Boston Terrier as she enthusiastically sniffs and whines and wraps herself up in her lead. At least she's no longer destroying Winnie the Pooh toys. Kennedy rolls her eyes. Don't even go there. She unwinds the lead from her wriggling dog. If we start walking, she'll calm down soon enough. If not, we're leaving. Echo has her reputation as a cool dog to think of, you know. Lady M has zero interest in being cool. I giggle. Shocker. We begin our walk down the street towards the park a few blocks away. It has a dog park, a playground, and a fitness trail, and it's a total gem to have in urban London. It's so great you got to keep her, babe. Delphine's flakiness is definitely your gain, I say. Did you know she loves Charlie almost more than she loves me? Never. Oh, it's true. She's a total daddy's girl. You're calling Charlie daddy these days, are you? She smirks at me. I might try it and see how it goes. I do not want to know, I reply with a laugh. We walk down the tree-lined street, pausing for the dogs to sniff or do their doggy business, and eventually reach the dog park. There are already a group of dogs playing together with their owners looking on, and I tell Echo to have fun before I let her off the lead and watch as she greets the other dogs with a broad, sweeping tail. Kennedy holds an excitedly squirming dog in her hands. Okay, Lady M, remember, Mommy is trusting you to be nice. Got it? Doesn't she have a reputation as being a devil dog around here? I ask. She's just misunderstood. Didn't she get evicted from a load of pet shops? We're working on our behavior, aren't we, Lady M? She says to the dog, who looks up at her and plants a lick on her nose. All right, I'm putting you on the ground now. Kennedy lets go of Lady M, and her paws barely have the chance to keep up with her as she barrels towards the other dogs, coming to a crashing halt when she meets the first one, a fluffy white dog with a pink-studded collar. She's doing so much better these days, Kennedy tells me. I think she just needed to get away from Delphine, I say, referring to Lady M's previous owner, who gifted Kennedy the dog when her popularity on social media waned. The dogs, not hers. Let's just say Lady M is way better off with Kennedy than Delphine. I mean, she used to be Lady Moo, enough said. I couldn't possibly comment. Yeah, you could, I reply with a laugh. Hey, what's happening with your... The words dry up in my mouth. My what? Kennedy asks. But I'm in no fit state to use actual words right now. Instead, I widen my eyes and point. She looks in the direction I'm gawking. What? Kennedy asks. You have got to be kidding me, I mutter. I watch as a tall, athletic man in a pair of navy shorts and white t-shirt glides along the running track a couple of hundred yards away. He moves with ease on his long, muscular legs. He's accompanied by a super fit-looking woman in a crop top and shorts, bearing an enviably flat, toned belly, the sort I've never achieved in my life. Is that Noah with some girl? 
Kennedy asks. I nod, my lips tight, as the two of them follow the path away from us. Suddenly, he's everywhere. Is anywhere safe from this guy? This guy who churns up a whole bowl full of feelings whenever I see him. At the wedding, at your gallery, and now at the park, she says, and I wish with all that's holy she wasn't right. Girl, you cannot catch a break. As they disappear from view, my shoulders slump. This is not fair, I complain like a child. I wonder who he's with. She's pretty hot. Kennedy muses. Did you see how long her legs are? Super long. I shoot her a look that says, not helping. Sorry, you okay? It's just you've gone all pale and weird. I literally shake myself. Yeah, fine, I fib. It's always shocking to see an ex, Kennedy soothes. Repeatedly. And anyway, he's gone now. I push out a breath, my shoulders slumping. Can't I get five minutes without the guy? That's all I ask. Five blissful minutes. Noah Grant free. Who do you think the girl is? I chew on my lip. How would I know? Probably his girlfriend or his wife. The thought sits uncomfortably inside, which is insane. I've got no claim to Noah. Heck, up until a few days ago, I hadn't even seen him for over a decade. I've got no business feeling weird about him being out on a run with a beautiful woman. But that doesn't stop me feeling the way I do. Do you like seeing him? Kennedy asks. What sort of question is that? Of course I don't. I snap. She shoots me a sideways look. Is that true? Yes. No. Oh, I don't know. It's very confusing for me. I get it. I was like that with Charlie to start with. I hated him and I kind of liked him too. Kennedy and Charlie had fallen out big time when they met. But once they both lived in the same block of flats, let's just say things thawed between them. Now they're besotted with one another. The thing is, I was the one who ended it with him. And now he seems, well... He seems like he doesn't care. It was a long time ago. People move on. So everyone keeps telling me, Exicon, where are you when I need you? Right? The problem is, the artist whose work Noah's interested in only likes to deal with me, which I used to think was a good thing because it made me special. Now, not so much. Ah, so you're going to have to work with Noah. She sucks in a breath. Tricky, very tricky. I watch as Echo and another dog her size sprint around the dog park like their pants are on fire. You know, if dogs wore pants. The only thing I can hope is that Jed, the artist, tells me he doesn't have any work available for Noah to buy, and that can be that. Or, Kennedy prompts, or I'll have to suck it up and act like I don't care about Noah or what we had together or any of it. I don't know, babe. You spending time together might reignite things. I arch my eyebrows at her. Reignite things? You make me sound like a gas hob. And anyway, I'm pretty sure I'm the last person Noah would ever want to be with. What about you? Would you want him back? I chew on my lip. Seeing Noah again after all this time has brought up a whole concoction of feelings. Feelings I had hoped I'd long since buried. Feelings that had plagued me since the day I told him goodbye. I lift my chin, resolved. No one ever falls for the one that got away. They got away for a good reason, and going back only leads to heartache. Let the past be just that. The past. She shoots me a sideways look. 
If you say so, honey. I give a firm nod of my head. I do. Noah is my past, and that's exactly where he needs to stay. Chapter 9 The problem with making strong, unflinching declarations to your friends at parks, like saying someone has been well and truly relegated to the past, never to be revisited, and certainly never to be entertained as anything except an ex, is that it's extremely inconvenient when that person turns up in your present. Again. Especially when they're Noah freaking Grant. I mean, seriously, universe. We've talked about this. You know how I feel. I thought I'd made it clear. Enough with dangling my too hot for a Thursday morning at the gallery X in my face. Thank you very much. But it would seem Ms. Universe and I are in a fight because she's gone and done it again. And this time, Noah turns up at the gallery when it's just me and one solitary customer, who is currently about to end his time at the gallery. Which means Noah and I are about to be completely alone together. What's more, and seriously, as if there needed to be more, He's looking all slick and sexy and dashing, like he's stepped off the cover of a men's fashion magazine. Talk about hot. Seriously, seriously hot. As in, I'll need a defibrillator sometime soon. If he does have to turn up here looking like the cover of a men's magazine, all I can say is that I'm thankful it's not one of those that feature men with no shirts on, because Noah Grant without a shirt, would probably make my heart beat so hard it would explode right out if seeing him with his dark stubble-lined square jaw, beautifully cut black suit, and pale blue open neck shirt is anything to go by. Ms. Universe is definitely not playing fair. I'm going to have to have some more very strong words with her. I'm busy wrapping a pretty hand-blown glass vase and tissue paper for the customer when Noah steps inside the gallery like he freaking owns the place. He's got that swagger, that confidence that drew me to him the day he stopped to help me with my broken-down car. Lucky for me, the vase I'm currently wrapping is resting on the desk, because the mere sight of Noah might very well have had me dropping it on the floor. Not a good move when it comes to expensive vases. Noah's eyes sweep the room, assessing. They land on me, and suddenly I'm all breathless and fluttery, and I'm about to break the vase. The customer shoots me a concerned look, and I smile at him before I return my gaze to Noah and see him lift the corners of his mouth in an easy smile. My traitorous eyes want nothing more than to stay trained on him, drinking in every inch of the guy. He's like a double chocolate sundae with extra whipped cream and sprinkles. I can't help being drawn to him, even if I know it's bad for me and my state of mind. He's walked the breadth of the gallery while I've been trying my best not to gawk at him like a simpleton, my fingers fumbling with the tape. He comes to a stop in front of my favourite piece, the Frisk Sits Blue and Green Abstract, with the label, Not For Sale. It's an odd, unsettling sensation, watching the man I loved and lost, eyeing up a painting that means so much to me. A man I saw out running with a beautiful woman with the unnecessarily long legs. A man who may or may not be in love with that woman, with her unnecessarily long legs. An uncomfortable feeling worms its way across my chest. Ahem. The customer clears his throat, and I snap back to what I'm meant to be doing. I shoot him an apologetic smile. Who knows how long I stood there as I gazed at Noah. Too long, clearly. As I place a 496 sticker on the pale green tissue paper, my initial shock and awe turns to hardened resolve. Why couldn't I work in an office or something? Some place where Noah can't just turn up unannounced. I could work in a mine. 
deep in the earth, with only canaries for company. If they still use canaries and mines, I'm not exactly fluent in mine speak. I slot the now wrapped vase in a box and tape it shut. I pass it to the customer. Thank you so much. I'm sure whoever you're giving this gift to will absolutely love it. Bye for now. The balding man in the thick-rimmed glasses looks questioningly from the package in his hands and back up at me. Don't you want me to pay for it? I forgot to charge the guy? Of course. I was getting to that part, I fib, because I had completely forgotten, and we both know it. I only hope Noah didn't notice. I flick my gaze to him and let out a sigh of relief when I notice he's moved to the other side of the gallery. But you'd said goodbye to me, the customer continues, his woolly brows pulled together. In fact, I believe your exact words were, bye for now, as though you expected to see me again, which I thought was odd, but perhaps you do hope to see me again. Feeling his gaze on me, I glance up to see Noah press his lips together to suppress a smile, and heat instantly floods my cheeks. Wonderful. Thanks, universe. Well, I... I begin. I thought it was odd because this is the first time I've been to this gallery. So you assuming our parting was only a bye for now, with the expectation you would see me again here, was somewhat presumptuous on your part, don't you think? Who is this guy? Rain Man? I smile through my locked jaw. It was only an expression. My mistake. Will that be cash or card, sir? Card. I keep my gaze from Noah as we finish the transaction, and then Rain Man takes his vase. I make sure I don't say bye for now before he leaves. It's just Noah and me, alone together for the first time in a long time. He was a little... particular? Noah says as he turns to face me, and I try not to notice how his velvety voice makes me tingle. He bought a beautiful hand-blown vase made by Diego Alonso, I reply, deflecting the comment. I'm not going to bond with Noah Grant over Rain Man, even if he was particular. Like one of these? Noah asks, gesturing at the cabinet that currently shelves an array of blown glass along with several larger pieces of ceramic art. Exactly like those. Is your client interested in collecting glass? He's only interested in paintings and large sculptures, although I hear you're giving vases away right now. His lips twitch, and now he's teasing me. Fan-blooming-tastic. I paste on a completely disingenuous smile. How can I help you today, Noah? He closes the space between us as he moves effortlessly across the gallery towards me. I know the plan was that you'd call me when you've spoken to Jed but I was in the area, so I thought I'd drop by. It's been a few days. Lucky, lucky me. I left him a voicemail. He can take a while to call back. What's a while? Are we talking a few days, weeks, more? Oh, days, usually. I'll be sure to get in touch with you once I hear back, although I can't imagine he has any work available right now. Why do you say that? He only supplied us the work on that wall a couple of weeks ago. I gesture at the painting with the red dot over the adjacent label, and we both turn to look at it. Well, I suppose I'll need to wait in hope that you're wrong. It's not likely I am wrong. He narrows his eyes at me, his gaze intensifying. Because you're never wrong? He asks. Is it just me, or was that statement thoroughly loaded? He's now so close to me I catch a hint of his scent. Pine and a crisp winter's day. And Noah. Give me strength. I shift my weight, wishing I was with anyone but him. I would even bring back Rain Man at this point, happy to embark on an in-depth conversation about how I forgot to ask him to pay for the vase and my crazy suggestion I would see him again in the future. No, I... 
I know the artist, that's all. That's right, you're his favourite, right? I lift my chin, defiant. I'm not interested in being teased by Noah Grant, particularly when he's standing this close to me and smelling this good and looking like that. It's true that we have a good relationship. You and Jed? Yes, of course, me and Jed. I snap and instantly regret it. I really will let you know if he has any work he could sell you, I add in a softer tone. I'd appreciate that. Feeling emboldened, I ask, are there any other items here you're interested in? He gestures at my Frisk Sits painting. That's a fascinating piece. It's not for sale. It's hanging in the gallery. But it's not for sale. See the sign? I point at the not for sale sign next to the painting. I know I'm being petty. Sue me. Isn't that a mixed message? You can look at this work of art, but you cannot buy it? Lots of places hang pieces not for sale. Really? Really? Of course, I can't think of one off the top of my head. You mean at museums and public art galleries? He asks, those lips of his curving into a fresh smile. Why does he have to enjoy this? Can't it just be over? I ignore his obvious tease and instead turn to the painting. I love this artwork. I've had it for years. He pulls his gaze from me and directs it at the painting. It's yours? How did you come by it? It's a frisk sits, isn't it? You know him. How do you know it's a him? Isn't the artist some sort of hermit? No one knows anything about him or her. I shrug as I gaze at the picture. Its blues and greens never fail to relax me. Although I have to admit, they're failing right now. I've always thought it was a man. With a name like Frisk Sits, he's probably Eastern European or Greek, and he's definitely someone with an incredibly large heart. You've really thought about this guy, if it is, in fact, a guy. And you hang it here because... He leads. Because I like to look at the abstract nature of it. It can be whatever I want it to be. It looks like a tree to me. He glances briefly at the picture before moving to another one. I pull my brows together. It's not a tree. Without glancing in my direction, he replies, If you say so, you're the one with the theories. It's not. I take another look at the painting, and it totally confirms my statement. There is no tree. It's totally abstract. End of story. He wanders the gallery, coming to a stop in front of the large glass cabinet. He leans down to inspect one of the hand-blown glass vases, then straightens up and tilts his head to look at me. I'm going to take a leaf out of Mr. Pedantic's book and buy one of these vases. I offer him a professional and courteous smile, still bruised by him labelling my favourite painting a tree, which it's not. Of course. Which one are you interested in? The red and grey one. He points to an absolutely exquisite, rounded vase that starts out as red at the bottom and shimmers into a soft grey at the lip. I pull the key from the inside pocket of my skirt and unlock the cabinet. Taking the vase out with great care, I hold it out for Noah to look at. He inspects it and then says, Beautiful. I'm sure your boss will love it. Oh, it's not for him. It's for a friend. He replies elusively, and I can't hold my mind back from wondering who this friend is. His girlfriend? His wife? The girl I saw him running with last night? Do I even want to know? Okay, yes, I do. I do want to know. But I shouldn't want to know. Instead of asking anything, I affect an air of professionalism as I reply, Great choice. Shall I wrap it up for you? Thank you. We make our way over to the desk, where I pull out a wad of tissue paper and begin to carefully wrap the vase. 
It's a gift, so if you wouldn't mind removing the price first, that'd be great. Happy to. I unwrap the vase, remove the sticker, and begin to rewrap it when my phone vibrates on the desk beside me. We both look at it as the name Jed appears on the screen. Seriously, it's been days and Jed chooses this very moment to return my call. Hey, look, it's the elusive Jed, Noah says. Go ahead and answer it. You can forget to charge me for the vase afterwards. His lips curve into a smile, and I shoot him my best withering look, all the while trying to retain my professional manner. It's no easy task. Hello, Jed, I say into my phone. Jed, it's Jed, he replies. Didn't I just say that? Jed, I repeat, thank you so much for returning my call. Yes, well, I do like to be on the phone some of the time, although not on Tuesdays, because I do strongly feel Tuesday should be phoneless days for really obvious reasons. But today is Thursday, so it's fine to speak with you, although I don't have long. Yep, that's Jed for you. I'm very grateful you called me back. I have someone who's interested in buying some of your work, only we don't have any at the gallery currently. There's a bird in my bird bath. Jed tells me. A bird? Oh, that's great. Just great, Jed. I'm going to paint it. I'm sure that will be wonderful. Now, about the art dealer who wants to buy some of your work, I lead. Who is it? Jed asks. It's not that awful Jennifer What's it, is it? I did not like her. He is referring to the rather bullish and stroppy art dealer, Jennifer Blackman, who works with some of the larger corporations in the city. I lift my eyes to Noah's and see that he's watching me. I turn away. The dealer works for a Saudi businessman, I believe. No, 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 no. Who is the art dealer? Do I know this person? No, I don't think you do. His name is Noah Grant. I've not dealt with him before, but I know him. He's here with me now, actually. No, that will not do. Jed replies. What do you mean? I won't sell to him, I can't. I resist the urge to smile. If Jed says he won't sell to Noah, then the problem is solved. May I ask why not? I don't know him, Tabitha. Therein lies the problem. What's he saying? Noah asks me. I put my hand over the receiver. He won't sell to you, I tell him with a look that says, what can you do? Why not? Noah asks. I shrug. You know how I am about people I don't know. I need to feel comfortable with someone before I will entrust my work to them, Jed continues. It's extremely important to me, extremely. Oh, I understand completely, Jed, I reply with a smile. It's entirely up to you who you sell your work to. Is it terrible of me that Jed refusing to sell to Noah makes me unreasonably happy? Yes, yes it is. Noah's brows are pulled together. Tell him you're the intermediary. He need only deal with you. Do I have to? I know, I do. Jed, Noah has pointed out that you can deal with me and not him, but if you still don't want to do it, I'll understand. Noah pulls his lips into a line. He holds his hand out. May I speak with him? He asks. I place my hand over the receiver once more and say, Oh, I don't think that's a good idea. He only likes to deal with me, remember? I reply with a shake of my head that may or may not be a touch patronising. What's not a good idea? Jed snaps, catching me off guard. Oh, uh, Noah asked to speak with you directly, Jed, but I know how you feel about that sort of thing. Well, it is Thursday, and I do like to try new things on a Thursday, which goes rather well with it being a phone day. My heart sinks. I try again. But you don't know him, Jed. I think I'll speak to him all the same. But, I protest. I lift my eyes to Noah's and see him smiling at me, his hand still outheld. 
I hand him the phone, resisting the urge to throw it on the floor like a petulant toddler that would not be helpful to anyone. Noah can't wipe the self-satisfied smirk from his face as he takes my phone from me, his fingers brushing briefly against mine. It makes my insides get all flattery. Seriously? My body is betraying me. He turns on his heel and wanders away from me. Jed, what a pleasure it is to speak with you. I am a big fan of your work. I press my lips together. I try my best to listen in on their conversation, but Noah is speaking in hushed tones on the other side of the gallery. I can't follow him around, eavesdropping. Well, not with my dignity intact, anyway. So instead, I make up a box and place the vase carefully inside and wait for him to finish his conversation, and hope Jed remains true to form and rejects any and all of Noah's suggestions. Noah strides over towards the desk. Yes, that sounds just great. Thank you so much, Jed, of course. I'm sure we'd both enjoy that. Yes, that works for me. Great to chat, Jed. Bye. He hangs up and passes me the phone. It's warm from his cheek. I raise my brows at him. You're going to meet him to see his work? I ask, trying to keep the surprise from my voice. We are, he corrects. We? As in, you and me? He nods, his eyes dancing. If that's okay with you, I assumed I'd need you there as the gallerist, and Jed seems to want to deal with you. He was very accommodating, actually. It turns out, he lives in Dalton, he says, naming the neighboring village to the one Noah and I grew up in. You didn't mention that to me. Slipped my mind. He pulls his own phone from his pocket. How are you looking this Saturday? I pull up the calendar on my phone. This Saturday, as in two days time? That's usually when Saturdays happen. I ignore the tease. We can make that work. The gallery is open on Saturday mornings, although I'm not rostered on this week. But I can come in all the same. Let's see him in the late morning. I'll just have to get through an hour or so more with Noah, and then I can be done with him, hopefully. He suggested we come to his studio in Dalton, actually. He prefers to stay home rather than travel to London. His studio? The thought of taking a trip with Noah has my insides tying in a reef knot. I swallow. He did mention he had quite a number of works already. I'm sure it'd be worth a lot to your gallery. He knows I can't argue with that. I land on an idea. I'll ask Prue to go with you. He shakes his head. Jed wants you, not Prue. Of course he does. I know I can't pass this opportunity up. Selling several Jed originals to Noah's client will mean a healthy profit for 496, and I do care about making a profit. But travelling to see Jed with Noah means being with Noah, and he's not exactly at the top of my party list right now. Not if I want to keep my heart safe, anyway. It's a decent drive, so how about I pick you up at seven? He asks. I close my eyes. If there was a way to get out of this without coming across as a petty-minded crazy person, I would grab it with both hands. But I'm cornered, and Noah knows it. So instead, I paste on a smile and reply. Sure, I'll send you my address. Chapter 10 I unclip the woven purple leash from Echo's collar and watch as she bolts across the lawn towards another dog, coming to a screeching halt to engage in some excited, but sniffing. Dogs are so gross, I say with a shake of my head, as Echo and her new buddy, a pristine white shih tzu with a pink collar with gold studs and the biggest beehive bouffant I've seen on a dog, turn in enthusiastic circles as they inhale one another's butt scent. Ugh. It's how they learn about one another. It's an info exchange. Zara replies as she places her own dog, Stevie, down on the ground. 
Stevie, too, dashes across the grass towards a cluster of dogs, her tail wagging so hard, it's amazing her trajectory even vaguely resembles a straight line. I raise my brows at my friend. Maybe that's how I should info share with new people in the future. I'm sure it'll go down a treat at the gallery. You could rock up to some cute guy at a pub and ask to sniff his butt, Lottie replies with a laugh. Oh, there's no asking. If you're a dog, you just do, Zara replies. Where's Ralph today? He's still recovering, having surgery to fix a cruciate ligament he managed to snap in a fit of overexcitement at seeing a hedgehog in the garden means serious bed rest for Sir Drew's lot, I'm afraid, Lottie replies. Zara pulls a face. Poor dog. Oh, he's doing just fine, believe me, Lottie replies with a roll of her eyes. James is totally pampering him. He bought him a new super plush dog bed from that expensive Penelope's Pooch's place, and he came home with venison for dinner last night. I thought he was going to cook it for me, but instead he chopped it up into Ralph bite-sized pieces and fed it to the bloomin' dog. I'd like to relax on a new bed and get fed venison by his honourable hotness, I reply with a sigh as I mock fan my face. That's Lottie's boyfriend you're talking about, Zara says with a giggle. I know, a girl can dream though, can't she? Not that I'm the least bit interested in James and he's absolutely perfect for you, Lottie, but he is pretty to look at. Does he have a brother, a cousin, any blood relation will do? I'll look into it for you, Tabitha, but James is rather gorgeous, isn't he? Lottie's cheeks blush as she smiles. Oh, you've got it bad, girl. So bad, Zara observes. Hello, you and Asha. You're still all hot and heavy with him, and it's been months and months, Lottie replies. Zara shrugs, a smile teasing her lips. What can I say? He's my perfect match, just like James is yours. Lottie beams. I let out a breath, and both of my friends turned to look at me. Sorry, Tabitha, I forgot we promised not to talk about being in love in front of you, Lottie says. Yes, yeah, sorry, totally thoughtless of us. Let's talk about how horrid men are, shall we? I wave my hand in the air. It's fine, you can gloat all you like. You earned it. I know I'm the only sad sack singleton left. We're not gloating, Zara protests. Not intentionally, anyway, Lottie adds. Speaking of men, you'll never guess who slid into my DMs yesterday, Zara leads. Who? I ask. Zara's eyes are bright when she replies. Magnus Gainsborough. Lottie scrunches up her nose. Who's Magnus Gainsborough? Ask Tabitha. He's an ex, I tell her. He's not just an ex. He's the ex, Zara adds, and I shoot her a look. I don't need to be reminded. Is this ex weak or something? What? It's true. There's no denying Magnus is your biggest ex. Zara replies, I thought Noah was the ex, not some guy who sounds like he should be in an E.M. Forster novel, Lottie says. Oh, Noah is definitely important, but she was never engaged to Noah. Isn't that right, Tabitha? Realization dawns on Lottie's face. Oh, right. Magnus is the one you almost married. I never knew his name was Magnus. Everyone called him Gainsey, Zara explains. It's a complicated web I've weaved, that's for certain. I reply elusively, with a light laugh that belies my true feelings at the mention of his name. Magnus Gainsborough, my rebound guy. The one who I should have gone for all along, only I fell for Noah and he ruined me for every other man.
I know, I sound like a freaking drama queen, but the facts are the facts. I might have been briefly engaged to Magnus, but my heart was always Noah's. Echo offers me a reprieve from an unpleasant walk down memory lane as she thunders across the lawn to me, pushes her wet nose against my jeans and then promptly returns to the throng of dogs playing in the park. She's such a sweetheart, Zara says. Don't let the dog's sweetness distract you. Tell me all about this Magnus Gainsborough bloke. Why is he in contact with you, Z? Lottie asks. Zara shrugs. Isn't it obvious? He wants to get in touch with Tabitha, but he's too chicken to contact her himself. I shake my head. I'm quite sure I'm the last person Magnus wants to see. Why? Because it ended badly? Lottie asks. Memories of Magnus fill my mind. After I ended things with Noah, everyone encouraged me to be with Magnus. My school friends, Prue, my parents, all of them told me what a great guy he was, how he was going places and how good we would be together. He was in his final year at Oxford, about to launch his banking career in the city. He was dazzling, good-looking, from the same sort of background as me. Basically, the right person for me to be with. But there was one thing he lacked. He wasn't Noah. I lift my chin in reply. It didn't work out, that's all. We were young and silly. Twenty-two is too young to get married. Only when you're marrying the wrong man, Zara says. What was wrong with him? Lottie asks. Nothing at all, I reply, meaning it. Because there was nothing wrong with Magnus. On paper, he was the perfect guy for me. But he didn't have your heart, Zara says. I pull my lips into a line as I shake my head. So you broke up with him? Left him at the altar or something equally dramatic? Lottie asks. She looks almost hopeful. Nope, he ended it. Lottie's eyes are wide. He did? Why? He was the smart one. He knew I wasn't really in love with him. And now he's come back to the well, thirsty for some more Tabitha love, Zara teases. Ew, that's gross, Lottie replies. It's also highly unlikely to be true. What did he say to you, Z? Lottie asks. She pulls her phone from her crossbody handbag and taps at it. It was extremely subtle. She turns the phone around and both Lottie and I peer at the screen to read the words. Hi, Z. Long time no see. Fancy a drink sometime? Bring Tabitha, just for old time's sake. She's still single. Gainsy. Lottie lets out a laugh. There's nothing subtle about that in the least. I know, I was being sarcastic, Zara replies as she slots her phone back in her handbag. What with Noah and now Magnus, this sure is the week for your past catching up with you. What weird hoodoo have you been putting out into the ether? Nothing conscious, believe me, I scoff laugh. Are you going to see him? Lottie asks. Who? Magnus? That's a hard no. I shake my head. Not going back there. So, I should cancel the double date I've set up for tomorrow? Zara asks, wide-eyed and innocent. You didn't set up a double date, I reply. I didn't, she replies. I couldn't have made it anyway. I'm away for the day tomorrow. I pause before I add. With Noah Grant. My friends gawk at me. As in Noah, Noah? The guy who turned up at the wedding reception and your gallery? Lottie asks. How many Noahs do I know? And don't say Noah and his ark, I warn. And don't forget he's the Noah who you saw at this very park with a girl. Zara adds. 
Does everyone know everything about my life? I question, already knowing the answer. Yes, yes, they do. Only us girls, Zara says. Kennedy put it on London, babes, Lottie explains, referring to the WhatsApp group the four of us share. Where are you going together tomorrow? Lottie questions. Oh, that's so soon. I groan. I know I'm not mentally ready. Zara places her hand on Lottie's arm. Wait, the important question here is not where she's going with Noah, unless it's somewhere romantic like Paris. Is it Paris? Lottie asks, hopefully. Why would I be going to Paris with the guy? Zara shrugs. Okay, so not Paris. Dalton. Dalton? Where's that? I've never even heard of it, Lottie says. It's a small town in the countryside, near where I grew up. And before you ask, it's to see an artist Noah's interested in. He's this quirky guy who only likes to deal with people he knows, which is why I need to tag along. A day trip to a quaint town in the countryside with the guy who stole your heart, Lottie muses. She widens her eyes. What could possibly go wrong? I give her a look. A guy who's almost certainly involved with a woman with alien long legs. Her legs are green, like a Martian's? Lottie asks with a snort laugh. Yeah, that's what I meant. I reply, my tone droll. How do you feel about spending the day with him, babe? Zara questions. How do you think? I'm a box of fluffy ducks wearing tutus over it. I deadpan, because really, I've got some seriously mixed emotions about spending time with Noah. Mixed, complicated, conflicting. On the one hand, I'm excited. After all, he's had my heart all these years. He's the one that got away. And I can't help thinking, what if? What if he still feels the same way? What if we could finally make a go of it together? What if he still loves me? On the other hand, the sensible, non-rom-com watching, non-fairytale believing pragmatist in me says what's done is done and he moved on from me a long time ago. That part of me keeps winning the battle. Because I know this is just business, nothing more. He's made that abundantly clear with the way he's dealt with me at the gallery, both times. I just need to remember that. Fluffy ducks wearing tutus, Zara giggles, joined by Lottie, who hadn't stopped giggling over her terrible Martian leg joke. I throw my hands up in the air. What is it with you two? Sorry, sorry, Lottie says, as she pulls her lips in from her smile. We'll be serious, won't we, Z? Absolutely, just as long as those tutu-wearing ducks or Martian girls don't turn up. She bursts into laughter once more and I do my best to glare at my friends as I fight the urge to laugh too. A whole day with Noah Grant. How am I going to survive it in one piece? Stevie appears at Sarah's feet, gazing up at her as if she wants to tell her mummy all about the adventures she's been having. Hi, baby. Zara coos. I think it's about time I got you home. I eye echo. She's been running herself ragged with a group of other dogs and has now finally begun to slow, her tongue hanging out of her mouth as she pants heavily. I call her and she pricks up her ears before she dashes over to me. She's such a good girl, Lottie coos. Remember when Stevie was an insane puppy and didn't do anything you asked? Zara throws her eyes to the sky, all I'll say is thank goodness for puppy training. I lean down to clip Echo's lead back on her collar. All right, girls. Wish me luck for tomorrow. Keep us updated on everything. Zara shoots me a meaningful look. There will be nothing to update you on other than that the business trip went well. 
I tell them. We'll see, Lottie replies, her eyes bright. Bye, girls, I say in a firm tone. I walk Echo back home along the streets of Notting Hill, half expecting Noah to pop up at every turn. He doesn't, and I reach Maya's flat without incident. Once inside, Echo makes a beeline for Timmy, who rushes to greet her with open arms. Echo places a long, slobbery lick on his face, and Timmy lets out a giggle. Maya, I'm so sorry, but I need to postpone my offer to take the children out for you tomorrow. Can I do it next weekend? Oh, wait, that's my birthday party at my parents' house. How about the weekend after that? I know I'm letting her down, but it can't be helped. Oh, her face drops. I had hoped you might be able to take Echo for the weekend instead, but never mind. I'll work something else out. I've been working on my finances now that Stephen's taken off, and I need to at least try to sell my cards at the market, and Mum said she'll take the kids, but she insists on no dog. She's allergic now apparently. Some homeopath or someone told her to avoid dog fur and dandelions. Dog fur and dandelions? Who ever heard of such a thing? Babe, I'd love to have Echo, but I'm taking a new client to another town to see an artist tomorrow. She tilts her head as she watches me. Your cheeks have flushed. No, they haven't, I protest, as warmth claims my cheeks. She gives me a knowing smile. Yeah, they have. Who is this new client? Just a client. Her brows rise. Really, Noah's an art dealer and wants me to take him to meet an artist up in Dalton. That's all. Noah? No one. Noah, no one, eh? Sounds interesting. Not interesting in the least. She waggles her brows at me, a smirk on her face. This Noah is clearly a cute art dealer that's got my neighbour all hot under the collar. He's done no such thing, I sniff, feeling hot under my collar. Dang it. Echo appears at the door once more and gives my fingers a lick. I smile down at her. Would it be so bad to take her on my day trip to Dalton tomorrow? She might provide a good distraction, and I bet distractions will be very useful when it comes to being stuck in a car with Noah for hours on end. Echo, do you want to come and hang out with Auntie Tabitha this weekend? But I thought, Maya begins, I want to help out, and you know how much I adore this girl. I'm certain I can make it work. Oh, Tabitha, you're an absolute star. She pulls me into a one-armed hug. I say goodbye to Maya and the children and take the stairs down to my flat. As I sink down into my soft sofa cushions and kick off my heels, I fire off a message to Noah. Me. Okay if we bring my neighbour's dog on the road trip with us tomorrow. She's in a jam and I'm helping her out. Dots appear almost immediately on my screen and I know he's messaging me back. Noah. Who, the dog or the neighbor? He's trying to be cute with me now? I try not to let the way I like it affect me. Me, the neighbor, clearly. Noah. What size is it? I'm tapping out a reply when another message pops up on my screen. Noah. The dog, not the neighbor. A smile creeps across my face. Yup, he's definitely trying to be cute. Me. She's dog-sized. Noah. Helpful. Me. She's an Australian Kelpie. There's a pause, and then the dots appear on my screen once more. Noah. Googled it. She's knee-height. Me. Maybe on oversized people like you... She's a medium-sized dog. Dots reappear on my screen, then disappear. I chew on my lip. Is it too cheeky to ask to bring a medium-sized dog? 
or knee height, depending on whether you're Noah six foot three Grant or not. On a road trip in another person's car? I already know the answer, but I'm hoping Noah will be gracious about it. A message appears on my screen. Noah. Sure, no problem. Well, that's a surprise. I tap out, thanks, and then drop my phone on the sofa cushion. It's kind of him to allow Echo to come along. He didn't have to say yes. Of course, I remember that he used to like dogs, but that was a long time ago. People change. I send a short message to Maya, telling her that I'll collect Echo early tomorrow. Then I message Jed, asking him if it's okay to bring a well-behaved dog to his studio, offering to leave her in the car for our appointment if he prefers. He will either be repelled by the idea or completely into it. I'll just have to wait and see. Then I turn on Netflix to distract me from my thoughts. Tomorrow is going to be an endurance event, a major test of my strength. I need to remind myself that whatever feelings I may have for Noah, everything, the way he behaves around me, seeing him with the girl in the park... The fact that this is just a work trip points to the fact that he's moved on. He's no longer my Noah, and he's not been mine for a very long time. Get through tomorrow, and I can get back to the safety of life as I know it, even if that life is all alone. Chapter 11 Twelve Years Ago Come lie down here next to me, Duchess. I tilt my head and regard Noah. He's lying flat on his back, his body half on the picnic blanket and half on the grass, his plain white t-shirt crumpled with one jean-clad knee folded up. His mouth is curved in the heart-melting smile I've come to know and adore over our time together, his eyes inviting and warm in the sun by the old oak tree. I take a final bite of apple from our picnic of sandwiches, fruit, Maltesers, my favourite chocolates, and cans of Coke, and lie down at his side, our bodies touching as we gaze up at the summer sky. He takes my hand in his and we share a smile before he lets out a deep, contented breath. You look good in that dress. I glance down at my pale blue summer dress with its thin straps and A-line skirt. I wore it because I know it makes Noah smile, and making Noah smile is one thing I love to do. Thanks, I reply. See that one up there? He asks, as he points at a cloud formation. Doesn't it look like the little red caboose? The little red what? I ask with a giggle. Are you making up random words now? You know, that book about the little engine that always came last after the boxcars and the oil cars and the big black engine? I look at him blankly. What are you talking about, Noah? He pushes himself up on his elbow and gazes down at me. The little red caboose. From my spot on the blanket, I smile up at him my heart still going all kinds of crazy each time he's close, just as it has every time we've been together over the last 11 months. The best 11 months of my life. You know, just repeating the name won't help, I tell him. He grins at me as he reaches out and takes a strand of my long hair in his hand. I can't believe you don't know that book. It's a classic kid's story. It's all about a little red caboose. I interrupt. He lets out a low laugh, and it reaches inside of me and tickles my belly. I've always loved Noah's laugh. Ever since that first day after we met on the country lane, it's warm and deep and builds slowly into a sound that fills my chest. Although I've been away at boarding school most of the year, and Noah's training to be a mechanic at the college in Dalton, and his dad's garage here in the village. When we can snatch time away to be together, hearing his laugh is one of my all-time favorite things. Yeah, that's right. 
He tangles his fingers up in my hair and leans down to trail kisses across my shoulder, working his way up my neck, each kiss tingling my skin as he works his way upwards. When his lips connect with me, my whole body melts, shots of electricity travelling down my neck and hitting their target deep in my belly. With each touch of his lips against my skin, my breathing becomes ragged as my need for him builds. Finally, after he's worked me up into a frenzy, he reaches my face and brushes his lips teasingly against mine, making me almost explode with desire for him. Looks like I'm gonna have to get you that book, aren't I? He says against my mouth, our breath mingling. How about you forget about whatever a caboose is and kiss me, Noah Grant? I don't wait for his reply. His grin tells me he wants me just as much as I want him. I hook my hands around the back of his neck and pull him to me, claiming his soft lips with mine, the lips that teased me only moments ago. He kisses me right back, drawing me up against his firm body, and I lose myself in him, as I always, always do. When you finally come home, we can do this every single day. He breathes as he peppers my face with soft kisses. I'm home for the weekend, about to finish at my boarding school for good, which feels amazing, not only because it's been a long time coming, but because it means Noah and I will have all summer long together before I leave for university in autumn. And then, once you graduate, we can be together properly, he says. I look into his eyes. Is that your way of proposing or something? I reply with a giddy laugh. Because although I'm making a joke, part of me would love for Noah to propose, and I know what my reply would be. It's my way of telling you how much you mean to me and how I never want to let you go. He kisses me once more and adds, Because I love you, Duchess. I let out a giddy laugh as I hear the words fall from his lips for the very first time, the words I felt in my heart for so long. I love you too. His face creases into a grin, and he sweeps me up in his arms and kisses me once more. How long have you loved me? I ask him. Oh, that's easy. It was here, under this tree. I glance over at the solid, twisted trunk of the old oak. When? The first time we kissed. A sense of euphoria wafts over me, like smoke from a campfire. On that very first day? My mind turns to that incredible day when he nervously took me in his arms right here, by this tree. Yeah, he replies simply. How about you? I think I loved you then, too. We share a smile. You know, Duchess, I will propose to you one day, but it'll be when you least expect it. Perhaps here, under this old oak tree. I bite down on my lip, the thought of being Noah's wife someday filling my heart with joy. I can't imagine loving anyone else. Will you now? Under this old tree? Not in Paris or Venice or somewhere else super romantic, I tease. He lets out another low, rumbling laugh. You'll just have to wait and see. And then he claims my lips with his once more, and I kiss him right back, the prospect of being with Noah forever, filling my heart right up to the brim. Chapter 12 I can do this. No problem. Easy peasy. So what if I'm currently sitting in a car next to the only guy I've ever loved, a guy I once thought I would spend my entire life with? I've got this. As I said, easy peasy. But if I'm totally honest, the only fly in the ointment right now is that Noah looks good as in ridiculously, implausibly and irritatingly good, the kind of good that is hard to tear your eyes away from, 
the kind of good you want to drink in, nice and slow. It's Saturday, so he's not in the suit I've seen him wearing before. Today, he's sporting a pair of dark blue jeans and a white cotton button-up shirt that he has open at the collar, revealing his olive skin and a hint of dark chest hair. Not that I'm looking. <clears throat> his sleeves are rolled up to just below his elbows, and his muscles move as he drives his black sporty SUV that fits Echo perfectly in the back. Oh, yeah. And did I mention he smells good too? It's his all too familiar no ascent that reminds me of everything that passed between us back when we were teenagers. It's a lot. You'd think the fact we've got a dog currently panting her dog breath in the back seat would do something to dispel the tension in the car, or in the very least put a dent in Noah's persistent scent but it's doing nothing whatsoever. I let out a puff of air. My watch a church steeple in the distance grows slowly closer as we speed along the motorway. The casual clothes, the car, the intoxicating scent. That's one big sexy fly in the ointment I've got to contend with today. I know one thing for absolute certain, this trip will take a colossal amount of strength to navigate. Noah looks over at me and offers me a smile. You okay there? He asks. Yep, fine, I reply as I concentrate on the church steeple. I flick my gaze to his and our eyes lock briefly before he returns his attention to the road. My belly does a flippity flop. Hmm... Maybe this won't be quite so easy-peasy after all. I clench my fists in my lap. I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. I think there's a motorway services coming up in a few minutes. We could give Echo a short walk and stretch our legs. We've been on the road for a while. Whatever suits, I tell him, my tone purposefully light and non-committal. I don't know about you, but I sure could do with a coffee. He glances at me once more and I soften a touch. He's trying to be friendly and easygoing. I should take a page out of his book and pull myself down a notch, or ten. Being this tightly wound can't be good for me. After all, we may have history together, but it's ancient history from before we were proper grown-ups he can quite obviously manage to have a professional relationship with me. A coffee sounds good, I reply. Echo's a good passenger. I think she's only tried to reach her tongue out to lick the side of my head four or five times, Noah says. I look back at Echo on the back seat. How are you, girl? I ask. She's sitting on her haunches, her ears pricked up, and she emits an excited whine as if to say, I should be roaming fields, doing exciting things, not stuck in the back of a car on the motorway for hours on end. I reach back and stroke her fur and she leans down to lick my sleeve. She says she's just fine, I tell Noah as I straighten in my seat. You mentioned she's your neighbor's dog? She lives in the flat above mine, but I get to hang out with her most days. She used to be a working dog on a farm, so she's got energy to burn, which is why I take her out to the local park. The image of Noah and the long-limbed woman running by enters my consciousness, so I push it away quick smart. Not helpful right now. What's a farm dog doing living in a flat in Notting Hill? Maya, that's my upstairs neighbor, got the dog from her cousin who's a farmer. Apparently, Echo wasn't that good with herding sheep, so she was going begging. What did she do? From what Maya told me, she would get a little distracted and end up doing her own thing, which was either chasing bunnies or her own tail, apparently. So Maya offered to take her. She's a beautiful dog. I smile to myself. Something we agree on. I love hanging out with her. There's something about her dog energy that works for me. She's come to the gallery with me a few times. How do your clients like her? 
Some love her. Some, let's just say we've had to put her out back a few times. People can be weird about dogs. They sure can, he replies with a laugh. It's deep and rumbling and tickles my insides, just like it used to. I'm glad you brought her along. He pulls the car off the motorway, and he parks it in one of the spots by the entrance. I step out of the car and open the back door, holding firmly onto Echo's collar so she doesn't bolt from her spot. I click on her lead and she jumps to the ground, happy to be free. Come on, Echo, I tell her, and I stride over to a patch of grass beside the services with a dog straining on her lead in her excitement. We do a stop-start walk as she sniffs and does her doggy business, accompanied by the loud hum of the motorway. Noah locks the car and joins me, and we walk around in silence until it's time to put Echo back in the car. Coffee? He asks me, and I nod my reply as a cool wind whips my hair around my face. I smooth it back, only for it to get loose once more. Let's get inside. I forgot how cold it can be in this country, even in summer. I tell Echo to stay before Noah cracks a window and locks the car. I take a tentative step into conversation that doesn't involve echo or art. That sounds like you've been abroad. Have you been in the US to see your mum's family? Oh, I know, Saudi Arabia, where you met your client. Both places. I've spent a lot of time in the US over the last 10 or 12 years. He has? What were you doing there? Oh, you know, a bunch of things. He gestures at the chain cafe with the oversized sign. Coffee this way. Is he avoiding my question? And if so, why? Is what he's been up to over the last 12 years some big state secret or something? Or is he just hesitant to open up to me? The thought sits uncomfortably inside. We come to a stop behind a queue at the counter. What can I get you? He asks. Personally, I'm going for a latte with one of those scones. I skipped breakfast this morning. I wave his offer away with as pleasant a smile as I can muster. It's fine, I can get my own coffee, but thanks all the same. He arches a brow at me. I'm more than happy to spend a couple of quid on a coffee for you, Tabitha. Really, it's fine. How about I get you a scone, then? Surely a guy can buy a girl a scone. His eyes sparkle at me as his lips quirk, and an unwelcome warmth spreads across my belly. I lift my chin. I ate breakfast. Suit yourself. He turns to the server to place his order. Hi, Julian. He tells the young, skinny guy, whose face is covered in angry-looking acne, reading his name tag. I'll have a regular latte and one of your delicious-looking scones, please. Both to go. Do you want the scone heated up? Julian asks. That'd be great. And my friend here will have a... He turns to me in question. A flat white, regular, but I'll be paying separately. I tell him, without glancing Noah's way. Also to take away? Julian asks. That's right. I pull my purse out of my handbag and hand him a few coins. Keep the change, I tell him, my tone magnanimous as I turn away. Er, uh, you're twenty pence short, he replies. My face heats. I ferret around in my purse until I find four five-pence coins and hand them to Julian. A piece of fluff is attached to one of the coins and he makes a scene of removing it from his palm and offering it back to me. Seriously? Like I want a piece of fluff from my purse? I take it from him and jam it into my pocket before I make the ill-advised choice to glance Noah's way. He's watching the exchange with a smile playing on his lips. Shall we take a seat while we wait? Noah asks. Actually, I thought I might have a look at the gift section in the shop over there. 
I nod at the variety shop across the mini mall. Sure thing. See you in five. Once in the shop, I push out a breath and head towards the rack of t-shirts. I've got no intention of buying a t-shirt or anything from this shop, but I could do with having a breather from Noah right now, especially after the purse fluff incident. My phone chimes in my handbag, and I pull it out to see a message from Jed. The dog is welcome as long as he doesn't disturb the cat, or the birds. I type a message in reply. She will be on her best behaviour, I promise. See you at midday. Echo will be pleased. No waiting in the car with the windows cracked for her today. I pull out one of the t-shirts from the rack with the words, Exercise makes you look good, but so does wine, your choice, emblazoned on the front. As I hold it up in the long, slim mirror, I hear a familiar voice. That brings out the color of your eyes. I turn to look at him. The t-shirt's yellow. Are you suggesting my eyes look yellow like a snake? I'm aiming for a light, jovial tone, but it comes out a touch snappy. It's not easy striking the right tone with this guy. I was thinking more like a cat, one with super sharp teeth. I flick my eyes briefly to his. Very funny. He shrugs. Are you going for wine or exercise? I put the t-shirt back on the rack. Neither right now. Try the blue. He pulls a pale blue from the rack and holds it out to me. You always looked good in blue. I glance at the shirt in his hand, memories of my blue sundress playing on my mind. I was only passing the time. I'm not actually in the market for a new t-shirt. But this one says, don't be daft, he protests. How can you pass up a t-shirt that says that? I suppress a smile. He's trying to lighten the mood between us, but I'm not sure I'm ready to get all light and chummy with him just yet. How about this one? He holds a pink t-shirt up with a logo that says, Every woman is a doll. Some are Barbies and some are voodoo. I arch an eyebrow. So what am I? A Barbie doll or a voodoo doll? He laughs as he shrugs. The better question is probably why someone would put this on a t-shirt. <laughs> or who would wear it. Exactly. It's pretty sexist. I wander away from him and come to a stop by the snacks. He follows me and plucks a bag of chocolates from the display. Maltesers were your favorite back in the day, if I remember right. I glance at the red packet of chocolate balls and instantly my mouth begins to water. Oh, I've moved on now. You have? Of course. It was so long ago. People change. While once I was a Maltesers girl, now I'm more into... I search the shelf of chocolates and land on a collection of Yorkie chocolates. Yorkie bars. He offers me a questioning look. The truck driver's chocolate? Now who's being sexist? Hey, it's totally your choice. If you like big, chunky, manly chocolate bars these days, then go for it. There's no judgment here. He picks a couple of the bars off the shelf, as well as a family-sized packet of mall teasers. I'm going to go buy these. You don't have to... I begin to protest, but he cuts me off. They're all for me. My suppressor smile. All of those... What can I say? I've been out of the country for too long. I need a British candy fix. A short time later, with our coffee and Noah's large volume of chocolate, we returned to his car and set off once more, speeding along the motorway in silence. I take a sip of my coffee and watch as Noah bites into his scone. Good? I ask him. Delicious. He replies with a mouthful of the doughy treat. Want some? I eye the scone in his hand and my tummy rumbles in response. Yes, I'd told him I'd eaten breakfast, and yes, I'd lied about that. I was making a point. What that point was, I can't quite recall right now, but I'm certain it needed to be made at the time. 
Go on. I know you secretly want some. Just one bite. I don't want to deprive you. I take the warm scone from his hand. You won't. I've got all my candy, remember? What every fully functioning adult has for breakfast, I tease, and he lets out a laugh. It feels nice, familiar, but I need to be careful. I still need to keep him at arm's length, so much safer. What's a road trip without candy? He asks. Healthy? I suggest. I break a piece of the scone off with my fingers and sink my teeth in. It's warm and buttery and, frankly, delicious. Finish it. I got another one, just in case. He pulls a second scone in a paper bag out from where he must have slipped it into his door as we got in the car. When did you buy that? When you went to look in the store? I figured you'd end up eating mine, just like you always did. Memories of shared meals and snacks, of stolen chips and sips of drinks flood my mind. What can I say? You always had the better food. His eyes slide to mine, and we lock gazes briefly before I look away. Instead, I concentrate on enjoying the buttered scone and looking out the window at the countryside. Can I say something, Tabitha? He asks after a while pulling my attention back to the car. Of course. I know we've got history, you and me. I know things ended, well, they ended. But we both moved on, right? It was a long time ago. We were just kids, really. I press my lips together. This is good. This is getting things out in the open, naming them so we can work together today. I guess what I'm saying is... I get that this could be awkward for you. Heck, it's awkward for both of us. Working with an ex, going on a road trip with one. Buying both their old and their new favorite chocolates at a motorway service, I add, and am rewarded with a smile. I have faith in us being able to put our past behind us today and manage to work together on this, don't you? Despite knowing he's right, Despite knowing it would be dangerous to do anything else, my belly sinks. Which is crazy. I mean, what was I hoping for today? That Noah would turn around and confess his feelings for me on the motorway to Dalton. That he somehow harbored a deep, enduring love for me all these years, but has been too afraid to find me and tell me how he really feels. That happening upon me at that wedding brought all those feelings crashing back, sucking the very wind from his lungs? Uh, no, not any of it. He's made it blatantly clear he's moved on. He's got a girlfriend or a wife or whoever that gorgeous specimen of womanhood I saw him out running with is. He's not still in love with me, no matter how I feel about him and I need to remember that. I tilt my head to look at him. Of course we can, Noah. Consider it done. Chapter 13 I'm not going to lie. Being back in Dalton with Noah, the town near where we grew up, is weird. As in, completely mind-frazzlingly weird. Okay, we're not in Marlingworth, the actual village where we fell in love, so that's something, but we may as well be. Because that village, our village, not only looks a whole lot like where we find ourselves, but it's only about an 18-minute drive west from where we're standing right this very minute. An 18-minute drive is not a lot of time, not a lot of time at all. Especially when you're trying your absolute best to bury memories of your teenage relationship. Memories like being in love. Yeah, that. So instead, I'm trying to focus on this new normal we've got going on between us. Me with Noah and Dalton, in which we are officially getting along. 
Ever since that little chat we had in the car about how Noah thinks we can work together today, despite our past, I've been making pleasant conversation about inconsequential things. I've laughed at his jokes, I've told him all about Jed's eccentricities and how you never really know what you're going to get each time you see him. I've even told him a little about my life as a London gallery owner. And, crucially, neither of us has delved into our past. In fact, we've been so dang polite with one another, you'd think we were disinterested acquaintances, spending the day together on a shared task. That is, until we arrived in Dalton, the oh-so-quaint town Jed calls home. You know, the one that's only an 18-minute drive from our village? That one. On the drive here, the thought had crossed my mind that being here would bring a flood of memories back. But I assumed, since we weren't actually going to Marlingworth, we wouldn't be thumped between the eyes with memories. I told myself I would cope just fine. Now that I'm here with a sexy-looking Noah in his slightly crumpled shirt and jeans combo he's got going on, well, let's just say I was more than a little too optimistic on that front. Memories hitting right between the eyes. We've already stopped at a dog park I found on my phone and given Echo a decent run around with a couple of other dogs, followed by a large bowl of water. Noah has just parked his car, and we're now standing on a cobbled street, lined with picturesque honey-coloured stone houses and quaint lead-light shop windows. Really, it's so charming. It's like we've stepped back in time and I half expect a character from Bridgerton to appear on a horse, tip their hat at us, and go on their merry way. That doesn't happen because... You know, this is the 21st century and not Regency England. What does happen is, I'm so swamped by memories of Noah and me together that I can't even look at the guy. Not even when he says, Dalton looks just how I remember it. Super picturesque. It looks good, don't you think? Actually, that's what I assume he said. I'm so busy trying not to think about him, it sounded more like blah 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 to me. Tabitha, you still in there? He questions when I don't reply. I flick my gaze to him and immediately regret doing it. Get a grip, Tabitha. Sorry, what? Dalton, it looks good just like I remember it. I offer him a vague smile. That's... Good, I tell him, as I concentrate on looking up the street at the grocery store with rows of brightly coloured fruits, vegetables and herbs on display. I guess it is. I mean, no one would argue that good isn't good, right? I press my lips together. I am so busted. Sorry, I was distracted. No worries. Have you been to Jed's studio before? Several times. Shall we get going? It's almost midday, which is our appointment time. All righty, I reply with a chipper tone. All righty? Jeez. It's this way, I raise my chin, tug on Echo's lead, and begin to walk down the street in the direction of Jed's studio. He places his hand lightly on my arm, causing me to stop and look up at him in surprise his touch sending an involuntary jolt of electricity through me. Are you okay? You've gone weird. I thought things were good with us. I snort laugh. It's loud, and I'm immediately embarrassed. Imitating a pig is always so attractive. Not that I'm trying to be attractive right now, of course. It's more of a general point. Things are good. They're great. I might have gone a step too far in the enthusiasm stakes. You sure? It's just I thought things had been going well between us and now you've gone all stiff and odd and don't seem to want to even look at me. His hand is still on my arm. I toss my hair, 
Oh, I'm sure it's all in your imagination. I'm fine and dandy. You're fine and dandy? He questions, and the smile playing on his lips, coupled with his warm hand on my lightly clothed arm, has my belly tightening, and I don't want my belly tightening over him. It's an expression, Noah, I reply haughtily, as I pull my arm from his grasp. Sure it is, from the 1940s. Perhaps. I really don't know where all my expressions come from. I change the subject. Now, come this way. Jed's studio is at the end of this muse and it's almost time, as you yourself mentioned. Without looking back, I march down the street on my espadrilles, Echo trotting along with me. I turn into the muse. It's narrow and, of course, ridiculously picturesque, with stone houses covered in lush green ivy and brightly painted doors. Noah catches up to me in probably only a couple of long-legged strides. He should have normal-length legs, or better yet, the leg size of a hobbit. And their big hairy feet as well, not to mention their wide little bodies and bearded faces. I grin to myself as I pass another door. Yes, Noah Grant as a hobbit is a rather appealing idea. One that I wish could be a reality, rather than the six-foot-three hunk of a man currently moving effortlessly at my side, smelling the way he does, with that sexy American accent of his, wreaking havoc with my tenuous emotional state. Give me Hobbit Noah any day of the week. We come to a stop by an old-fashioned black wooden garage door with a brass bell on a pulley. Here it is, I tell him. Look, I get it. Noah says, rounding on me. You get what? Me being fine and dandy with? I gesture between us. This? Because I am, really. His lips twitch. So you said. I give him a nod before I reach for the bell pulley. Shall we go in? What I mean is, I get that it's weird to be here with me, in the area we grew up in, so close to Marlingworth. We've got history in this place. I know it was a long time ago, but I can't help feel it too, you know. He sweeps his gaze up the muse before it lands back on me. This place evokes a lot of feelings for me too. With my hand frozen mid-stretch, I lift my eyes tenuously to his. It does? Yeah, it does. And, you know, it's okay not to feel 100% fine, or even dandy. He adds, his dark eyes shining. A smile claims my face. I, okay. If I'm honest, I was feeling a little less than fine and dandy a moment ago, but I think I'm good now. You sure? Yep. Great. Dandy? I offer. And I know I'm teasing, and maybe even flirting a little, but I'm not going to dwell on that. Dandy, he confirms with a nod of his head, his eyes dancing. We've got this. He gestures at the bell pulley. Shall we? It's noon. Absolutely. I yank down and the bell sounds, making Echo's ears prick up. Muffled noises come from behind the door, including the shrill shriek of a cat and what sounds like someone knocking something over. Noah and I share a look. A moment later, the door is pulled open to reveal Jed himself, a scowl on his thin face. He's wearing a paint-splattered black shirt with a grandfather collar and an oversized pair of charcoal dress pants, held in at the waist with a piece of frayed yellow rope, like the type you see people on water skis using. What hair he has left on his head is mousy brown and sticking out at odd angles, reminding me, as he always does, of a cross between the young version of the scientist from Back to the Future and Bill Nye. Hi there, Jed. It's great to see you, I say to him. 
This is Noah Grant, and this here is Echo. Noah extends his hand. It's an absolute honor to meet you, sir. I'm a huge fan of your work, as is my client, and I've been following your career for a few years now. Jed regards Noah's outstretched hand as though it were an exotic oddity to be studied, rather than shaken. He flicks his pale blue eyes to me in question. Noah's the dealer I talked to you about earlier in the week, I explain. You wanted to see him before you would consider selling your artwork to him. Hello, hello, he says with a series of rapid head nods. That's right, sorry, you caught me at a bad time. We did. We agreed midday on the phone, but if now's not good, we can come back later if you prefer, I offer. No, no, it's fine. I need a break anyway. It's all a disaster. All of it. Uh-oh. A ginger cat slinks out of the door and comes to a sudden stop when it notices Echo. It immediately arches its back and begins to hiss. I tighten Echo's lead, just in case she decides to remember how to herd. She stiffens, her attention solely focused on the new feline arrival. She emits a long, low growl, her tail quivering. It's a Mexican standoff, neither creature making the first move. Echo, I warn. Why don't I take her for a short walk and let the cat go where it wants to go? Noah offers, and I shoot him a grateful look. Jad waves his hand in the air. Never mind that. Petrov needs to come with me. He reaches down and sweeps the prickly cat up in his arms, which I think is a very brave move, and then turns around and walks back into the house. Do we follow? Noah asks. I think we do. I tell Echo to heal, and the three of us follow Jed into the darkened hallway. I blink as my eyes take a moment to adjust to the light after the bright midday sun outside. Where'd he go? Noah asks. I don't know, but I think this door leads to the studio. I gesture at a closed door on my left. I clear my throat and call. <clears throat> Jed? We're not sure if you want us in the studio or somewhere else? There's a muffled, Stay right where you are, Petrov. And then Jed reappears in the hallway, cat-free. My studio is not a positive space right now. It sounds like a question, but I know it's not. I'm sorry to hear that, I reply. Are you working on something new? I'm trying to, but it's not coming to me. The thoughts, the feelings, the lyrics to my song. See? He pushes the door open to the studio and we peer inside. The room is filled with dazzling light, pouring in from the large windows and the skylights above. There's a huge canvas that covers almost the entire floor, with several tubs of paint opened up against the walls, ready and waiting for Jed's inspiration to hit. For as long as I've known him, he's always worked like this. Not one for an easel, he's always laying his canvases on the floor to work. It's one of the reasons critics love the movement and energy in his work, because he literally has to move all over the canvas in order to create it. Echo sniffs the edge of the canvas, and I pull her gently away. It's amazing to get to see the very beginning of your process, even if it's not quite begun yet, Noah says. Jed lets out a defeated sigh, his face crumpling. I've been coming here every morning for the last two and a half weeks and nothing, nothing. He gestures at a wooden stool in one of the corners. I sit there and I wait and I wait and I wait. I have faith in you, Jed. Your work to date has been extraordinary and we love having it in the gallery, I say. It's been adequate. Jed replies, but now I need a new direction, 
something exciting, something raw and new and me. So far, it persists in eluding me. Creativity is a fickle mistress indeed. Not sure what else to say, we stand and wait as he gives a final dejected look at the empty canvas, then lets out a sigh and turns to leave. We follow him into a room at the end of the hall. It's quite obviously his living room, with an old-fashioned floral sofa and chairs by a fireplace, and a huge bookcase filled with everything from books to art supplies to rocks and plastic tubs, filled with who knows what. There's even a frying pan. On the other wall, there's a mounted canvas, facing inwards, leaning against the wall. Jed makes his way around the furniture to it. This is the artwork I had in mind for you, Tabitha, although I'm not sure it's really actually finished yet. But I couldn't keep it in the studio any longer. It needed to go. Can we take a look at it? I ask tentatively. He turns his back to the canvas, his hand to his forehead. If you must. I tell Echo to sit and stay, and Noah and I pull the painting out from against the wall and take a look at it. It's Jed's characteristic style, with abstract lines, bold colours, and even the inclusion of a few of his little people. Prue will be pleased. Is it possible to take it down to the good light in the studio, so I can take a decent look at it, Jed? Noah asks. Reading Jed's mood, he adds. I'm sure Tabitha and I can manage it if you'd prefer not to be involved. Jed turns to reply, but before he gets the chance, Petrov the cat appears from out of nowhere and dashes across the floor. Echo immediately chases after her, barreling from the room and ricocheting off the door jamb in her eagerness to reach the cat. Noah and I share a panicked look, before we both instantly spring into action, me leaning the canvas up against the wall before we both race after the animals in their mad dash down the hallway. With his long legs, giraffe length, remember, Noah reaches Echo first, with Jed and I arriving at a close second to see the cat with its back arched and fur standing to full attention as he hisses at Echo from his spot on top of the bar stool in the studio. Echo is concentrating hard on him, her entire body rigid as she growls from a spot on the empty canvas on the floor. It's a classic cat-dog standoff, and I can almost hear the whistle of a western movie sound in the background. Echo, I warn as I inch closer to her. It's as though the sound of my voice sparks her into action, and she lunges towards the cat as Noah dashes across the room to try to grab a hold of her. But it's too late. With a screech and a series of excited barks, a blur of ginger fur flies across the room, landing on one of the open paint tubs. Dripping in paint, the cat scrambles across the floor, leaving a trail of bright blue across the canvas as he goes, before he disappears out the door. Not to be outdone and hot on his tail, Echo bounds through not just the blue paint, but the red, yellow and green, knocking them over and dragging them across the entire canvas, her paw prints visible as she too bolts from the room in hot pursuit. Ah! Jed yells, a look of horror on his face. No! I call out in shock, my heart hammering against my ribcage. This cannot be happening. I'll get her, don't worry. Noah promises me as he rushes after the animals down the hallway. My jaw drops open as I take in the mess they've left behind. The previously pristine canvas is now covered in animal paw prints and sloshes of paint, now dripping off the edges and onto the floor. Jackson the Dripper Pollock himself would be impressed. 
I make my way around the edges and write the pots that have been knocked over by the world's naughtiest Australian Kelpie, and ready myself for an almighty and completely justified telling off by Jed. I'm so, so sorry about this. Echo's usually such a good girl, and I promised you she would be, and she's gone and done this. I sweep my arms open, as though Jed needs reminding of the damage. I'll replace the canvas and all the paint, just as soon as I can, I promise, and we'll clean the paint off the floor down the hall and wherever the cat and dog took it, and the cat will clean the cat too. Just how we're going to manage that, I have no clue. Jed is standing perfectly still with his arms wrapped around himself, concentrating on the canvas at his feet. When he doesn't speak, I chance. Jed? I hold my breath as I watch for his reaction. I get nothing. When he still doesn't respond, I ask with caution. Are you okay? I mean, of course you're not okay. That goes without saying. My dog just wrecked your canvas and spilled your paints. But as I mentioned, I will... He holds his hand up to silence me, his eyes still trained on the mess. I clamp my mouth shut. If the man wants me to shut up, I'll shut up. Really, it's the least I can do right now. Noah appears at the doorway cradling a very colourful, very guilty echo in his arms. Paint has smeared all over his white shirt and forearms, and he has a look of grim determination on his face. I caught the culprit, he tells us. I lift my finger to my lips to shush him. I gesture at Jed, who's still in the same pose, studying the canvas. We wait. Echo looking around as though she did nothing wrong, until finally Jed speaks. I'm going to need all of you to leave, he says in a low voice. I rub the back of my neck as panic grips me. This is not good, not good at all. Jed, please let me fix this for you. If you tell me where to get your canvases and paint from, we'll go there right now and be back before you know it, won't we, Noah? I flick my eyes to him, but he's watching Jed. We'll leave you to it, he says, and gestures for me to follow him. What? Why? I mouth. Doesn't he know we can't just leave? We need to fix this. Jed is an important artist for 496, and the last thing I want to do is leave before I've managed to smooth this disaster over. However, I'm going to manage that. Trust me. Noah mouths back. I return my gaze to Jed. He's still standing there, earnestly studying the mess. Jed? I question. Come back tomorrow he tells me, and a relieved breath whooshes out of me. But should I be relieved? Is it a good thing he wants to see us again tomorrow? We can do that, Noah replies for me. We'll come by at the same time tomorrow. Jed raises his hand and flicks it a couple of times in our general direction. Noah turns and leaves, carrying the naughty echo. Sorry once again, I tell Jed, before I reluctantly follow Noah from the room and out into the mews, leaving the disaster in our wake. Chapter 14 If anyone is happy about this situation, it's Echo. The multicoloured Echo, that is. As we make our way back down the mews, she trots along as though she's done absolutely nothing wrong. And isn't it simply wonderful to be a dog in Dalton with all the smells and sights it has to offer? No, Echo, it's not. Not when you've done what you've done. 
I cannot believe that just happened, I moan, as we turn the corner onto the street. Jed is never going to want to speak to me again, let alone sell his artwork through the gallery. What a disaster. It's not ideal, that's for sure, but you never know, Noah replies. I never know what. He might like the fact Echo wrecked his canvas and splattered paint throughout his house while in hot pursuit of his cat. Are you mad? Noah comes to a stop and faces me. He took it surprisingly well, don't you think? Noah, he cried out in utter horror and then stood there like a stunned statue staring at it. That is not taking things well. But is staring at the canvas a bad thing? How can it not be? I throw my hands in the air, accidentally tugging on Echo's lead. She looks up at me in indignation. Call me crazy, but it might be that he likes what the animals did. Okay, I'll say it. You're crazy. Didn't you see the way he was studying the canvas back there? He was working out whether to report a crime to the police, Noah. He chortles. I bet you he wasn't. I slide my eyes to his. I'll take that bet, although I hope you win. We'll see, won't we? What are we betting? The loser pays for dinner sometime, I say. A frisson of excitement passing through me at the thought of having dinner with Noah. I know, I'm playing with fire, but I have just had a terrible shock. I need something fun to look forward to if it all goes horribly pear-shaped with Jed. And dinner with Noah might be nice. More than nice. As friends only, of course. After all, we are officially getting along now. Dinner, huh? Will I get to choose the place when I win? He asks. I suppose so. My eyes drift from his face to his paint-smeared shirt. It's stuck to his torso and has begun to dry into clumps on his bare forearms. I press my lips together to stifle a smile. You're very confident for a man covered in dry paint, you know. I look good, don't I? He says with a grin and a waggle of his eyebrows. Not as good as Echo. We both take in Echo's newly minted, multicolored fur. She looks like she's wearing Joseph's coat, I say. Who's Joseph? You know, the musical. He looks at me blankly. Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat? He shrugs. I've heard of it, I guess. Never seen it. Is Joseph a dog? I laugh, the tension from the disaster at Jed's washing out of me. No, he's a man. So Echo looks like a man in a technicolor coat. Got it. I shake my head at him, but I can't help but smile, my mind turning to the time we were cloud watching, talking about Noah's childhood book. Let's go and find a way to wash this off you both. I can buy a new shirt, but we'll need to wash Echo soon before it all dries. I eye the drying patches on her fur. Too late, I think. Let's get to work on it now, then. We walk down the street and into the town, people shooting questioning and amused looks our way. We must look a sight. I stop and ask a man with a dog if there's a dog wash anywhere in the town, and he directs us to a pet shop a couple of blocks away. The shop assistant gives us a curious look as we pay for the wash. A paint mishap, I explain as she hands me the rubber apron. I can see that. Her eyes sweep appreciatively over Noah. We don't have a wash for humans, more's the pity. He offers her his dazzling Noah smile. Are you saying I can't hop in there with the dog? It might be fun. The shop assistant blushes and I shoot Noah a look. What? He mouths with a shrug. You, Noah Grant, 
are a terrible flirt. I'm just being friendly. In the dog wash area, I pat the bath and Echo hops up. Together, we lather her up and wash her down. I need to get my fingernails on the bits of paint that have dried. But in the end, she comes up her normal dog colour, shaking her fur out all over the two of us. That's two strikes today, Echo. I tell her as Noah passes me a towel and I dab at my face, careful not to smudge my mascara, before I begin to dry Echo off. How can you be mad at that face? Noah asks, as he holds Echo's face in his hands. I laugh. I can't. She's too gorgeous. She is. His eyes slide to mine, and instantly my pulse quickens. Next stop is to get me fixed up, he says. I glance down and see his paint-splattered shirt now wet, clinging to his torso. I can make out the rises and dips of his muscular body beneath, and my breath hitches in my throat, just the way I remember him. I pull my gaze away as quick as I can. Noah casts his eyes down his shirt, but I work hard at not following suit again. Dangerous territory. I think I need to go buy a new shirt. We walked past a menswear store on the way here. Shall I meet you down there in ten minutes or so? Okay. He leaves, and nine minutes later, Echo is now almost completely dry, and looking less like a Jackson Pollock painting and more like the dog she actually is. As we make our way down the street, I spot the menswear store Noah mentioned and slow my pace. He's nowhere to be seen, so we wait at the shop entrance, Echo sniffing the drain pipe and me admiring the quaint street and hoping that Noah is right about Jed, not being freaked out. I pull my phone from my handbag and send Jed an apology message, telling him once again we'd be more than happy to come back to clean up. Then I search where to purchase oversized canvases in Dalton, but come up with nothing. So I search paint supplies and find an artist's shop a few streets away. That'll be our next stop. I message Jed again. Hi, Jed. Me again. I'm going to get you some more paints, so please let me know what brand you want, and the colours, and I'll get them to you ASAP. Also, where do you get your large canvases from? I can't find a supplier. I look up to see Noah striding towards us. His hair is damp, the skin of his forearms and face scrubbed clean. His shirt, however, is still sporting the paint splatters. I found a place to wash up, he tells me. Want to come in and help me find a shirt? I cock an eyebrow at him. Do you need help to find a shirt? You are a grown man. He flashes me his grin. Suit yourself, he replies with a shrug. He waltzes past me and into the shop. I chew on my lip before I make a decision. We've got this newfound camaraderie now, mainly thanks to the whole Echo destroying Jed's canvas fiasco, but also thanks to Noah being open to leaving our past in the past. I can help the guy find a new shirt. A moment later... I've tied Echo's lead around the drain pipe, told her to stay with a stern, don't you go chasing any cats again, tone of voice, and entered the store. Noah has collected a couple of shirts from a rack and spots me. What do you think? He holds the first plain white shirt up against himself. It looks like a shirt to me, I tell him. Better than this one? He holds the next plain white shirt up. Noah, they look exactly the same. Hold that thought. He walks to the back of the shop and disappears behind the changing room curtain. I pass the time by checking out a rack of colourful shirts with bright patterns and contrasting cuffs until Noah reappears from behind the curtain in one of the shirts. I can't tell which one because, as I mentioned, they both look the same. But the shirt is the last thing on my mind right now. 
He's thrown it on and left it untucked at the waist, and he's busy doing the buttons from the bottom up, which means I catch more than just a glimpse of his muscular body. I run my eyes over him, feeling almost guilty as I do it. But oh my, does he look good. All I can say is, the teenage Noah has got nothing on this version, hot as he was back then. Toned, tanned, shapely, he's got all of that going on in spades. I want to reach out and stop him from buttoning up any further. I want to run my fingers across the contours of his muscular body. I want him to look back at me with the same heat I feel for him right now. I want... What do you think? He asks. I blink at him. Sorry, what? I ask. I said, what do you think? The shirt. Right. He wants to know what I think of the shirt. I clear my throat tossing my hair over my shoulder. It's fine, I tell him, with an air of indifference I'm not feeling at all. Because, come on, how can I feel indifferent about the guy I've never stopped loving, looking like that? I'll go try the other one, he says as he deftly unbuttons the shirt, exposing a tantalizing glimpse of his skin once more. No! I call out before I can stop myself, and the elderly shop assistant behind the counter looks up at me in surprise. Noah pulls his brows together. That bad? He questions. I scramble for a response. I'm hardly going to tell him the truth, am I? That I want to rip whatever shirt he wears right off and devour him whole. I land on an idea. It's just that I think the shirt looks so good you should leave it on. Yes, I like where I'm going with this. So why don't you button it back up, all the way up to the top, and buy it, right now? If you're sure, he says uncertainly. Completely sure, I reply with a firm nod. Doesn't the shirt suit him? I ask the salesman, who has now come out from behind the counter, probably to keep an eye on the crazy lady in his shop. Why, yes, it does, he replies. It works perfectly with your skin tone. See, it works perfectly with your skin tone, I say to Noah. Yeah, I got that. I turn to the salesman. He'll take it, I tell him, before I shoot Noah a smile. See you outside. I bolt from the store my heart bouncing in my chest. Outside, I lean up against the cool of the shop's stone wall and let out a heavy breath. Oh, no. The dog-related commotion was just a distraction, a shared problem to be solved, nothing more. And now, even when I scrunch my eyes shut, all I can see is him. Noah. The man I love. I am in deep. Chapter 15 What was I thinking? Why did I go into that shop? Didn't I know something like this could happen? As if it's not hard enough being back here, only an 18-minute drive from Marlingworth. Now I've gone and got myself all hot under the collar with newfound lust for my ex. Didn't I know that seeing something I was most certainly not meant to see could lead us from Noah and I getting along to me wanting to get it on? Stupid, stupid Tabitha. I could kick myself. So, I say brusquely when Noah joins me on the footpath, all the buttons on his new shirt safely done up. What's the plan here? It's mid-afternoon, so after I've heard from Jed about what paints he works with and where we can get a new canvas for him, I think we could reasonably drive back to London and then come back here tomorrow to meet with him again. Have you heard from him? I check my phone. Again. Not yet, but I'm hopeful I will soon. 
He leans in towards me and I hold my breath so I don't catch his scent. Far too dangerous after what I've just seen. What time is it? He asks as he looks at my phone. I swallow. It's, er, uh, 3.37. So, if we hear from him in the next couple of hours before the stores close, we can buy and deliver his items and then drive for hours and get back to London after 10 or 11 at night, then get back up at dawn to drive back tomorrow. Sounds unnecessary, unpleasant, like a waste of petrol. Great to me. Really? I don't know about you, but I'm not sure that's how I want to spend my weekend. I was thinking it'd be better for us to stay here tonight. My muscles tense. I'm not interested in a sleepover situation with Noah. Not when I've been hit squarely between the eyes with desire for him at the merest of hints of his bare chest. Okay, I am interested in it. Very interested in it but I know I shouldn't be. Your parents aren't far from here, he leads. My parents, right, so not a sleepover situation. That's good, really, it is. How about you stay there and I'll get a room in Marlingworth? That way we'll be fresh for tomorrow. And if Jed does get back in touch with you, we can pick up the supplies for him in the morning. That's... A very logical plan, I tell him. Great. That's settled then. Look, I'm sure they'd be happy for you to stay the night too. They've got a pretty big house, you know. His eyes are soft. I know. Of course he does. I'll get a room in the village. I think it's for the best. I look down at my hands. Suddenly I feel the weight of everything that hangs between us. The love we shared, my parents' disapproval of him, our breakup. You're probably right. Did you have any plans this evening? I ask, hoping to lighten the tension. Of course I'm thinking of the woman in the park. Fishing for information. Maybe he had a romantic dinner for two arranged for tonight. Maybe they had plans for a picnic in Hyde Park tomorrow, where they'll ramble along the pretty paths hand in hand and take one of those pedal boats out on the serpentine, their laughter catching on a summer's breeze. Nothing that can't be postponed. You? Oh, I had plans, but it can't be helped, can it? The sum total of my plans tonight, since I'm no longer party girl Tabitha and am instead grown-up Tabitha, was watching Netflix shows about people with more interesting lives than me. Can you change them? He asks. Can I change my Netflix plans? I suppose I'll need to. Good. He pulls his phone from his pocket and begins to tap. I do the same, making a play of tapping out a message to cancel my fictitious plans. In reality, I'm updating my London Babes WhatsApp group, responding to their incessant messaging about how it's going with Noah. Me. We'll update you all soon, promise. Zara. That sounds like something's happened to me. Kennedy. It definitely does. What's happened, Tabitha? Zara. Spill the beans. You have to tell us. Me. There's really nothing to tell, other than Echo doing her doggy best to destroy the artist's studio and us getting told to leave and come back tomorrow. Oh, and we have to stay the night, and I saw Noah with his shirt halfway off him. The responses are swift. Lottie. Echo did what? Zara. Naughty doggy. Lottie. But she's usually so good. Kennedy's the one to focus the group. Kennedy, forget the dog. You're staying the night with Noah and he's got no shirt on? I smile to myself as I tap out my reply. Me, more later. Promise. Got to go, babes. XX. That'll get them frothing at the mouth over nothing. Because nothing has happened between us. 
I slipped my phone back into my handbag, but not before changing my notifications to silent. I know my friends. They will demand details, and they won't be the least bit patient about it. Instant gratification isn't fast enough with my besties, that's for certain, especially when it comes to juicy details about trips away with ex-boyfriends with their shirts halfway off. Noah turns his own phone off. I'm sorry you'll miss your plans on my account. I wave his concern away with my hand. It's fine, really. And it was on Echo's account, though, wasn't it? Not yours. You wouldn't be here if it wasn't for me. I'm the one who wanted to meet Jed. It's fine, I repeat, with a magnanimous smile and a shrug to show him just how fine it is. My big Netflix binge fest isn't going anywhere. His face lifts in a smile that does all kinds of things to my insides. Dang it. It was pretty funny. I can't help but grin back at him. The way Echo bolted right after the cat. And the way they both left their paw prints all over the canvas. You coming back with a dog in your arms, covered in paint and Echo pretending like none of it was her fault, when all of it was her fault. His eyes flash to mine and we share a laugh. It feels nice, familiar, and yet new at the same time. Do you think his cat will ever recover? I ask. If he's anything like my cat when I was growing up, he'll totally dominate Echo next time he sees her. I glance down at Echo, happily bouncing along beside us. I'm pretty certain there shouldn't be a next time, aren't you? He lets out a laugh and shrugs. You're right about that. I remember your cat, honey, I reply as I picture Noah's black cat with the white paws. She was so cute. Cute but prickly. Cross that cat and you knew all about it. I've got the scars to prove it. He holds up his arm to show me a long, thin scar running from his wrist up to the inside crease of his elbow. I can't help but take in the sinewy muscle and taut olive skin of his forearm. I swallow and look away. Get a hold of yourself, Tabitha. How did she give you that one? I ask. I was holding her when a V8 passed by. She did not want to stick around to see the make and model. She bolted. Like a scared cat. I chortle. Remember how Honey totally ruled the roost at my house? Ellie didn't stand a chance against her, even if she was a whole lot bigger and more canine than him. She was a total pushover. Ellie, oh, she was the best. Warmth rushes through me as I think of Noah's dog. He always described her as a mutt, but I preferred the more refined, mixed breed. She was a rescue with probably half a dozen breeds mixed in. But she was the sweetest, kindest, most loving dog you could ever meet. Despite the fact she had the body of a Rottweiler and the short legs of a Dachshund. Yep, Ellie was one weird-looking dog, but it didn't matter one jot. Ellie had died of old age while Noah and I were together, and I remember how sad we'd both felt, particularly Noah, who had grown up with her as an only child. I remember sitting in his front room, cradling him in my arms, as tears ran down his cheeks, telling him how much I'd loved Ellie too, and that one day we could get our own dog, and we'd make sure she was mutt too, just like Ellie. The memory pulls me further into Noah's orbit, and as his eyes flick to mine, I feel a flash of shared emotional experience. I clear my throat. <clears throat> Whatever happened to Honey? He went to the large scratch pad in the sky about five years ago. I'm sorry. It's fine. Dad got another cat a while back. Called him Honey too. Original, huh? Well, when you're on to a good thing. Exactly. 
We ambled down the street until we reached the fenced-in dog exercise area we visited on our arrival. Let's give Echo another quick run before we go to Marlingworth, shall we? I suggest. Sure thing. I let Echo off her lead and she boats across the churned-up lawn towards a caramel-coloured spoodle and a black Labrador. Let's sit for a while. No one nods at a park bench by a creek. We take a seat and after a whole lot of sitting in silence, watching the dogs play, Noah's voice punctuates the air. Someone's loving it here. It's not like she deserves it after what she just pulled. She was only being a dog, chasing a cat. Haven't you ever watched cartoons? I smile at him. I can tell you one thing. She's going to get left at my parents' house for tomorrow's appointment. Although it's a great idea to upset as many artists I work with as possible, Echo was an added bonus today. His eyes sparkle as he lets out a low laugh. <laughs> That's such a great approach to doing business. Oh, I think so. Jed's canvas and floor were clearly in need of dog and cat paw prints in bright coloured paint. I might try the same at my flat. See? No wonder you're a super successful London gallery owner these days. It's my turn to let out a laugh, his compliment making me feel giddy. I'm hardly super successful. The gallery does well enough, I suppose. I give a self-deprecating shrug. Truth be told, 496 has been doing well in the last few months. Really well. It shows me what I could have been doing with it all this time, rather than concentrating on my social life. Sure, it's been slow, and without Daddy sending in his friends to buy artwork and giving it regular cash injections himself over the years, it would never have managed to get off the ground at all. But I do the books, and I know for a fact we've been making a decent profit recently. It's something I'm proud of, and something I didn't know I could achieve until I left my parting ways behind. Successful and modest, I see. Noah replies. You do get new talent. You've exhibited work by Jed, obviously, but also Jolene Ibrahim and Ubeki Adebisi, all in the last few months. That's impressive. You've done your research. But then I suppose you are representing a big client, so it makes sense you'd do that. He expects me to know what I'm doing, so I make sure I do. Shall we get going? Sure. I call Echo and we make our way back to the car. As Noah begins the drive to Marlingworth, I decide to hazard a question. He's not exactly opened up to me about what he's done with his life since we were together, and I'm curious to know. Perhaps now that we've established a kind of new friendship today, getting along, remember, he might share something with me. How did you get into buying artwork for big clients? Last thing I knew, you were training as a mechanic, working at your dad's garage and aiming to take it over someday. He smiles to himself as he looks out into the distance. That was a lifetime ago. So? I prompt, hoping to get something more than, well, nothing from him. So, a lot has changed since I was a teenager. It happens. Still a big fat nothing. What is with that? Have you told your parents you're on your way? No, I'll do it now. I tap out a message to Daddy, telling him I will be stopping by for the night. His reply is swift. Daddy. Why? Are you in some sort of trouble? I twist my mouth. That's Daddy, always expecting the worst. But, to be fair to the man, I sometimes delivered the worst. More than sometimes. Me. Everything's fine, I'm in the area and I need a place to sleep for the night, that's all. The dots appear on my phone, telling me he's replying, and then they disappear. A moment later, they start up again and a message appears. Daddy. Fine. I slip my phone back into my purse. All set? Noah asks. Yes, 
Thank you. They're ecstatic about seeing me. I pull my lips into a smile as I glance at him. He flicks his attention to me. That's good. No one knows what my family is like. Echo can meet Chester and Bentley, my parents' greyhounds. I'm sure they'll get on wonderfully. As long as there are no cats or paint pots. Exactly. I lock my jaw and stare straight ahead as the road narrows, and the buildings of Dalton give way to the rolling green meadows of the countryside. Noah won't open up to me, and in driving to Marlingworth, we're bowling straight into my old life, a life I once shared with him. It's hard not to feel a wave of trepidation at what's to come. Chapter 16 As Noah pulls the car into the village we both once called home, I look around the familiar streets, the rows of buildings with their mixture of the wonky Tudor architecture, the red brick buildings, and the more modern with large shop windows, their strings of bunting reaching from one side of the high street to the other, celebrating summer as they do each year, and baskets are hanging from awnings, filled with bright, multicoloured flowers. Really, if I'd thought Dalton was ridiculously romantic and picturesque, with its position on the river and its beautifully preserved suspension bridge, Marlingworth on the river is next level. And here I am with my ex, with oodles of shared experiences in this very place. I've only just had a tantalising peek at his bare chest, and he's looking all hot and manly and attractive in the seat next to me. And let's not forget he's the ex who doesn't seem to want to talk about how he went from being a trainee mechanic to an art dealer to the super rich. Which is just great. Really great. Because we all know an air of mystery doesn't make anyone more appealing, ever. Am I in a pickle? I'm swimming in the whole freaking jar of the preserves. All right if I stop in at the pub? Noah asks as we drive up the high street. I can take you over to the big house afterwards. The big house is how the locals have always referred to my family's home. It's not a joke. It is a pretty dang big house. It dates from the time lords ruled the fiefdom with their serfs doing their bidding. My family has the dubious honour of having ruled this little part of the English countryside for centuries. That's perfectly fine, thanks. Which pub? The Star, King William, the Noble Pigeon, the King's Arms, the Swan or the Red Lion? I ask as I ramble off the list of the village's pubs. That's the thing with English villages. They've always got a plethora of pubs, almost as many pubs as the inhabitants. I was thinking the noble pigeon, he replies, as he backs the car skillfully into the parallel park, mainly because it's the only pub that has rooms to rent above it for the night. Of course he was thinking the noble pigeon, the chocolate box pub overlooking the river with the outdoor picnic tables. And when I say it's a chocolate box, I don't just mean it's charming and evocative of another time. A photo of it was literally used on a box of a famous brand of chocolates for something like four decades. It's that lovely. It also happens to be the pub where Noah and I had our first ever date. Well, where it started anyway. It ended with us kissing under the old oak tree on the other side of the river. But I'm not going to ramble down that particular memory lane. I've already flirted with being Icarus today, and I have no interest in having my wings melted by the sun and plummeting to the earth. I'll be quick, he says, as he turns to get out of the car. I make a snap decision. I'll come too. I tell him. Wait, what? Why am I doing this exactly? You will? Why not? I can say hello to the Mayhews. Before I delve into my reasons why, 
I climb out of the car and clip Echo's lead on her collar. She leaps out onto the pavement with happy abandon. When were you last back here? I ask him, as we make our way down the street towards the pub. Let me think. It's been a while. Dad moved away about three years ago, I think. Yeah, that's when I must have been here last. Was it weird? I mean, you'd been away for a long time, hadn't you? I know I'm fishing, but after we broke up, Noah just disappeared. One of the many reasons why him turning up out of the blue was such a shock. He'd been this important presence in my life for that whole summer, and then after we broke up and I moved away to start university up in Scotland, he was gone. A few years later, I tried to find him. You see, the thing is, looking back, I realised I'd made a mistake. I'd given in to the pressure to break up with him. Pressure from my friends and family, all of whom told me I needed to be with someone more suitable. Someone like Magnus Gainsborough. So, I'd moved on to him. But there was one thing Magnus never was. He wasn't Noah. Rather obvious, I know, but sometimes it's hard to appreciate what's right in front of you. When I was about 21, I'd done what any self-respecting millennial would do and scoured social media for any signs of Noah. But he'd just disappeared into thin air, almost like he'd been a figment of my imagination. Until now. The sign's new, he points out as we reach the entrance to the pub. I look up at the wooden sign, suspended above us. It's a painted image of a pigeon in a top hat with its bill held high, accompanied by the words, The Noble Pigeon, in gold lettering. As we step over the worn stone threshold that's hundreds of years old and into the relative dark inside, I'm struck by the aroma of freshly baked pies, deep-fried chips, and steak. My tummy responds with a growl as I remember how good the food is here, and I'm glad the music and chatter of the pub patrons drowns the sound out. Noah places his hand lightly on my shoulder. I'll go check for a room. Want a drink? We could sit outside. Shame to waste a beautiful evening. Is it evening already? I question. That'll explain why my belly let its whereabouts be known. Yeah, it's five or so. Are you hungry? Do you want a quick bite here before I take you to your parents' house? Are you cashing in on the bet without having even won it? I tease. Time will tell on that front. But no, just a casual bite. One of their pies would be amazing. Right on cue, a waitress walks by, skillfully balancing a collection of meals, and the aroma of a slice of steak and kidney pie wafts towards us. Another tummy growl. I watch with longing as she places the plates on a table beside me. Noah chuckles. I'll get us some menus. What can it hurt? So we eat a meal together at a place we used to go to. He'll be just as withholding of new information on his life as he's been, and I'll wrangle with my feelings about the guy, reminding myself at every pace that he's no longer mine. Really, it'll be business as usual for us. Why don't you go see if you can get a table outside? What will you have to drink? A lemonade, please, I tell him. Got it. Be right back. He makes his way to the bar. I look around the pub. Although the sign has been updated... That's where the redecoration has stopped. The carpet has the same red, orange and brown swirly pattern, the walls still covered with classic flocked wallpaper and black and white photos of Marlingworth in the old days, and a photo of the Queen still hangs behind the bar, taken circa 1992. Come on, Echo, I say as I pull the dog through the pub. She tries to stop and sniff everyone's meals as we go, which her surrogate owner is doing too, but we manage to make it to the garden overlooking the river without nabbing anything from anyone's plate. 
There's a bowl of water by the step, and I pause for Echo to lap some up. I'd better get you your dinner too, girl, I say to her as she finishes up. Lucky for us, there are a couple of free tables, and I choose the one furthest from the door and settle in. The sun is still bathing the area in its warm summer glow, and I gaze out at the view to the bridge and out across the river to the old oak, field, and the row of houses snaking into the distance. Although I come back sometimes to visit my family, I don't come into the village often. It's odd to be in the place I shared so many memories with Noah. I need to keep my head straight, that's for sure. One lemonade. Noah places a glass in front of me before he swings one of his long legs over the seat opposite and sits down. Thanks. I got some dinner menus too. He offers me a laminated menu. Did you get yourself a room for the night? My eyes immediately drop to the pie section on the menu, and I spot what my tummy has been asking for from the moment my nostrils breathed in its aroma. Steak and kidney pie with mashed potato and peas. A noble pigeon specialty. I did. Right up there. He points at a row of old-fashioned lead-light windows above the pub. Well, that was easy. It's all worked out. Oh, and I got Echo the dog food menu. He passes me another laminated sheet. I cock an eyebrow. They've got a dog food menu. Awesome, right? She can have her choice of steak at the top end, right down to the unspecified meat at the other end of the scale. At the risk of making her a pampered pooch, I'm thinking not the meat option. I can't imagine any dog of yours would be pampered. He deadpans. Not my dog, remember? I reply, my tone equally dry. Ah, but if she was, it'd be fillets and caviar all day long, right? The edges of his mouth are curved upwards, and there's a definite glint in his eye. Maybe, I reply because the truth is that if I did have a dog of my own, I would undoubtedly pamper the life out of it. A total royal canine with nothing but the best. What are you going to eat? Steak and kidney pie for me. I peruse the dog dinner menu, and I still can't quite believe the pub has even got a menu specifically for dogs, despite the fact the Brits are potty over their canines, and land on a middle-of-the-price bracket choice. A lamb with gravy for Echo. Not the filet? I shake my head as I hold his gaze. Nope. What do you have? I'm thinking I'll be totally unoriginal and have what you're having. I rise to my feet and immediately Echo does the same, watching me with expectation. Sit, I tell her. I'll get our meals. You haven't lost the bet yet, you know. Regardless, I owe you for Echo's rambunctiousness. Rambunctiousness? He questions, a fresh smile teasing his lips. Now there's a word you don't hear every day. He rows it around his mouth. Rambunctiousness. I like it. I look forward to hearing it in a sentence when I get back. In one deft move, I step over the picnic table seat and make my way inside the pub. I don't recognize the server behind the bar, a girl with a nose ring and cropped bright orange hair. I place my order for our meals and pay. As I turn to leave, I notice a painting on the far wall, over by the fireplace. It's an abstract, but from this distance, it looks like it could be a house-lined street. Could it be? No, not here. I move to get close enough to inspect it and see the familiar name inscribed in the bottom right-hand corner. Frisk sits. I blink a few times in disbelief. The noble pigeon publicans have an original frisk sits. What is this? The Twilight Zone? 
An alternate universe in which sought-after works of contemporary art are displayed next to faded photos of the Queen, taken in 1992. Tabitha Green, as I live and breathe, a voice says, and I turn to find Mr. Mayhew, the portly noble pigeon publican whose rosy nose has always reminded me of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and whose laugh puts the boom in booming. Hello, Mr. Mayhew, I say with a warm smile. How are you? I'm well, love. We haven't seen you here for what? Many years. No, I've been in London for a long time now. You need to come and visit us, young lady. We like to see your smiling face here at the pigeon. I beam at him. I'll be sure to drop by next time I'm here, which is next weekend, actually. It's my 30th birthday. His eyes twinkle as he replies, 30? You? You're just 17, aren't you? I smile at him. You're such a smooth talker, Mr. Mayhew. I was just looking at your frisk sits here. Is it an original? My what? I gesture at the wall. The painting. Is it an original because it looks like one? Oh, yes, of course it is, love. I turn back to regard it once more. How did they end up with an original frisk sits? No offence to Mr Mayhew and his wife, but they're hardly what I'd call art connoisseurs. Unless it comes to pictures of the Queen, of course, in which case they're right up there with the early 90s. How long have you had it? I ask him. Oh, a wee while, love, but forget the painting. Mr Mayhew waves his hand in the air. What are you doing here? I've come in for some of your delicious steak and kidney pie. A jolly good choice, and I rather expect you like your usual too. My usual wasn't anything special. It was mainly just a bottle of white wine, whatever was the cheapest. Actually, I'm on the lemonade tonight. I tell him. His thick grey brows climb his forehead as his eyes widen. Are you now? Well, that's a turn up for the books. I lift my chin, proud of my commitment to being a better version of myself. I may have decided to leave my parting ways behind, but I'm still Tabitha Green and proud of who I am too. It is Mr Mayhew. He turns and booms. Maisie! You'll never guess who it is. All right, love, keep your hair on, comes a voice from behind him. I glance at his thick crop of hair, a.k.a. his toupee. I remember it flapping in the wind one especially windy day when I was out on the town with some university friends. But despite the fact it's very obviously not his actual hair, You've got to admire his perseverance with it. Mr Mayhew's equally portly but toupee-free wife, Maisie Mayhew, appears at his side. Dressed in the white smock she's always worn that makes her look more like a lab technician than a publican, she places a hand over her heart and declares, Oh, my good days! It's Tabitha Green! Hello, Mrs Mayhew! She moves from side to side as she walks, opens a leaf of the bar and collects me in a gigantic warm hug. She's only about five feet tall, so I have to duck down. She smells of pie and chips and a rather overpowering perfume which has been her signature scent since I've known her. Something from Boots the Chemist, she once told me. Nothing fancy. Let's get a good look at you then, dearie. She says to me as she holds my arms out. Well, you're still a skinny rake, but you look well enough. Quite the young lady in your lovely black shirt dress. That is a shirt dress, isn't it? Like Kate Middleton wore at the thingy? I admit I know exactly what she's talking about. It was an image in Hello magazine recently. You know me, Mrs Mayhew, I do love Kate. Oh, we all do, dearie. She's our style icon. Still holding my hands out, she adds. 
Doesn't Tabitha look like Kate Middleton, Basil? She's always been a good-looking girl, Mr Mayhew confirms. Who, Kate Middleton or our Tabitha? She questions. Both, he replies, and I find my cheeks warming at the compliment. I've known the Mayhews my entire life, and they've always been lovely to me. My parents weren't exactly regulars at any of the local pubs. Their style is more gin and tonics within their social set than a pint and pie at the local. But I used to come here with my friends' families before I left to go to boarding school. And then, as a teenager, I'd come with Prue or Zara or whatever friend I had home for the holidays, and we'd try to con university boys into buying us drinks. Looking back, we succeeded a little too often. And then, of course, when Noah and I were together, we came here for glasses of coke and bowls of chips, and Mrs Mayhew always used to say what a delightful couple we made, and I, for one, would blush and smile and secretly agree. Back then, I thought Noah and I would be together forever. That's very nice of you to say, I reply bashfully like I'm 13 again. She came in with Noah Grant by the looks of things. Mr Mayhew tells his wife and her eyes widen. Did you really? She asks. I tell you it was like we'd all step back in time, seeing the two of you walk in here together. Mr Mayhew says. Oh, well, it's not. We're not. It's today. I reply so very smoothly. What I mean is, we're not together. No and me. Not. I shake my head to make my point. In fact, I only just saw him at a wedding a week ago for the first time in almost twelve years. Mrs Mayhew's brows ping up to meet her curled hair as her husband leans his elbows on the bar and studies me. Did you now? I did, I confirm with a nod. What do you think of that then, Maisie? Mr Mayhew asks, as he too makes his way around the bar and comes to a stop beside me. Mrs Mayhew narrows her gaze at me. I think it's very interesting, me. Very interesting, Basil. Hmm, yes it is. He confirms as he sizes me up. For the love of all money. I have no clue what's going on right now. And so how did you end up coming to Marlingworth together then? It seems very odd, considering you only just met him again after, what did you say? Twenty years? Mrs Mayhew asks. Not twenty years, it was twelve. Almost twelve. I correct. I'm beginning to feel like I'm being interrogated here. At a wedding, you said, Mrs Mayhew asks, as though it's a vital piece of information right now. I look between the two of them. That's right, at a wedding. Not your wedding, was it? Mr Mayhew questions. Of course it wasn't, Basil. We'd know all about that and she'd be wearing a ring if it was. Mrs Mayhew grasps my left hand and holds it up. I don't see a ring. Not my wedding, I confirm. Well, that's good then, Mr Mayhew says with a satisfied smirk. What's good? That I'm unmarried? I question. They ignore my question. You still haven't told us what you're doing back here, has she, Basil? No, Maisie, she has not. They both watch me in expectation. I know I need to tell them. Noah and I are here to see an artist in Dalton about some of his paintings. Noah's an art dealer now, and he came to see me at my gallery in London. We're working together. He's more than Justin, Mr Mayhew begins, only to come to an abrupt stop when he gets firmly elbowed in the ribs by his wife. Oh, he exclaims. What was that for? My thoughts exactly. You opening your big mouth, that's what, she replies, her tone stern. I wasn't opening my big mouth, 
and for your information, I don't have a big mouth. It's perfectly proportioned for my face. Oh, you and your proportions. No one cares about your proportions, Mrs. Mayhew grumps. It is. Look at it. Mr. Mayhew circles his hand furiously around his mouth. I look between the two of them, not in the least bit clear what they're bickering about, but remembering this is exactly how a conversation with these two inevitably goes. I'll, er, uh, go then, I say, but they're paying no attention to me. I give a perplexed look once more at the Frisksits painting as I slink away. Chapter 17 I reach Noah and Echo, who greets me with a thump of her tail on the grass and a wet nose against my hand. Echo, that is, not Noah. He's looking content as he gazes out at the view of the river and the field beyond. That took a while. Is it busy in there or something? Realization dawns on his face. Don't tell me. You got cornered by the Mayhew interrogation squad. They had some questions. I bet they did. Hey, did you notice that painting when we came in? He leans his elbows on the table. Painting? On the back wall. It's by Frisksits. It looks a little like a row of houses. Ah, the hermit artist. He takes a sip of his pint. That hits the spot. I don't get why they've got one of his paintings here. He doesn't give interviews or anything. No one knows who he is. I bet his or her mom does. He flashes me a grin. And the Mayhews might too, I might ask them. What's the point? If he or she wants to be anonymous, then I'm sure no one will know who they are. Probably just a marketing ploy anyway. What is it with these crazy artist types? They're not all like that. Most are normal people who happen to have talent. So how come you get the temperamental Jed and some person with a weird name who wants to remain anonymous? Oh, believe me, I'd love to get Frisksits, but he's impossible to reach. Have you checked social media? I give him a look that asks whether he's serious because, really? I wish I'd thought of that. It was just a suggestion. I push out a breath. One day I'm going to get an exclusive exhibition with him. That's my goal. Noah stares at me for a beat before he pulls his gaze to refocus on the view. Good luck tracking down the invisible Frisksits. He takes another sip of his beer, and I drink down about half my lemonade. Being around Noah is thirsty work, it would seem. Hey, remember when we came here and ate sandwiches? I think we sat at that table over there. He gestures at a table currently occupied by a family of three small children, who seem to have spilled more of their food on the table than they've eaten. I pull my eyes away. It was our first date. How could I forget? That was a long time ago, I reply stiffly. What is he playing at? He's clammed up when I've asked him about details of his life since we broke up. And now he wants to reminisce about our first date? And they say Frisksits is a mystery. You wore a dress with little pink flowers on it and those strap things. He indicates his shoulders. I press my lips together. I know exactly which dress he's referring to. It was my favorite. Navy blue with little pink daisies. It was cut straight across the bust with a full skirt that stopped a lot shorter than I would wear at my age. They're called spaghetti straps. Spaghetti straps, of course, he replies, as though all guys know what spaghetti straps are. Actually, full disclosure, I didn't know what they were called. I just like the dress. He flashes his grin at me, and I soften. Maybe it's fine to reminisce with him? Maybe today can be healing for both of us, and we can leave one another at the end of the trip. Better, 
for having found closure. In for a penny, in for a pound, as they say. I lean into it. They were ham, cheese and tomato sandwiches. His lips lift into a smile, his eyes bright. So you remember? Of course I do. They were nice sandwiches. I even cut the crusts off because I thought girls preferred crustless bread. I don't know where I got that idea. Some magazine, I think. I don't remember the crust situation. Are you telling me I went to this huge effort and you didn't even notice? You sure know how to wound a guy. I cock an eyebrow at him. It was a huge effort to cut the crusts off some bread? He laughs. That was a fun day. Not when we got kicked out by Mrs. Mayhew for not being paying customers. What could I do? I was on a budget. And anyway, I thought you'd like my homemade sandwiches. I sure didn't hear you complaining about them at the time. His gaze flashes to mine, and I'm certain I detect heat in his eyes. You're right. Your sandwiches were great. I knew you liked them. Are we still talking about sandwiches? Two steak and kidney and a lamb for the dog, a bored voice says behind me, and I turn to see the barmaid with the orange spiky hair and nose ring from earlier. That's us, I tell her, and she places all three meals on the table with as much finesse as a boxer doing a pirouette and leaves without uttering another word. She's in the right job, I comment. Surly service is a British specialty, isn't it? Maybe in London. Here it's not. Do you think she thought Echo would join us sitting at the table and that's why she put it here and not on the ground? She's a cool dog, but I'm not sure what her table manners will be like. Does she even have opposable thumbs? Because that could be a problem. I hold Echo's meal up. She watches me closely her long pink tongue swiping across her face as she realises that the food in my hand is for her. I instruct her to sit and place the dog bowl in front of her at her feet. She glances briefly down at the bowl before she returns her laser attention back to me. OK, I tell her, and she springs to her feet and begins to wolf the food down. Someone's happy, but then she is a dog. I bet she's happy all of the time. Especially when chasing cats through paint, I say, as I unravel the paper napkin from my knife and fork. This looks good. It is. Noah replies, his mouth full of pie. We sit and eat our tasty meals, Echo finished by the time Noah and I have barely taken a bite, and the talk turns away from reminiscing about our first date to a much less emotionally charged conversation about Jed's work. You mentioned the work your client is most interested in is anything from his optics series. That's right. I understand he's been working on some more pieces, but he's open to whatever he's currently working on. It's common knowledge, Jed told one of the country's leading art publications that he hadn't finished the series, and would be producing a new group of works to complement the hugely popular ones already completed. How many do you think your client wants? Several. Perhaps five or six? The whole series, if possible. There's a loud noise like the muffled sounds of a megaphone coming from across the river. What the? Noah asks, as Echo sits up from where she's been lying and emits a low warning growl. It's okay, girl. I tell her, with a pat to her side. What's going on? I ask Noah. Look across the river. I look to see a group of people holding up homemade signs as someone makes what sounds like demands over a megaphone. Seems like a protest to me. What are they protesting about? How beautiful this place is? I ask with a laugh because really this place is nothing short of idyllic. We sit and listen as the man continues to bark into his megaphone, pausing for cheers and chants from the assembled protesters. There have got to be at least 20 people, perhaps 25, all of them quite obviously riled up. I'm not 100% sure, 
but it sounds like they're unhappy that someone's planning to build on that side of the river. Noah says, That's what I heard. I regard the familiar field and large oak tree where the people are assembled. I thought there was some covenant that stipulated no building on that field. Wasn't it the site of some famous thing that happened in history? Noah's eyes soften as they land on mine. For some, yeah. My heart rate rises. Is he thinking of our own personal history? Him and me? Because a lot happened under that tree. Our first date. Our first kiss. The first time we said we loved one another. I open my mouth to respond, not quite sure what to say. I remember everything. It all meant so much to me. It all still does. In the end, Noah saves me having to utter a word. I just hope they're not going to chop it down. They wouldn't do that. Would they? I ask, aghast, the thought hitting me hard. I flick my gaze to the old oak tree immediately above the riverbank. It's tall and majestic. Wanna go check it out? See what this thing is all about? Noah asks. We've both finished our drinks and meals, and I know Echo would leap at the chance to go for another walk. So we leave the garden, wave at the Mayhews behind the bar, who throw knowing smiles our way, and what they think they know is not what's really going on here at all, and meander across the bridge to the other side of the river. As we near the protesters, I'm plunged into a thick quagmire of memories of me and Noah, and then, out of the blue, as if my own brain isn't playing enough of a trick on me, Noah places his hand on my arm as we reach the other side of the river. I look up at him in surprise. Is it just me, or is it super weird to be here together? You and me. Noah says, his voice low, intimate. It sets my heart racing. I bite down on my lip. It's not just you. It's just... He breaks off as he turns away from me. What is it? I ask, a tremor in my voice. Does he feel it too? Does being here bring back all those feelings we had for one another? I swallow, my throat suddenly hot. His jaw twitches as he returns his gaze to mine, and my belly fills with butterflies at the look in his eyes. We've really got a lot of history here. Yeah, we do. I place my hand over his. I'm glad we're here together. His lips curve into the smile I know so well, the smile that sets my soul on fire, the smile that I've always loved. Yeah, I am too. Chapter 18 A loud screech cuts through our movement like a knife through butter, and we immediately pull our attention from one another. What the... Sorry about that, folks. A tall, skinny man in a short-sleeved button-up shirt and pair of tan trousers says. He has a firm grip on a megaphone, the source of the loud screech. It's all right, Nigel, a middle-aged woman wearing a T-shirt with a black stop sign calls out encouragingly. Pick it up where you left off. All right, Dot, he replies. Holding the megaphone in place, he barks. We will not bow down to your idea of progress, which isn't actually progress, and is in fact nothing but a vehicle to increase your wealth and destroy our village. There are cheers from a few members of the crowd, one of whom is a young woman who's gazing at Nigel, megaphone man, as though he were a rock god performing on stage. She's leaning on a placard with the words, no new housing or else, in bold red paint. Or else what, I wonder? We will not allow you to steal away this essential part of natural habitat for our important bird life. Swans, geese and ducks. 
Nigel continues. Don't forget the cormorants and the coots, Nigel. Dot, the woman who encouraged him before, says. How could he forget the cormorants and the coots? Noah says to me under his breath. What are the cormorants and the coots? I whisper back. No idea. You're quite right, Dot. Nigel concedes. My apologies. I'll start again, shall I? You're the strong leader here. You do what you think is best, Dot tells him. Only make sure to include the comorants and the coots. Right-ho, Nigel replies brightly before he repeats. We will not allow you to steal away this essential part of natural habitat for our important bird life. Swans, geese, ducks, and the cormorants, and the coots. And the dippers, Nigel, another middle-aged woman adds helpfully. This one's wearing the same t-shirt as Dot. Oh, and the occasional kingfisher, although they are awfully rare. But well worth seeing when you do, Dot says, and the other woman agrees. Nigel lowers his megaphone. How about I just say bird life instead of listing them all? It might be more efficient. Well, you could do, Nigel, but didn't we all agree back at Paula's house that it's more powerful if you list them? The second middle-aged woman points out. Yes, Caro, we did. We agreed that, Dot says, and both women turn their attention back to Nigel. All right, I'll start again, shall I? Nigel asks in a resigned tone. Dot offers him a stern glare as Caro crosses her arms. I think you should, Nigel, although you are the leader, so of course it's up to you. Poor Nigel. I whisper to Noah. Nigel lifts his megaphone and is about to start to list off the birds again, and for his sake I hope he remembers all of them, right down to the elusive kingfisher, when he notices Noah, Echo and me, standing a few feet from the crowd. Oh, hello there, he says into his megaphone before he realises he doesn't actually need the megaphone to speak to us. He lowers it to his side and walks over. We haven't seen you here before. Have you come to join us? What a lovely doggy. He gives Echo a pat. We were sitting across the river at the pub when we heard you. So we came to find out what you're protesting about. Noah replies as he extends his hand and he and Nigel shake. I'm Noah Grant and this is Tabitha Green. Hello, I say with a wave of my hand. Ah, a green in our midst, eh? Are you from the big house? He asks. I am, I reply, feeling self-conscious. My family has always been revered in the village by simple fact of our history here. Not because any of us have done anything particularly special. It's always made me feel out of place, like I don't quite belong among the villagers, even though I grew up here. Well, it's jolly nice to meet you both here, and we're always happy to meet like-minded folk, particularly if you're related to the local royalty. Eh, Tabitha? Sure, yes, I mutter. My family is no more royalty than the elusive kingfisher. Several of the protesters join us, including Dot and Caro, the pedantic bird fans from earlier. I know you, Dot says to Noah. I used to live here. I'm Noah Grant, and this is Tabitha Green. Noah replies. She's from the big house, Nigel informs them. Dot gives me an appraising look. Are you now? Well, I live in London these days, I clarify. But you're a Green, and that's what matters, Nigel says. Is it, though? You're the other daughter, aren't you? Dot says. My sister, Fenella, must be the daughter, then. I shrug. I suppose I am. Is someone trying to build on this land? I ask, to deflect attention from my family. They are indeed, Dot pronounces. Tell them, Nigel. 
She leans in towards him and stage whispers. Remember the exact words we agreed on earlier at Paula's. Nigel clears his throat and puffs out his chest. We are all part of the Save Our Field and Tree, and we're here to stop a travesty from taking place. A travesty, Dot and Caro repeat for emphasis. We are S-O-F-T, and we care, Nigel adds. Your acronym is S-O-F-T? Soft? I ask. As far as acronyms go, it's not the best, particularly for a megaphone-wielding group of rowdy protesters. Well, yes, Nigel replies, and Noah and I share a look. OK. We have learned that a nameless company is trying to steal this very land from beneath our feet and build a gated community of mansions, Nigel continues. We are here to stop... Uh, excuse me, Nigel? A short, round man with a thick pair of glasses and bushy moustache says, his hand raised as though he's in a schoolroom. The company has a name, actually. It does. The man nods. It's called Wilson Construction, I'm told. Are you certain? Oh, yes, I work at the council, see? I get to know these things. Right, OK. Nigel looks back at us. This just in. The company that's stealing this land is called Wilson Construction. Oh, and another thing, the short man continues. Nigel can barely bring himself to look at him. What is it now, Donald? They're not trying to steal the land. They've bought it already. The whole lot. Have they? Nigel looks at Dot for confirmation. She gives a regretful nod. Well, that rather changes things, doesn't it? Not one jot, Dot replies firmly. They can be called whatever they bloomin' well like and buy as much of this land as they like too, but they can't build here. Why not? Nigel asks. Because it's wrong, Dot states with force. She turns her attention to Noah and me and says, See that beautiful old tree? She points at the old oak. It was planted by one Barnabas Babington some 184 years ago, according to some records. That's a jolly long time for a tree to be standing in a field, Caro says, and the others nod. It is, Caro. That's why we need to protect this area from developers, what would life be like without such lovely trees? It would barely be worth living, in my estimation. Barely at all, particularly for all the birds. Dot lifts her chin, her lips tight. I hope she's not going to list them all off. Well said, Dot, Caro declares, and the protesters, who have all now grouped around Dot, burst into spontaneous applause. Nigel pushes the megaphone into her hands. Here, Dot, I know when I'm beat and I'm sorry to say I'm not up to the task. I think you should be the leader. But we voted you in, Dot replies blankly. We all did, over tea and crumpets at Paula's this afternoon, remember? You're better at this than me, and besides, I'm due back at the funeral home for a service tonight at eight o'clock. Nigel turns to Noah and me. I'm a funeral director. Good to know, Noah replies. Dot takes the megaphone from Nigel and stares at it before she says, Nigel, I accept the challenge. I will be the new leader of Soft, and I will do it with great pride and enthusiasm, fighting this thing with all my might. The protesters cheer and immediately begin to congratulate Dot on her promotion, but I'm too busy being alarmed about the potential loss of the tree. I raise my hands in the air to get everyone's attention. Hold on a sec, everyone, I say, but they're too busy talking. Excuse me! Still nothing. I feel Noah's hand on my arm. I got this, he tells me. He raises his fingers to his lips and lets out a loud whistle. It does the trick, silencing the crowd as they all turn to gawk at us. Did one of you have something to say? Dot asks. 
Look at Dot. She's been a leader already, Caro says with pride, and Nigel studies his shoes. I need to ask my question before the conversation takes another turn. These developers, I begin. Wilson Construction, Donald tells me. Yes, Wilson Construction. Are they going to chop the tree down? I gesture at the old oak. It's a beautiful tree with a thick, twisted trunk and branches low enough to climb on as a child. Well, yes, Dot replies as though I've missed the entire point of their protest. It's the tree we're primarily concerned about. It was planted by Barnabas Babington in... I cut her off with, yes, so you said. When do they plan on chopping it down? On the 23rd of this month, Donald tells me, his face grim. That's less than two weeks away. But, but they can't, I declare, suddenly desperate that they don't chop down the tree. Losing it is simply unthinkable. That's the spirit, Dot says. They can't and they won't. She picks up her megaphone and repeats the words. They can't and they won't. They can't and they won't. The crowd of protesters join in and they begin to march in a circle, brandishing the placards that had been at their feet only moments ago. I turn to Noah, concern for the tree mounting into desperation. They can't chop down the tree. They can't. They probably will, you know. It's a big tree and you heard what they said. The developers already bought the land. It's a done deal. But, but it's wrong. I get it. It's a nice tree and we shared things there. A nice tree? I splutter, barely believing how glib he's being about something that holds so much meaning for the two of us. It's beautiful and it's old and it's been there for us as long as I can remember. It's so much more than nice. The threat of losing the tree has shocked me into being bold. And that's one thing I've not been around Noah. The one thing I used to be, that I've lost. I take a hold of his forearm and say with urgency, Noah, don't you get it? We need to save this tree. He lifts his gaze to mine once more, and I'm certain I see a depth of understanding lying there. He knows this is more than just a tree. It's important to both of us. I guess we should do something about it then, Tabitha. I beam at him and he smiles back at me. Like what? I'll get the chains, you secure the spot. I beg your pardon. We're going to chain ourselves to the tree, right? Old school protest style? Realization dawns. You're teasing me. His lips lift into a smile. Maybe a little, but I get it. I want to save the tree too. Let's go help this well-meaning but extremely loud and somewhat disorganized group of protesters achieve their goal. I laugh, excited that he wants to preserve our memories. You make it sound so easy. It is easy, but not with chains. He smiles, not with chains. His eyes locked on mine, the atmosphere changes, and suddenly it's like it's just the two of us. No echo at my feet, no noisy protesters, just him and me. Tabitha, he says, his voice low, my name infused with a depth of emotion that I've not heard from him since, well, for a long, long time. Yes? My voice breathless. Could he? Does he? He swallows and I can almost reach out and touch the swirl of emotions racing around us. I wanted to say something, and being here, it feels like now might be the right. You who? A jarring voice tries to puncture our bubble of two, just as the screeching megaphone did before. I'm not going to let it. No way. Noah was going to say something, something important something that I hope could even change things between us. Perhaps even something I've waited 12 long years to hear. Noah, Tabitha! 
The voice shrills. Noah takes a quick step back from me, as though I'm on fire, and immediately turns his attention to the owner of the voice. Mrs. Mayhew, trailed by her husband. I blink at her. Now? Is she freaking kidding me? Any other time would do. Any other time. Seriously. Don't get me wrong. I love Mr. and Mrs. Mayhew. They're the friendliest publicans I've ever known, always there with a ready, welcoming smile, happy for a chat and to serve you a selection of their delicious meals. But something was about to happen between Noah and me. I was absolutely sure of it. Something we'd been building to since I laid eyes on him at the wedding, one short week ago. With less than zero enthusiasm for this interruption, I drag my attention from Noah's face to see Mrs. Mayhew bustling towards us, her white bobbed hair bouncing up and down with each step, a huge grin plastered across her face. At least someone's happy. She comes to a stop beside us, her hands clasped at her chest, her face aglow. Would you look at you too? she says, her voice breathless from the exertion. What do you mean? I ask with a false smile that belies the frustration I'm feeling within. We were just talking. Isn't that right, Noah? I look cautiously at him. Talking, that's right, he confirms. Mrs. Mayhew isn't listening. I looked at you two from across the river just now, right by this here tree, and I thought to myself, I thought, Maisie... It's like those two have stepped right back in time, back when the two of you were young. Not that you're not young now, of course, because you are still full of the vigour of youth. Just, you're not as young as you've been in the past. She pauses, as she adds philosophically. But then, I suppose none of us are really, are we? Mrs Mayhew looks with bright expectation from Noah to me and back again. Her question is quite clearly not rhetorical. She's expecting a response. Noah clears his throat, taking one for the team. Uh, no, Mrs. Mayhew, I suppose none of us are as young as we once were, he mutters. I shoot him a grateful look, and he raises his brows at me as he pulls his lips into a line. He's feeling as awkward about all this as I am. Mr. Mayhew arrives panting heavily, his face pink. You're like the hare in that race with the tortoise, you know. Maisie, my love. What are you talking about, Baz? She snaps. He holds up his finger while he catches his breath before he says, You know, the story about the hare racing off at breakneck speed. He leaves the poor tortoise behind, but he wins the race anyway because he just kept going and going. Mrs. Mayhew looks at him like he's speaking another language. The tortoise and the hare, he repeats. Never mind that, she gives a flick of her hand. I told you I spotted these two from across the river and needed to see it for myself. She gestures at Noah and me. Mr. Mayhew regards us with knitted brows. Why? It's just Noah and Tabitha. We see them all the time. Well, not Tabitha so much these days, but we see Noah. He sees Noah all the time. Didn't Noah tell me he hasn't been back here in years? I tilt my head in Noah's direction, but he avoids my gaze. This guy is a mystery wrapped up in an enigma dipped in secrecy. Mr. Mayhew's wife prods him in the ample belly with her elbow. What did I say over at the pub? It's like we've been transported back in a time machine to ten years ago with these two. In a time machine? He questions. Yes, Baz, in a time machine. In what way? He asks her. Oh, you are a silly old goat. In the best way there is. The very best way. Mr Mayhew looks at her blankly. Love, Mrs. Mayhew exclaims in exasperation. She gestures at Noah and me. These two. 
I looked down at the earth beneath my feet, willing it to open up and swallow us. Oh, you're right, dearie. That is the best way, Mr. Mayhew replies, and both sets of eyes turn to look at us. I'm not sure what Noah's doing, because the last thing I'm going to do right now is look at him. It's all too, too uncomfortable. Oh, I, uh, we were just talking, Mr. Mayhew, I mutter as Noah says. It's the tree, we're concerned about the tree. I leap on it. Yes, that's right, the tree. We're very concerned about it. Did you know developers plan on cutting it down? Can you believe that? Well, yes, Mr. Mayhew replies, dumbfounded. We thought you'd know that. Why? I question. We only just found out now, right this very moment, in fact, from Dot and Caro and the protesters over there. Noah indicates toward the placard brandishing protesters, still moving in a circle and making up new chants that Dot is belting out over the megaphone. Mrs. Mayhew crosses her arms over her chest and lifts her chin in defiance. Utter codswallop, she declares. Tree or no tree? You two looked exactly the way you did all those years ago, and you know it. I need a distraction, a way out, and I need it now. I lift my watch-free wrist up to my face and pretend to read the time. Gosh, look at how late it's got. Noah, we really do need to get going. We need to get to my parents' place, you see, and Echo needs her sleep. The dog needs her sleep? I shoot Noah a meaningful look, and he jumps on my thread without question. You're right, we do have to go. Echo is tired and your parents are expecting you. It was so wonderful seeing you both again, Mr. and Mrs. Mayhew, and our meal was delicious, as always. Wasn't it, Tabitha? Totally delicious, I confirm, as I tug on Echo's lead to tell her we're on the move. Mrs. Mayhew raises her eyebrows at us, as if to say she knows precisely what we're doing, but we both ignore the look as we say goodbye. I go to make my way back to the bridge, just as Noah moves in the opposite direction, and we walk straight into one another. Ow! I exclaim, although it's more from the shock than any injury. Sorry, sorry. It's fine. Are, are you fine? Yes, fine. He steps one way, and I step the same way. And then we both move the other way, like one of those embarrassing dances people do. This goes on for a while until he takes control by placing his hands on my arms. Let's take Echo for that walk first, okay? Walk? Sure. She'll need one of those before all the... Sleeping. It's so freaking awkward. Mrs. Mayhew's brows are still raised in our direction. I shoot her a smile as I breeze past Noah, as though this was the plan all along, calling, Goodbye, Mr. and Mrs. Mayhew, over my shoulder, as we beat our much-needed retreat. Chapter 19 Well, that was super smooth. Noah comments with a chortle as we quickly put distance between us and the Mayhews and the protesters. Which part? The walking into one another or Mrs. Mayhew not shutting up about the time machine? Both, he says, a smile teasing his lips. I let out a relieved laugh. Personally, I think we should apply to spy school. We're quite the duo, Noah says. I snort giggle and immediately lift my hand to my face as though I could stop the embarrassing noise from sneaking out again. Noah's eyes flash to mine, his face lit up in a grin that makes my traitorous belly do a couple of acrobatic flips. I forgot you snort when you laugh. I don't. Evidence would suggest otherwise. I know he's got me. Okay, every now and then I've been known to let out a very ladylike sound when I laugh that might be construed by some as a snort but it's perfectly natural, you know. Every now and then? Maybe a little more often than that, 
I nudge him with my elbow, and we share a smile. By now, the cacophony of noise from Dot's megaphone and the protesters' chants have diminished to a low rumble with intermittent squawks. Without the tempting distractions, I lean down to unhook Echo's lead and she dashes off through the long grass ahead of us, full of the joy freedom brings. She's a great dog. Shame she's not yours, Noah says as he watches her bound around the field, stopping to sniff for a moment and then taking off again. It's nice of you to help your neighbor out. You're a good person. I warm to the compliment. I'd want someone to do the same for me if my husband did the dirty and left me for another woman. Ouch, bad form. You said it. Two small children, too. He hardly pays her anything to take care of them, and he's only seen them a handful of times. He just up and left a few months ago, left a note under a magnet on the fridge. I do not get men who leave their wives and don't pay for their kids, let alone see them. Thank you, I say, his words echoing my thoughts. It's one thing to have differences with the other adult in the relationship, but kids are these innocent beings who didn't ask for any of it. They deserve so much more than to be treated that way. I smile at him. You're a good man, Noah Grant. That's not being a good man, that's being a decent human being. When I get married, I want to do the right thing. It's not rocket science. You mean you want to do the right thing when you leave your wife for another woman and put a note under the fridge magnet? He lets out a laugh as he shakes his head. Yeah, exactly that. It's always best to have a plan. They're great kids, too, and so full of mischief. The other day, when I went to collect Echo, Timmy decided he was coming, too, and put on his raincoat and his mum's slippers. It was so cute. His mum said that I trail off as I take in the look on his face. His lips are curved in a smile, but his eyes are soft. What? I ask. Nothing. No, it's something. You were looking at me as though I'd said something funny. He comes to a stop and turns to face me. You want to know the truth? Do I? I think I do. I was thinking how kind you are to your neighbor, and how lucky she is to have you. I can't help bashful heat from rising in my cheeks, but I do my best to style it out. You already said that. I mean it. It was one of the things I liked about you when we were together. You were always kind to others. I brush it off with a joke. I only do it because I'm too tight to get my own dog. Sure you do. We've both complimented one another and things feel much less tense between us, despite the ridiculously uncomfortable experience with Mrs. Mayhew only moments ago. It's as though the protesters, the tree, and even Mrs. Mayhew herself have all managed somehow to create a crack in the wall between us. A wall I quickly put up the moment Noah came back into my life. And now we've reached a more relaxed, friendly state of being. It's nice. It's familiar. But I need to remember that however I feel, Noah doesn't want me. He's moved on with that gorgeous girl I saw him running through the park with. To him, I'm simply his ex. The girl he used to love when he was barely even a man. The woman he's now working with. And sure, we're back here in Marlingworth, where it all began. And that's having an effect on him making him want to say things to me. But it doesn't mean he feels anything for me. Noah places one of his hands against the thick, chunky trunk of another large oak. I wonder if they're going to cut this tree down too. I gaze up at the branches stretching out from the trunk above us, the dappled evening light filtering through the foliage playing on my face. I hope not. I don't want them to chop down either of these trees, Surely the developers haven't bought all of this land. It depends on how big their plans are, I guess. You sounded like you were keen to do something about it back there. Not chaining yourself to the tree, of course. 
he flashes that smile of his at me. I do want to do something. It doesn't seem right to allow some big developer to come in and ruin the village. I'm sure Dot and the gang would be more than happy to have the daughter of the big landowner around here on their side. What's my family got to do with any of this? You know they have clout around here. They talk and people listen. Maybe you should mention it to your parents tonight when you go stay with them. Get them on your side. I bite down on my lip. My parents tend to make up their own minds. And then there's the tree. It's a lot like this one. He looks up at the foliage. With a thick, solid trunk giving us privacy from the protesters in the distance, the river moving slowly below, and with the scent of flowers and birdsong floating on the evening air, it's like we've stepped into another dimension where we are the sole occupiers. Just Noah and me. And Echo, of course, who's still bounding around like an overgrown puppy. It's all rather romantic, and not unlike that day we shared our very first ever kiss. Echo comes hurtling back, her tail whipping my bare leg as she careens past us. Echo, what are you doing? I call out, but she's in her own little world, not listening to boring old me. Don't you love an obedient dog? Noah says with a laugh. She's usually so good. I let her off the lead all the time down at the dog park off Drew Street, and she always comes back to me there. Drew Street? He asks. Uh-oh. That's where I saw him running. Yeah, I reply casually. You know, that park or another one. I like to mix it up, keep it interesting for her. He studies my face for a beat. It's a nice park. I go running through it most evenings. Do you? My voice is unnaturally high. I clear my throat. <clears throat> well, it's good to get exercise. It's good to get exercise? What am I saying? His lips lift in a sexy smile that does nothing for my state of mind. You're totally right. I've never seen you down there. Perhaps we go at different times. Sure, probably. I can't hold it in. I need to know. I saw you, I blurt out. I was at the park and you ran past with a woman. You looked happy together. A woman? He asks, his brows knitted together. Oh, I know. I was happy because I'd beaten her for the first time. I press my lips together. So he's not denying it. He is in a relationship with that girl. Right. Well, that's great. He chokes out a laugh. <laughs> you think it's great? Well, you know, I'm happy for you that you've found someone, is what I mean. I reply, although I am finding it incredibly hard to feel good about Noah finding love with someone other than me. Incredibly hard indeed. Do you remember my cousin Callie? The one who lived with my family for a while when we were together? I narrow my eyes at him. Is that it? Is he shutting this conversation down now? Yeah, I'm in love with the girl you saw in the park and now I want to change the subject. I try to keep the strain from my voice. What's Callie got to do with the fact you've got a girlfriend, a wife, or whatever she is? Noah laughs, his eyes shining. Why the heck are you laughing? I throw my hands on my hips. This isn't funny, you know. That was Callie you saw me with. My jaw drops open. That's Callie? The girl in the park? I ask in disbelief. But she's all grown up. What can I say? She's not 11 anymore. It happens. But I thought... You thought wrong. My disbelief is replaced by a sudden rush of euphoria that leaves me breathless. So you're not with someone? He shakes his head. Not with someone. I try to stop a gigantic smile from forcing its way across my face. Fail. 
He smiles back at me. Callie looks great, I tell him. She is great. She's in law school and training for the London Marathon. She is? Yup. That's why I was so happy I'd beaten her. She's in great shape. I grin at him, feeling lighter. Noah is single. I let that thought sink in for a while. Hey, are you still painting? I ask him. Yes, I am actually, when I find the time. I'm glad to hear it. You are always a good artist. He gives a self-deprecating laugh. <laughs> Not really, but I enjoy it. I pull my gaze from his and watch as Echo bounds through the long grass over by a hedgerow. Echo, come, I call. This time she looks at me, her ears pricked up, and then immediately sprints towards us and comes to a sudden stop at my feet, her long pink tongue hanging out of her mouth as she watches me for her next instruction. Echo, sit, I tell her and she sits down on her hind legs. Huh, that worked. Why didn't you just say that in the first place? Noah teases. You're right. I lift my finger and copy the instruction Maya gives her. Echo, lie down. To my glee, she does as she's told, lying down on the dirt underneath the tree. Now you're just showing off. He's right. I am. Sue me. Very few people do what I tell them. It's nice to have Echo around to bolster my confidence. Your confidence needs bolstering, huh? He asks, his voice low and intimate, the way he used to talk to me. His eyes are glistening in the evening light, and the intensity in his stare has my pulse beginning to thud, and my skin tingling with anticipation. And just like that, the atmosphere begins to crackle around us once more. I do my best to shrug. I'm aiming for nonchalant and cool, while under his intense gaze I'm the very opposite. We can all do with feeling good about ourselves from time to time, and a good confidence boost is never a bad thing. I sound like an old-fashioned schoolteacher giving a lesson on self-esteem. I'm not exactly sure you need a boost. The Tabitha Green I knew was always super confident. I can see that hasn't changed. He pauses for a beat before adding, You haven't changed. I bite down on my lip as my heart threatens to beat right out of my chest. Is me not having changed a good thing? Or does he mean that he'd hoped I'd change and I've disappointed him? It could be a close-run race were it not for the look on his face that tells me, to him, it's a good thing. A very good thing. I was going to compliment you, but now that I hear your confidence is up because the dog did what you told her, he trails off. I lift my chin, my breathing becoming increasingly shallow. Where has all the oxygen suddenly gone? Why don't you tell me anyway? I reply, oh, I am flirting. Don't judge me. He's not in a relationship with a girl with legs like a gazelle, and he's gazing at me as though I'm a delicious bowl of his favorite flavor of ice cream right now. And let's not forget, I know all too well what it's like to kiss those lips. Let me get this straight. You're asking me to compliment you now? I swallow my throat Sahara Desert dry. You're the one who raised it. I'm just responding to what you said. I hold my breath as I await his reply. Say something wonderful. The edges of his lips lift into a knee-weakening smile. He looks so much like the Noah I once knew, the Noah I once loved. He takes a step closer to me, and I can't help but inhale his Noah scent, that heady mixture of pine and a crisp winter's day, that I tried my level best not to breathe in while we were in his car. I don't bother to stop myself now. I suck in a deep breath, my mind flooded with memories of him, of him holding me, touching me, kissing me. 
of him being mine. The air between us sizzles with memories and possibility. Back there, when we got interrupted, what I wanted to say was, he begins, his voice low and intimate. You're just as beautiful as the day I kissed you under that tree. More so, perhaps, because now you're a woman, not a girl anymore. My breath catches, my heart thudding in my ears. Could this mean what I hope it means? Could Noah still have feelings for me? He reaches for my hand, and the touch of his skin against mine sends a wave of emotion through me, tickling my belly and making my knees weaken. His touch is gentle and familiar, yet at the same time filled with excitement at what this might mean between us. Feeling the sudden, overwhelming urge to fill the silence, I murmur, this feels weird. Weird? He questions, the edges of his mouth lifting. Weird and amazing and exciting and don't let go, whatever you do, don't let go. You know, like old times, back when we were in love. My voice is breathy and light. It's almost like the last 12 years have been wiped out and here we find ourselves again. He smiles down at me. And in that moment, we are a couple of 16-year-olds with adulthood knocking on the door, about to embark on the most incredible grand love affair of our lives. A grand love affair I've never been able to forget. And then, the sizzling air around us catches a light as he leans down towards me and our breath mingles, his hand tentatively touching my waist. I tilt my face up to meet him, knowing that all those nights I lay awake, missing him, regretting that I'd lost him, knowing that it's him I love and no one else, have culminated in this one exquisite, heart-pounding moment. As his lips claim mine, tentatively at first, and then with heightened need, he pulls my body against his, and I lose myself completely in him, kissing him back, showing him how much he means to me. Noah, the man I've always loved. Chapter 20 I gaze up at Noah as we both hold one another close, under the tree by the river, on this beautiful summer's evening. I can barely believe that only moments ago we were locked in the most exquisite kiss, a kiss I've dreamt about sharing with him for so, so long. Despite my bravado over the past 12 years, deep down inside I know being with Noah once more is all I've ever wanted. Does it still feel weird? He asks as he smiles down at me, his voice gentle. No, it feels wonderful. Yeah, it does. He leans his forehead against mine, our gazes locked, before he adds, Duchess. I can't help the ear-to-ear -ear grin from claiming my face. You haven't called me Duchess since that last summer. I haven't seen you since that last summer. I let out a soft laugh. <laughs> That's a good point. We share a smile, and then, emboldened, I push myself up onto my toes and press my lips against his once more. He pulls me in tight and kisses me back, and I swear, despite the pale blue summer evening sky above, I see stars. I've missed this. I've missed you. You have? He pulls back. You seem surprised. It's just that it was so long ago and I've not seen you since, well, since things ended. A dark cloud crosses his face, his jaw tightening briefly before he composes himself once more. Instantly, guilt and regret tighten my chest and I say in a rush, I'm so sorry about how it all ended. I wish, I wish it hadn't happened the way it did. No argument here. 
To my utter shock, tears fall from my eyes and my throat tightens. I quickly wipe them away. I'm not one to cry. In the not-so-distant past, I've preferred to bottle it all up and deal to it with Chardonnay and dancing on tabletops. But that's not dealing with things at all. That's denying their existence, hoping they will somehow magically disappear. It's a band-aid. Not a very effective one when it comes to Noah. Hey, he says softly as he collects one of my errant tears on his fingertip. What's with the waterworks? Sorry, sorry. I swallow down the lump in my throat and sniff back my tears. I can hear my mother's words in the back of my head. Stiff up a lip, Tabitha. None of your histrionics, please. Don't be sorry. Tell me what's going on. I hang my head as memories of that day come flooding back, tightening my chest. I offer him a weak, watery smile, ashamed of my unexpected sorrow, spilling over as tears. I'm being a sentimental sap, I tell him, with a self-effacing laugh that gurgles out of me. That doesn't sound like you. I don't think I've ever seen you cry. That's because greens don't show our emotions. It's common and it's gauche, I tell him directly quoting my mother. Well, this green right here? She can do whatever she wants as far as I can see. Warmth seeps across my chest, and the heavy sadness I felt only a moment ago begins to lighten. You always were a really great guy. He shrugs, a smile on his face. I'm not going to argue with you. I am a great guy. The skin around his eyes creases as his grin spreads, and it pulls me from my despondency. I brush the final tears from my cheeks and offer him a smile. Good to see your confidence doesn't need a boost. I think we're probably both good on that front. He takes my hand in his and gives it a squeeze. So, what's going on? Why the tears? I lower my gaze. I was remembering the day I ended things with you. Ah, right. One of my all-time favorites. He presses his lips together, the memory flashing across his face. It was terrible of me to do that to you. We'd planned how we were going to see each other when I left, and I wanted that. But, well, things didn't go that way. No, they didn't. I've thought about it a lot since then, Noah, and I've wanted to say how sorry I am. He raises his brows. Sorry for breaking up with me? I bite down on my lip and nod, my stomach hardening. The way I remember it, I turned around and broke up with you too. Yeah, I know, but a part of me always wondered if you only did that because you knew I was ending things with you and you needed to... I don't know, show me you are strong? I hold my breath. He presses his lips together before he replies. It was pretty crappy of me. So I was right. All this time I'd wondered and now I know. Somehow it doesn't make me feel any better. I was the one who forced him into ending our relationship. I was the one who broke my own heart. I wish, I break off, not sure I should say anything further, despite this newfound closeness between us. You wish what? His voice is soft, kind, and when I raise my gaze to his, the look in his eyes is earnest and heartfelt. Do I tell him how I really feel? How I regretted that day more than I've regretted anything in my life? Do I tell him that I've never stopped loving him? I'm not sure I can handle that level of vulnerability with him. Hey, it's okay. He cups my face in his hand, and the touch of his soft, warm skin gives me all the confidence I need. My voice is trembling when I say, I'm sorry. For all of it. Tabitha, don't. It was a long time ago. 
I know, but I've never stopped thinking about you. About us. I pull my lips into an attempt at a smile. His eyes widen. You haven't? I give a slow shake of my head. I know I'm probably over a decade too late, but I've never been able to forget you. You're the one I've always wondered. What if? He takes a beat, his features tightening. I wait for his response to the words I've been too scared to say for years, my heart pounding heavily. He pushes out a laugh. We were naive. Neither of us knew what life held for us. Making plans to be with the person you fell in love with at 16 is... Well, it doesn't usually work out. My throat is hot, and I try to swallow. What if we hadn't broken up, though? Who knows? We might have made it. We might have. We share a smile, and I feel lighter than I did only moments ago. You're turning 30 in a week, right? I pull a face. Don't remind me. You'll be fine. I'm 30, and look at me. Still in my prime. He pumps his arm muscles, which I will admit are impressive. If the hints I can see through his shirt are anything to go by, and waggles his brows at me. I let out a giggle, and it ends in a snort. Immediately, I place my hand over my mouth, just as I did the last time. Noah laughs. No, you're totally right. You don't snort when you giggle at all, he says as he pulls me into him. I let out a laugh, all the tension and anxiety from before disappearing in a puff of smoke, replaced instead with the exhilaration of knowing that not only does Noah forgive me for what I did to him, but that maybe, just maybe, he might feel for me what I feel for him. He cups my face in his hands, leans down and says, I'm going to kiss you again now. Thanks for the warning. His response is to press his lips against mine. It's a soft, tender kiss, almost lazy, like we have all the time in the world to luxuriate in one another. I have a question for you, I say between kisses. If it's to ask if you can kiss me, then I already know my answer. He murmurs against my mouth. I pull back from him so I can see his face. What is this thing between us? I'm glad you asked. It's called kissing, making out, snogging, as you might put it. It's in my top ten things to do. Only top ten? I tease. With you? Maybe more like top eight. I grab him by his collar and pull him in for another kiss. Tell me that's not top five at least. Okay, top five for sure. And I think you know what I mean. What are we doing here? You and me, this new kissing thing we're doing, which I've got to say is in my top four things to do. Four, huh? He grins at me. I would say we're back where we should be, wouldn't you? A huge grin claims my face. Back where we should be. I pull him into me and press my lips against his once more, wrapping my arms around him and feeling his firm, taut body pressed against mine. Right now, everything feels possible with him. Even the dream I've had for so long to be with him again. And now I have the small seed of hope that he feels the same way. Chapter 21 Noah winds the car along the tree-lined driveway to my family home, the tires crunching on the gravel. I forgot how large this place is. Is it just your mom and dad living here now? In the big house, yes. Fenella and her family have the cottage these days. Her husband, Teddy, works for Daddy. I didn't know your sister was married, let alone that she has kids. We've missed out on a lot in one another's lives in the last 12 years. 
I reply. He looks over at me, his features relaxed, his eyes soft. I guess we can catch up on all of that now, if you want to. I beam at him, the note of self-doubt in his voice touching my heart. I'd like that. Me too. He smiles back at me before he returns his attention to driving. After that incredible moment we shared under the oak tree, where my hope that Noah still felt something for me was realised, we'd reluctantly had to leave so I could get to my parents' place. Hand in hand, we'd return to the car, talking and laughing, and basking in our newfound closeness. I'm not going to lie, it feels amazing. This is something I've wanted since the day I stupidly gave it away, and I can barely believe my luck that Noah is back in my life. Mrs. Mayhew, it turns out, was on to something. Fenella's married, huh? Noah asks as he turns onto the country lane near my family home. Yup, married with children. And before you say anything, yes, my parents have passed comment on the fact she's my younger sister, but I'm okay with that. My sister, Fenella, is the one who has managed to do what I have failed to do, according to my parents, marry a sensible man from the right family, and produce three lovely grandchildren. She has not moved to London and partied her socks off while running a gallery and is not pushing thirty with no husband in sight. Naughty, naughty, Tabitha. Good for you, he replies. How many kids does she have? Three. The twins and a new arrival back in April. Baby Persephone. Persephone? He questions, with an arch of his eyebrow. I get it. It's not exactly Olivia or Sophia or Isabella, is it? I mean, what's her nickname going to be? Purse? Phone? Poor kid. Don't get me started, I reply with a laugh. The twins are called Hades and Ares. Fenella has been on a bit of a Greek deity kick. No kidding, he replies as he turns into the driveway, passing by the old wrought iron gates. Tell me something. Are the kids Greek godlike in any way? What would that even look like if they were? I don't know. Six-pack, teleportation skills, immortality. Maybe the ability to throw lightning bolts or lift super heavy hammers? Are you getting confused with Thor? Because I can tell you that's Chris Hemsworth, not one of my three-year-old nephews. He chuckles. Wrong geography, too. Meaning? Noah pulls the car around the fountain and comes to a stop in front of the double front doors. Switching off the ignition, he says, Thor is Nordic, not Greek. Actually, I think you'll find Chris Hemsworth is Australian, I reply with a grin. You always did love your celebrities. Are you still obsessed with Kate Middleton? No, which is a total lie. I adore Kate Middleton. I only hope Noah doesn't recognize the Kate copy Reese dress I'm wearing. Right. He puts the car in park and his eyes slide over my dress, making my belly engage in some acrobatic flips. That doesn't look like a Kate Middleton dress at all. You got me. I still adore Kate. She's my absolute style icon, and I challenge you to find another as good. Kim Kardashian? I don't have the butt, and you know it. His grin is slow and oh so sexy. I do know it. We share a smile before I remember that we're parked outside my family home, and one of them could materialize at any second. Considering my parents weren't exactly Noah's biggest fans back in the day, it's best to keep whatever this new thing is between us a secret, at least for now. Will you get to see these godlike kids while you're here for the night? I imagine in the morning, and just for the record, they still poop and cry and get food stuck in their hair, so I'd say they're fairly not godlike, Greek or otherwise. And no hammers? No hammers. He lets out a laugh 
and it tickles my insides. I suppose I'd better go. I wish you could come in. He offers me a wry smile. I think it's best I stay out here, don't you think? I look down at my hands. It was a long time ago, Noah. I lift my gaze to his, expecting to see the churn of emotions rolling through me at the memory. But instead, his face is impassive. Relaxed, even. I guess it's all in the past for him. Which is a good thing. I know it is. My parents did not approve of us being together back then. He was the son of the local mechanic, and I was the daughter of the great family, as they went to pains to point out at the time. They held back from describing it as an unholy match, but they may as well have. I'd kiss you goodbye, but it feels wrong somehow. Which is weird, I know. I say. We're not seventeen anymore. Yeah, I remember. He glances around. Then, satisfied we're alone, he hooks his hand around the back of my head and pulls me into a kiss. You're very brave, I tell him. What can I say? You're a hard woman to resist, and I really really don't want to resist you. If I hadn't told my parents I was coming to stay, we could sit up late together and talk. And other things. His eyes glow with heat. Let's leave that for another night. I kiss him on the lips once more. I'm going to hold you to that. With his hand resting on the steering wheel, he says, So I guess I'll see you in the morning. The front door opens and my mother steps out, followed by my parents' two greyhounds, Chester and Bentley, who bound over to our car in search of the newcomers. Echo spots them and immediately lets out a whine that tells me she wants to get out and play. Wearing her usual uniform, her bobbed hair styled to stiff perfection, my mother pulls her brows together as she peers into the car. If my fashion icon is Kate Middleton, my mother's is Sloan Rangers from the 80s. Button-up shirt, string of pearls, tweed skirt, and sensible but expensive shoes. I push the door open and step out onto the gravel driveway. There you are, Tabitha. We've been expecting you for hours, she says. I dart a look at Noah. Thanks a lot for the ride. I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow, he repeats, offering me one of his heart-melting smiles. Hello, mummy, I say with a tight smile. I'll get Echo out of the back. Oh, you brought a dog? The boys will be pleased, she says, referring to her greyhounds. Lovely to see you, darling, she blows me an air kiss. Apparently it's too far to take the five or six steps around the car to greet me. Who's in the car? Do I know him? I open the back door and Echo leaps out and immediately bounds over to my mother, gives her a cursory sniff, and then darts onto the lawn, trailed by two excited greyhounds. It's the art dealer I'm travelling with, I tell her elusively. But he has to go now. He's got a place to stay in the village. But my mother was brought up too well to allow someone to get away without being invited in and grilled about who they are and what they do, and whether they're the right sort of person for their daughter to be fraternising with. She calls it getting to know you, but most people would call it an interrogation. Before I can stop her, she's whisked her skinny, age-defying body across to the driver's side of Noah's car, indicated for him to roll his window down, and thrust her hand through it. I hold my breath as I watch the potentially disastrous scene unfold, powerless to do anything about it. I'm Rosamond Green. Welcome to my home. And you are? She clearly hasn't recognised Noah. Not yet, anyway. Nice to see you, Mrs. Green. Noah replies smoothly as he shakes her hand. We've met before, but it was a long time ago. I'm Noah Grant. Oh, you're American. How interesting. I've had the pleasure of spending the day with your daughter. I suppress a smile. 
She leans in closer to the car. Are you sure it was a pleasure spending the day with my daughter? We barely tolerate her, and that's only because we're related, <laughs> she asks, and then barks with laughter. Thanks, mummy, I reply with a roll of my eyes. Seriously, if my mother had agreed with Noah that it would have been a pleasure to spend the day with me, I think I might have fainted from surprise. The Greens don't show their love through hugs or kindness. That would be way too straightforward and normal for my family. Really, it's a laugh a minute to be me. Whenever I've tried to talk to either of my parents about how we are with one another in the past, they've always told me to get over myself and then promptly continued with their behaviour. So I've resigned myself to it, knowing my parents love me, even if they find it hard to show. It's the green family way. 1. Don't show any real emotion. 2. Always be pleasant, no matter what. 3. Make sure to stick with your own kind. I would add, drink large amounts of hard liquor as point number 4, but we Greens would never admit to using alcohol as a social crutch. Far too common, darling, don't you know? Which doesn't mean they don't do it. Oh, Tabitha, it's just one of Mummy's silly jokes. I'm sure, Mr. Grant, did you say? She asks, and Noah gives a nod. Can see that I'm only having a bit of fun. Now you must come in for a drink, Mr. Grant. I insist. Noah has to go, Mummy. He's due elsewhere. I protest, as Echo, Chester and Bentley race past me on their way to one of the other lawns. My objection falls on deaf ears. Oh, darling, I'm quite certain your friend could do with a wee drinky after the day he's had. Isn't that right, Mr. Grant? She smirks at Noah, as her eyes sparkle. Actually, your daughter and I have had a wonderful day today. She has a special relationship with an artist whose work my client is interested in, and I feel lucky to get the chance to work with her. My face could break in two, I'm grinning so hard, and it's a good thing he left out the echo slash paint fiasco. Oh, that's lovely, Mummy replies, sounding about as genuine as a used car salesman on the last day of the quarter. It is, Noah confirms with a smile. But Tabitha's right, Mrs. Green. I should really get going and allow you some family time. Nonsense. I won't have it. She pulls the car door open and Noah darts me a look that says, What can you do? Before he rises from his seat to his full six foot three height, towering over my mother's small frame. I can stay for one drink, and then I'll let you have some family time on your own with Tabitha. I keep my features impassive, while inside I've got a whole lot going on ecstatic that Noah is supporting me in front of my mother, concerned she's going to click that this is the Noah Grant and all the memories that will elicit for her, and enjoying the view. What can I say? Noah's ridiculously nice to look at. Hello, firstborn child, a voice says from the doorway, and I look up to see my father. He too is in his typical uniform, a Shetland jacket, complete with pocket square, worn over a pale yellow check shirt, dark tie and sensible but nevertheless expensive corduroy trousers. He's been wearing the same thing since I can remember, other than when he comes into London where he sports a business suit. Hello, Daddy. I offer him a terse smile. Surely Daddy will recognise Noah. Francis! Come and meet Mr. Grant, Mummy instructs as she hooks her arm through his. Daddy extends his hand to shake Noah's. Francis Green, pleasure. It's nice to see you again, Mr. Green. Mr. Grant has decided to stay for one drink, and I'm really rather chomping at the bit to hear his thoughts on the art market. He's an art dealer, darling. Is he? Daddy asks sizing Noah up. 
Mummy hooks her arm through Noah's and begins to lead him towards the house. I want to hear all about your art dealing, Mr. Grant. Please call me Noah. Well, this is going to be fun. Noah, she repeats with a smile. Echo, I call, and she appears at my side, accompanied by two other dogs, who I barely get the chance to pat because they're so busy having a great time bouncing around together. I follow Noah and my parents into the house with more than a dollop of trepidation. Why don't my parents recognize him? And what the heck will happen when they finally tag on to the fact he's the boyfriend they never thought was good enough for their daughter? Chapter 22 Do my parents seriously not remember Noah? Not even a flash of memory. Something lodged in the dark recesses of time, perhaps? Something to be jolted out with a familiar gesture, a turn of phrase? Sure, he looks different. Gone is his slimmer, youthful good looks, the longer hair, the confident boyish charm. The boy became a man, replaced with a more solid and handsome version, who has grown into himself and his looks. His clothes have changed too. Where once he made beaten up jeans and t-shirts look ridiculously hot, now he's doing the same thing to his new white button-up shirt, his dark eyes and stubble-lined jaw, putting images of sexy men on romance book covers to shame. We've been sitting with my parents in the reception room they use on a day-to-day -day basis. With the choice of five reception rooms in the house, You've got to settle on one, or you'd be forever losing your reading glasses or cup of coffee. This is first world problems on steroids. They're chatting about the art world and Daddy's perspective on, well, a lot of things. Echo has finally settled down and grown used to her surrounds, and has found a quiet spot to lie down and catch up on some of the sleep she missed out on in all the excitement of the road trip, and paint-related fun at Jed's today. Me? I've been sitting on the edgiest edge of my seat like a rigid piece of marble, willing this whole horrible, surreal experience to be over. It really is an exciting field to work in, and I feel privileged to get to buy and sell the beautiful works that I do, Noah says. I can imagine nothing better, Mummy replies. Another? Daddy holds out a crystal decanter of whiskey. Noah places his hand over the glass of whiskey he's barely touched. Thank you, but I need to drive, sir, and I usually don't drink hard liquor. Suit yourself. I'm off duty for the night. Tabitha? He proffers the decanter at me, and I hold up my glass of lime cordial. I'm not drinking tonight, Daddy, remember? Why ever not? I'm taking a break, I reply, not meeting Noah's eye. He doesn't need to know about any of that. Truth is, it's proving a little hard and not to hanker for my old familiar crutch while sitting in a room with my parents and the man they once thought wasn't good enough for me and now seemingly can't remember any of that, listening to them discuss art. Daddy refills his own whiskey and splashes in some water. It's such a solid investment. Hold on to a decent work of art for long enough and you can flog it off at a tidy profit. Well worth it in my estimation. You're absolutely right, Mr. Green. But for me, art is so much more than just a commodity. Art means something, Noah replies. I agree, it does mean something, I say, and I win a small smile from Noah. Listen to Mr. Grant, Francis. What about the enjoyment one can extract from owning an artwork? Mummy questions. Yes, yes, Daddy replies. But what if they're ugly? A lot of art is, you know, bloody ugly. I don't want that where I live, even if it is worth a tidy sum. No, you want paintings of all our dead relatives all over the walls, Daddy. 
I reply, because that is exactly what we have adorning the walls in this house. Generation upon generation of dead greens. That's history, Daddy harumps. Noah, did you know that my husband has a collection of art he keeps locked up in a safe and we never see? Beautiful artworks, none of what you call ugly pieces, Francis, Mummy says. Daddy takes another swig of his drink. I need to protect them, Rosamond. Surely you understand that, he sniffs. But what if I want to show my friends? I have to take them to a horrid safe. Mummy complains. You know I mentioned first world problems? Well, this is only in my family's extremely privileged class problems. Let me know when you want me to sell them for you, Daddy, I offer, hoping to deflect the conversation away from people who house expensive artwork in safes. I suppose you know Tabitha's got a little gallery in London. She likes it there. Keeps her out of trouble, my father explains. Doesn't it, sweetheart? It does, I reply. I'm sure it does more than just keep her out of trouble, sir. Tabitha gets a lot of the new up-and-coming artists my client is currently interested in buying, Noah says. I beam. Noah, talking me up to my parents again? Swoon. Yes, well, that's jolly good. Daddy replies vaguely. That reminds me, Jaunty Forsyth might pop by the gallery next week, Tabby. He needs some artwork for some new office complex, and I suggested you might be able to help him out. Thank you. I'll be sure to find something great for him, I reply. Noah and I had dinner at the Noble Pigeon tonight. Did you know developers have bought the field across the river, and they plan on cutting that lovely old oak tree down? Yes, yes, we've heard, Daddy replies with a wave of his hand. But the tree, I repeat. He clearly doesn't get the importance of what I've said. What about it? He asks. Don't you think it's terrible? They'll ruin that side of the river. It's always been that lovely field and the tree is hundreds of years old. There are other trees, Tabitha. No need to get riled up about just one. You're sounding like one of those nature-loving environmentalists now. Have you gone green on us? Daddy regards me with suspicion. A green green, Mummy muses, looking like her drink has gone to her head already. But then she probably started drinking before we even got here, knowing her. I'm not giving up so easily. That whole area represents so much Marlingworth history. We need to protest about it. It's just a field and a tree, Tabby. Really, you should be concerning yourself with more important things, like your gallery. Daddy sniffs. What does that mean? I ask. It means you've chosen not to live here anymore. So really, what difference does it make to you? Mummy replies presenting a united front on the topic. We're not concerned about it, so you shouldn't be either. She turns away from me as though to say the conversation is now over. I open my mouth to speak, then think better of it and clamp it shut. If there's one thing I've learned, it's that there's no point arguing with my parents. To this day, I've never won. Not once. It's best just to let them think they've got their point across and move on. I force a smile. You're probably right, Mummy. Noah rises to his feet. I must go. Thank you so much for your kind hospitality. It was nice to see you both again under better circumstances. Quite, Daddy replies as he rises to shake Noah's hand. Does he really still have no clue who he is? I bounce to my feet. I'll see Noah out. You sit back down, Daddy. Don't mind if I do, he replies, as he sinks back into his high-backed leather chair, his refilled glass in hand. Noah says goodbye to Mummy, and I whisk him from the room before they finally put two and two together and come up with the boy who tried to wreck our daughter's life. 
We make our way across the entry hall, our heels clicking on the cold marble floor as paintings of my ancestors look down at us. I can't believe they don't remember you, I say in a hushed tone at the front door, despite the fact they need supersonic hearing to hear what we're saying this far from the reception room. I'd say it's for the best, wouldn't you? I pull my lips into a line. I suppose so. They haven't changed. No? I ask, hoping it's a compliment on their appearance, but suspecting he means something deeper. Something I don't want to think about. He shakes his head. No. He opens his mouth to say something more, and then closes it again. What? I ask. Nothing. He pauses a beat and adds, Can I ask you why you're taking a break from drinking alcohol? I shrug. I'm trying something new. Not drinking is something new for you? He asks with a hint of a smile. I scrunch up my nose. Kind of, I suppose. Do you want to talk about it? No. I reply with a laugh. Not that this is in the least bit funny. It's more nerves than anything else. He's still watching me after I've pushed out a heavy breath. Look, the thing is, I was parting too much, and my friends noticed, and I decided to take a break from it. I'm not an alcoholic, and I'm not about to go into rehab or anything dramatic like that. I just decided I wanted to live my life differently. That's all. That sounds like a good idea to me. How long had you been partying too much? Try ever since I realized I'd thrown away the only love I'd ever known. Oh, a while, I suppose. I wave my hand in the air to show him it's not a big deal. Really, it's not like I had a problem or anything. No? He questions, and the concern in his eyes has warmth filling my chest. I suppose there are a lot of things we don't know about each other. He pulls me into him and gives me a soft and tender kiss on the lips. I can't wait to find out. I grin up at him with butterflies in my belly. Me neither. He glances around us. You know, it's strange being back here after all this time. I remember having to sneak around the house and come through the servant's entrance to see you. My stomach hardens at the memories. I knew my parents wouldn't approve of me seeing a local village boy, even before I brought him home to them. They were true to form, telling me I could do better, so after a while I kept my relationship with Noah secret. For as long as I could, anyway. I'm... I'm sorry I made you do that. I knew they didn't approve of us being together, it was the only way I could be with you, and I wanted to be with you. I guess it made it all kind of exciting. His smile veils the discomfort I know he must feel inside. They didn't think I was good enough for you back then. I lift my gaze to his. But you were. You are. His lips curve into a smile. I know that. He did. He was never bothered by our different backgrounds the way my parents were, like they were living in some kind of Victorian novel. Noah was always confident, always knew his worth. It was one of the things I loved about him. I blow out air. It was a lot, wasn't it? It was. But it's in the past and things are different now. I know they are. I'm not some impressionable teenager anymore. He lets out a laugh and it diffuses the tension around us. At almost 30, I'd sure hope not. You're reminding me it's my birthday in a week. Thanks a lot. I grin at him, more than happy to leave our troubled past behind. Really, 30 isn't bad. Happy belated, I tell him. It was four months ago, but... I'll take it. His smile is warm and crinkles the skin around his eyes. Shall I pick you up tomorrow at ten? 
We can talk tactics over coffee before we jump in the car and head over to Dalton. Sure, that would be good. I hook my hand behind his head and pull him in for another quick kiss, because kissing Noah Grant is just so good. Have a good sleep, I'm... I pause, not sure how to put my feelings into words. He smiles at me. Tabitha Green is at a loss for words. I was going to say how happy I am we're where we are now. He glances around the hallway with its double-height ceiling, wall tapestries, and huge chandelier. It is a very nice entryway, he replies, his smile blossoming into a grin. I let out a laugh. Terrible joke, Mr. Grant. He shrugs. I made you laugh, though, didn't I? I pull the door open. Give Echo a pat good night from me. The Terror of Dalton, you mean? I watch as he climbs into his car and flashes me his grin before he drives off, his car growing smaller and smaller as he makes his way down the long driveway. I let out a contented sigh. Whatever happens from here, however we move forward, Noah's back in my life, and my parents seem to be impressed with this new version of him. Things are looking up for Tabitha Green. Chapter 23 Twelve Years Ago Noah takes a hold of my hand, and I turn to look at him by the old oak tree. I can't believe you're leaving for Scotland tomorrow. He pulls me close and brushes his lips against mine. I'm gonna count the days until I get to come see you up there in Edinburgh. I stiffen in his arms, the late summer sun powerless to warm the sudden cold that claims me. I swallow, my throat tight. Can we talk? I ask him. I prefer doing this. He pushes me gently against the tree and presses his firm body against mine, his fingers tangling up in my hair, his scent filling my lungs, making it hard to think straight. But I need to think straight. I need him to hear what I have to say today, before I'm gone. Noah, please, I protest. But now he's brushing soft kisses down my neck, turning my knees to mush, and it takes all my strength to push through. I, I need to talk to you. It's important. There must be something in my tone that reaches his consciousness. He abruptly stops the neck kisses that are driving me wild and looks at me questioningly. He pulls his brows together as he studies my face. What's going on, Duchess? I... Where do I start? How do I tell him how I feel? How do I say the words I fear will break his heart? My pulse thrashes in my ears. His eyes narrow. He's on high alert watching me closely. Has something happened? Is it your sister? Your mom? Your dad? I shake my head. No, they're all fine. It's... it's about us. Look, if you're worried that I'll be intruding on your new life at your university, I guess I can postpone my visit. I get it. I mean, I really want to come see you, but... I get that you might want to focus on your new life for a while. He loops his hands around my waist once more. Just as long as I get you all to myself when you come home. I drop my head and rest it on his shoulder. I try not to notice how good it feels to be in his arms, feel how warm he is, breathe his wonderful Noah scent. The way his body is both firm and soft to the touch at the same time. We've been together for just shy of 15 months now, and despite my parents' disapproval of him and my friends telling me not to get in too deep with a local boy, I've fallen for him. Hard. With my head still bowed, I say the words I know I must say. The words that have been rolling through my mind for weeks. Noah, I think we should break up. 
he lets out a sudden laugh. You think what? I lift my head and force myself to face him. As difficult as this is, I know what I must do. I'm serious. This thing between us has been amazing, but... But now it's over. It's got to be. Realization dawns, and his features morph from amused to disbelieving in the blink of an eye. He drops his arms to his side. What are you talking about? You and me. Us. Where? I'm leaving to go to university tomorrow, and you're staying, and I think it's for the best. I'm sure you'd agree if you really thought about it. His features harden, and a heavy brick settles in my belly. I'm hurting him. I'm hurting the man I love. It's geography? He questions. Geography and everything else. I force myself to step back from him, putting some much-needed distance between us. Because it could be so easy to fall back into his arms, to tell him I don't mean it, to tell him that I love him and want to be with him. But I can't. Noah, please understand. He watches me, his features hardened. Not here. He grinds out, his voice cold. Why? He gestures at the old oak tree. You know why. He turns on his heel, storms off through the field, and rounds the corner onto the bridge. I dart after him, trying to keep up with his long-legged stride. No, wait! I call, but he's not listening. I can't blame him. This whole time we have been together, we've been wrapped up in our love, exploring everything it has to offer. It's been magical. But some things are bigger than your first love. Everyone has told me so. My parents, my friends, all of them agree. Noah's been a summer fling for me. Someone to have fun with before I get down to the serious business of my life of going to university, of starting a career, and, eventually, meeting another guy. One who suits me. One who fits. And I know it, in my head. They've all told me you never forget your first love. But that's all it is. The first. You move on. You find others. You fall in love with someone where it's not too hard. Where you both get it where you don't have to keep the guy you love a secret from your family, where you're both from the same background and want the same things out of life, where no one tells you you're not right together. It's just my heart that's telling me they're wrong. But I need to listen to what my head is telling me. I need to listen to sense. As Daddy said, I've got the world at my feet, my whole life in front of me. And I know he's right. Rationally, it makes sense. I'm only just 18. I'm leaving home to start my life as an adult. There will be other guys. There will be other loves. Noah may be my first, but he won't be my last. He stops on the other side of the bridge next to the Noble Pigeon Pub, and I finally catch up to him, panting from the exertion. As I come to a stop... I put my hand on his arm and say, Noah, please. He rounds on me, his face flushed, breathing hard. You want to break up? That's fine. Totally fine. I try to swallow away the spiky heat in my throat. Okay, I reply uncertainly. I was going to end things anyway, probably when I came to see you in Edinburgh. So... All you've done is move it forward by a few weeks. He was? My heart is thudding, but it's not from exertion. But, he cuts me off. We've got different lives now. I've got my training and my future here, and you're going away. Eventually, we needed to face this. May as well get it over with now, before we get in too deep. He runs his fingers through his hair, his features taut closed off. 
My lip begins to tremble, my heart breaking into tiny pieces. We're already in too deep. But I refuse to cry. I refuse to show him how his words slice through my heart. So, yeah, I guess that's it. He stares at me, as though challenging me to say otherwise. I don't reply, although it's unbearably painful to hear the words fall from his lips. I know he's right. It's what everyone's been telling me. He's making this easier. So instead, I simply gape at him, my throat tight as I hold back my tears. He locks his jaw, his full, soft lips, that I'd kissed only moments ago, now tight, off limits. You're right, I murmur, my heart ripped in two. This is what I wanted. This is how it needs to be. I guess I'll see you around, he says, and he shoots me one final look before he turns on his heel and walks away from me. Chapter 24 Oh, Fen, she's got the best smile, I declare, as I bounce my sister's baby girl on my knee in the morning light. She wasn't even smiling when I saw her a couple of months ago. Oh, she's very advanced. She started smiling way before the other babies in the village, Fenella replies proudly. Who knew you could be competitive over when a baby first smiles? My sister, obviously. She wasn't even two months old, you know. Really, it's almost unheard of. That's a whole other world I know nothing about. I gaze at my niece as she grins her toothless smile at me, a look of utter joy on her chubby-cheeked face. Are you advanced, Persephone? Are you, darling girl? I bounce her and am rewarded with a giggle. Oh, you are the cutest! And I don't care whether you smiled earlier than the other babies. You're smiling for your auntie, and that's all that matters. Fenella harumps. You'll get it when you have your own. Echo has been obediently sitting at my feet in the big house reception room, but she hasn't taken her eyes from Persephone. She has personal experience of babies and toddlers, which is exactly why, I'm sure. I wish I'd got to see the twins, I tell her, as I tickle Persephone's round belly. She lets out a fresh wave of giggles. I didn't know you were here, and Nanny needed to take them to the playground. They have a lot of boy energy. Really, Tabby, they're quite, quite wild. Anyway, you'll see them when you come back for your birthday party next weekend. Don't remind me about that. Why not? You'll understand when you reach my grand old age. We've all got to 10.30 at some point. I'm just glad it's you and not me. Her eyes sparkle as she smiles at me. Is this where you remind me that you're 21 months younger than me and already have a husband and family? I tease. I need to rub something in your face. We can't all be fabulous girls on the town like you, you know. I'm hardly that. You are. You run your own gallery, you're always out with your friends, and you live in London, the most exciting city in the world. I tell you, if I didn't love these little darlings of mine as much as I do, I'd swap with you in a heartbeat. No, you wouldn't. She gazes at her daughter, her features softening. No, you're right. She reaches for her baby and I plant a kiss on the soft skin of Persephone's forehead, breathing in her delicious baby scent before I hand her back to Fenella. Who were you here with last night? Mummy mentioned it was a man and that he was rather yummy. I raise my brows in surprise, a smile forcing its way onto my lips. Yummy? She said that. Oh, yes. He looked like a young Keanu Reeves, she said, to which I asked her did she mean Matrix Keanu or Bill and Ted Keanu, because those are two very different creatures, and I know which one I'd prefer. So, who was this yummy Keanu? 
I glance at the reception room door to check we're alone, which of course I know we are. It's an instinctual thing. It was Noah Grant, I tell her, my voice lowered, because of course my parents will be able to hear me in a house the size of a large office block. Noah Grant? She asks blankly. Should I know him? Oh, is he famous? Is he Hugh Grant's son? You know, Noah. I shoot her a meaningful look. When she still gives me a blank stare, I say, the guy I went out with when I was a teenager. Realization dawns on her face. Oh, Noah, Noah, as in your ex-boyfriend Noah, the village boy you went out with one summer. I nod. For over a year, actually. Her eyes widen. Over a year? You dark horse, Tabby. There was a lot of sneaking around. I bet there was. Gosh, she replies, clearly taken aback. How the heck did that happen? Mummy said the man here last night was an art dealer. Your Noah was going to be a mechanic or something, wasn't he? He's not anymore. She raises her brows. Really? Well, that's a turn up for the books. Mummy clearly had no idea it was him, which is weird considering all the drama back then. They really didn't like him, did they? I pull my lips into a line at the memories. No. She leans back in her seat and rests Persephone against her chest. I knew Noah had left Marlingworth, but I thought it was because he was heartbroken over losing you, not because he was going off to become an art dealer. He wasn't heartbroken. That day I went to break up with him. He ended things with me. Are you telling me you did a conscious uncoupling Gwyneth Paltrow style? I scoff. Hardly. It was the usual teenage angst stuff. I thought your Noah was probably going to do mechanic things somewhere else after Daddy went to see his father. How utterly bizarre that he's now back as something completely different. Daddy did what? I ask, suddenly cold. Didn't you know? Know what? I ask. It was quite the drama at the time. I would have thought you'd have known. I fix her with my older sister, Glare. Fenella, tell me. All right. She shifts her daughter so she can lean closer to me. After you two broke up, Noah turned up at the house all bereft and Heathcliffy. I blink at her in disbelief. Heathcliffy? You know, all romantically heroic like Heathcliff, only much cuter. I slumped back in my seat. He did that? When? She shrugs. I don't know. After you'd left for Edinburgh. I chew on my lip. After Noah had turned around and broken up with me that day, I told my family I was going to leave for Edinburgh a day early. I didn't want to stick around, feeling heartbroken over Noah. So I grabbed my things, hopped in my car, and left. Of course, I found out pretty quickly that leaving somewhere doesn't heal your heart, but I needed to do something. What did he say? I ask. Oh, things like how he couldn't live without you and how he knew you'd only ended things with him to keep Mummy and Daddy happy. He had something with him too, a picture or something. I don't remember because it was raining and his shirt was clinging to him and that rather stole my attention. She waves her hand in front of her torso, where Persephone is now contentedly lying. I'd never seen so many muscles. You know, not in real life. She grins at me. Good score, sis. I pull my brows together. He was heartbroken? But he said he was going to break up with me if I hadn't broken up with him. I think of Noah. The boy who turned around and told me it was all over between us. That he was going to break up with me anyway and I'd simply beaten him to it. But now it's no longer how I remember it all. I swallow. The image of a young Noah, standing in the rain, 
telling my family he couldn't live without me pains my heart. It's like a scene from a romantic movie, only I missed it all. She scoffs. I may not be as worldly and glamorous as you, Tabby, but I know a heartbroken man when I see one. I've just been watching a lot of Gossip Girl. She gives me a sage look, as though watching Gossip Girl teaches you about life. It barely registers. My mind is spinning. Despite what he said that day, he turned up here, blaming my parents for it all. I have questions, a lot of questions. What did he say exactly? Try to remember, Fen. Oh, I can't remember. He was upset and angry with Mummy and Daddy, although why, I don't know. They didn't like him, but it's not as though they pulled the rifle on him and told him to leave you alone. They may as well have. What did he bring that day? As I said, I didn't pay much attention. Far too many muscles to concentrate on the gift, remember? She waves her hand over her middle again. I've got too much on my mind to think about Noah's abs, sexy as they may be. You said Daddy marched him off the property and went to see his father. Yes, Daddy bragged about it when he got home, said Noah wouldn't be darkening our door again. You know how he loves to be dramatic. She lets out a laugh. More fool him for inviting him into the house last night. What a laugh. Yeah. More fool him, I repeat absent-mindedly. How did you not tell me any of this back then? Didn't I tell you? No, Fen. I think I would have remembered that. She shrugs. You dumped him. I suppose I didn't think you'd care to know. You'd left for university and moved on with Magnus within a few weeks. Only I hadn't moved on. I still haven't moved on. So, are you and Noah back on or something? She asks. Butterflies in my belly spring into action. I put on my best poker face. We're here to see an artist in Dalton. Noah came to the gallery and asked me to set something up with the artist. It's work. She arches a brow at me. Work? Is that so hard to believe? Am I blushing? I'm sure I'm blushing. Oh, I believe it all right. Only tell me, much older sister of mine, how many galleries are there in London exactly? Why are you asking that? There have to be thousands, and yet somehow, your magic Mike, the man who swore he'd love you forever, chose your gallery. Coincidence? I think not. She's got a point. But instead of dwelling on the thought that had already occurred to me, I make a joke. Are you telling me he did a sexy magic mic dance in the rain that day? How wonderful would that have been? She lets out a laugh, and Persephone gurgles with laughter too. My baby loves it when I laugh. I smile at the two of them, my mind a buzz. Well, you should make sure you do it all the time, Fen because her laugh is the best sound in the world. The door to the reception room swings open and Mummy waltzes in. Tabitha, you're still here? Her eyes glide over me. And wearing the same clothes as yesterday, I see. You know I didn't bring anything to change into because I didn't know I'd be staying, Mummy. I glance at the time on my phone and notice a string of messages in my London Babes WhatsApp group, all wanting to know what happened with Noah and where we stayed and all the juicy details. I'm leaving shortly. In fact, I might go and wait outside and check in with the artist we're going to see today. Is it all right if I leave Echo here and pop back and get her? Fine, fine. Mummy replies as she pulls herself a cup of tea from the pot and takes a seat. I plant a kiss on Persephone's head. Bye, gorgeous niece. Have fun with your new work, colleague, Fenella says to me, her eyes wide in mock innocence. I shoot her a warning look. Thanks, Fen.
We'll see you next weekend for your birthday party, Mummy says. I can't wait, I tell her. I give my mother an awkward squeeze and she says brusquely, All right, off you go. Greens don't favour physical touch. Thanks for having me to stay. This is your home, Tabitha, she replies with a stretched smile. And what a warm and loving home it is, too. I bid everyone goodbye and walk out into the warm morning sun. I lean up against the stone wall and let what my sister told me sink in. Noah came here after we'd broken up, with a gift for me, was sent summarily away, and then Daddy said something to his father. I let out a puff of air. That's a lot of new information. What happened to his calm, stony-faced nonchalance that day? The, I was going to break up with you anyway, line he gave me. People who act like that don't usually turn up at your house later and act all Heathcliffy, to quote Fenella. People who act like that have already emotionally left the building. When we were in the thick of our relationship, it felt like we'd never be apart. We'd even talked about being together forever. We'd made plans. I was going to go to university and get my science degree in marine biology. He was going to train as a mechanic, and one day, we'd get married and live together by the ocean, far away from Marlingworth and all the pressure my family and friends put on us. He'd run his own garage and I'd work with sea life doing amazing things. Absolutely none of that happened, of course. Well, other than me getting a science degree I've never once used, thanks to Daddy buying the gallery for me to run. How must Noah have felt, coming back to my family's home last night, knowing the last time he was here was that time in the rain? But if he'd felt anything, he didn't show it. Quite the opposite, in fact. He was so relaxed and at ease like none of it mattered anymore. And perhaps it doesn't. Perhaps what happened in the past is best left there. I let out a long breath. Trying to work Noah out could be a full-time occupation. I pull my phone from my bag and dial Jed's number, not expecting him to answer. He picks up after the third ring. Tabitha, it's you, he says in excitement. Hi, Jed. I'm checking to see if today is still on and if... This is brilliant. Brilliant. I can't even begin to tell you how utterly brilliant it is. What's brilliant? The work, the creation, the vision. It's... it's... Brilliant? I offer. Yes, exactly. That's what it is. Brilliant. I laugh because his excitement is infectious. What's going on? Your dog and the cat and the paint and everything. Brilliant. That's great to hear, Jed. You sound very excited. So it worked out. Excited? Excited? That's the understatement of the year? No, the decade. No, the century. I love what I've been able to create. Love it. You must come and see it. We're coming at midday, remember? If that's still okay with you. Midday. Yes, good. See you then. He hangs up and I smile to myself. Well, that's a turn up for the books. Maybe yesterday's disaster has turned into something positive for everyone. Noah will be pleased he was right. I suppose I'm the one who'll be buying a celebratory meal. It's not exactly a hardship. I pull up WhatsApp and begin to read through the screeds of messages that have pinged between my over-communicative friends, most of which are about me and Noah, and the fact we may or may not have spent the night together. I type my first response. Me. For your information, my lovely but incredibly nosy friends, I stayed the night at my parents' place and he was at a and b in the village. Kennedy. So, no waking up in the same bed with your limbs entwined and realizing he's the guy for you? Me. That was Lottie, not me. Lottie. Yeah, get your own love story, Tabitha. 
Zara. What's the vibe with him? Me. It was weird to start with, but now we're getting on quite well, actually. I press my lips together to suppress a smile. Getting on quite well is one way to put it, I suppose. Lottie. Because of the love. Kennedy. It's just work, remember? Zara. Work? We believe you, Tabitha, 100%. Me. Why does it feel like you don't believe me? Lottie. Because of the love. I shake my head as I snort with laughter. My friends are relentless. Me. Actually, I did learn something from my sister. Noah turned up at our house after I'd left for university, and Daddy sent him away and even went to talk to his father. Soon after, Noah was gone. Zara. Oh, my gosh. What did he say to him? Me. I don't know. Probably leave my daughter alone kind of thing. Nothing he hadn't said before. My parents weren't exactly Noah fans. Kennedy. Now that is some sweet drama right there. Zara. You need to ask Noah about it. I blink at my screen as my belly tightens. Me. No, I don't. Zara. Why not? As you said, it's all in the past. Me. I'm going now. Zara. Ask him. Lottie. And don't forget to give Noah a kiss from us. Kennedy. That's just weird, Lottie. Lottie. I meant she should kiss him. Kennedy. But from us? Lottie. No! Zara. Just kiss the guy. I don't reply. They're having way too much fun with this right now. I'll tell them the full story of my night last night when I see them next. If I type the words, and we kissed, WhatsApp might very well explode. Chapter 25 Slotting my phone into my handbag, I hear the sound of car tires on the gravel driveway and look up to see the now familiar black SUV. Noah pulls his car around the fountain and comes to a stop. Morning. Jump on in, he says breezily through the open window. I push thoughts of a heartbroken 18-year-old Noah from my mind. It won't be helpful to dwell on the past. Instead, I beam back at him as I pull the door open. Don't mind if I do. I climb in and settle into the leather seat and buckle up my seatbelt. I flash Noah a smile. Not knowing what the protocol is for seeing an ex-boyfriend you never got over and kissed last night. Do I kiss him? Shake his hand? Blurt out that I know he came to see me after our breakup and got sent away? Hmm. Not the last one. I land on a neutral topic of mutual interest. I've got to tell you about my conversation with Jed. Do I want to know after yesterday? He's excited. He said he loves what's come out of the incident and seemed pumped about the whole thing. Huh. Well, that's good. Let's hope. I'll take dinner any time this week. I grin at him, my belly doing flips. Just name the day. Did you have a good sleep at the pigeon? It was a comfortable room, and I got to catch up with Basil and Maisie, too. We stayed up late chatting. I've learned a lot about soft and the work they're doing. I raise an eyebrow. It's Basil and Maisie now, is it? Not Mr. and Mrs. Mayhew. Would you prefer Baz and... What is the shortened version of Maisie? Maze? I let out a laugh. Isn't Maze corn? I'm not sure Mrs. Mayhew would want to be named after a vegetable. I don't know. Pumpkin? I arch a brow at him. You called Mrs. Mayhew Pumpkin last night. Wow, you have become very chummy chummy with them. He lifts a shoulder in a shrug as he turns the wheel, and we begin to glide down the driveway. 
What can I say? They like me. They're good people with great taste. You really are so modest, Noah Grant. Did you know that? Just one of my many attributes, don't you know, Duchess? He's got a glint in his eye as he turns to me, his lips curved into a fresh smile. It makes butterflies dance in my belly, and we share a look that pulls all the wonderful memories from last night back to me. I like it when you call me Duchess. I like that I can call you that again. We share a goofy smile. Swoon, swoon, swoon. This feels amazing. That's great, but maybe you should watch the road, I say in a hurry. Oops. He snaps his gaze from me and straightens the car so we are no longer in fear of veering off the driveway and into the adjacent parkland. And here I was, still feeling embarrassed I'd forgotten to put petrol in my car back in the day. You were about to drive into a field. He lets out a belly laugh, and it tickles my insides. You know, I couldn't stop smiling when I thought of you last night, he tells me. You mean when you weren't chatting with Baz and Maze slash Pumpkin? Oh, I thought of you then, particularly because my good friend Maisie wanted to talk about you. She did. He turns off onto the country lane, and we begin the drive to Dalton. You can't be surprised. I'm not, really. Mrs. Mayhew, as I respectfully call her, is rather interested in knowing everything that's going on in the village, even for us visitors. She sure got her finger on the pulse. She thinks we make a lovely couple, by the way. He uses air quotes. I got that last night. She's got us married off and having kids already. And moving to Marlingworth to take advantage of the early bird special at the Noble Pigeon, of course. Of course, I reply, allowing myself to enjoy the idea for a moment. That is, before I remind myself that we've only just reconnected after all this time, and I don't even know what Noah's thinking, let alone planning what to get from the kids' menu. Did she name the children by any chance? because that would be very useful to know. Oscar and Grace for the twins. We're having twins, I guffaw, giddy with the whole direction of this conversation. Yes, but only after we've named our firstborn after her if it's a girl, or after her husband if it's a boy. Basil, I have to draw the line at naming my child after a herb, not that I've anything against Basil. Basil the name or the herb? Both. He lets out a laugh. <laughs> I kind of like it. Basil Grant has a certain ring to it. Yeah, for a 70-year-old, the poor kid would get beaten up at school every day of his life. Good thing we don't have a kid named Basil then, right? We share a smile. Right. The car winds down the familiar country lane with its stone fences, lines of hedges, and rolling green hills. I don't come home to this part of the country as often as I once did, and I feel suddenly nostalgic for the easy, outdoorsy life here. If it's okay with you, I promised my good friends Baz and Mays that I'd bring you by the pub for coffee this morning. Okay, then. His eyes lock with mine and he smiles. Okay, then, he repeats. And we have another moment. Any concerns I might have entertained that things might be weird between us today have well and truly been dispelled. We arrive in the village a couple of minutes later, and Noah parks the car right outside the noble pigeon. How about we say hello and then we can have coffee outside? Noah suggests at the entrance to the pub. As long as you let me shout, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Echo's little escapade at Jed's yesterday, so it's on me. I think I can let you buy me a coffee. He pulls the door open and holds it for me. After you. Because I'm a fake duchess, I tease. Something like that. We step into a hubbub of people talking, some loudly, 
all grouped around the bar. It's the protesters from yesterday. They've discarded their placards on the tables, clearly ready to protest once more. Look, it's the tree committee, I say to Noah. Soft. I snort giggle. They have got to change that. That's the thing, Dot is saying to the gathered protesters. If we all do it together, there's no way they'll be able to kill that poor tree. And Barnabas Babington's living monument will, well, live. But Dot, what I'm worried about is that the ropes might burn. I've got very delicate skin, you know. I bruise like a peach. Nigel complains, and several members of the group agree. I raise my brows at Noah. Ropes? Maybe they plan on tying themselves to the tree, he replies. We all know it needs to be chains to be truly authentic. Mrs. Mayhew appears holding a large tray, heavy laden with cups and saucers filled with tea and coffee that she somehow manages not to spill as she places them on the table in the midst of the group. Teas are on this side, coffee's on that one, sugar on the table and milk in the jug. Lovely. Thank you, Maisie, Dot replies. The protesters start selecting their hot drinks. Mrs. Mayhew spots Noah and me and sidles up to us. She greets us both with a warm hug, although she only saw Noah last night. What do you think of this hullabaloo then, Tabitha? I think it's terrible that someone wants to build on the field and cut down that beautiful tree, I reply. That tree means a lot to some people, doesn't it? She says, her eyes flicking between the two of us. She'd never be called Maisie Subtle Mayhew, that's for sure. Heat begins to grow in my cheeks. It's a very beautiful tree and should be preserved along with the field. She examines me with an amused grin. That's very true, my dear. Very true indeed. Now, what will you have? We've got the full English with Hamish's black pudding if you're hungry, or toast and marmalade and a pot of tea. I think we're going to go for coffee this morning, please, Maisie. Noah replies. All right. Well, why don't you come and sit up at the bar while I make it for you? We can have a good old catch up. We sit down on a couple of bar stools and Mrs. Mayhew proceeds to tell us all about everyone in the village. She starts with Hamish the butcher, who makes the famous black pudding, but whose wife left him for the supermarket owner. Hamish is now quite rightly boycotting the supermarket and resorting to growing his own veggies and baking his own bread. Then she proceeds to tell us about how Charlene, the florist, has had a baby boy who's got the longest lashes she's ever seen. Wasted on a boy, Tabitha. Wasted. And more significantly, doesn't look anything like Charlene's husband, which is mighty suspicious in her eyes. Then she moves on to the fact that Nigel has stepped down as the leader of Soft and been replaced by Dot, which everyone saw coming a country mile off. We knew about that one, I tell her. We were there when it happened. Eventually, she makes our coffee and seems to exhaust her gossiping, and we seize the chance to take our drinks outside, where we sit at one of the empty picnic tables. I take a sip of my coffee and gaze across the table at the view. At Noah, that is. The best view I've had in a long, long time. We sit together. Our fingers entwined as we talk about Jed and Echo and a bunch of random things. I know there's so much left unsaid between us, not to mention Fenella's revelation from only an hour ago. But being here with Noah where it all began feels perfect, right? So, Tabitha Green, tell me what you've been up to over the last 12 years or so. How long have you got? He grins. About an hour. Twelve years is a long time, 
I wouldn't even know where to start. How about you start at the beginning? As in, when we broke up? I ask, not wanting to go there now, or ever again. Let's fast forward a few weeks, save us all the teenage drama. I let out a relieved laugh. Well, as you know, I went off to university in Edinburgh. It was lots of fun, even though it was freezing cold. But I did end up with a science degree to show for it, so that's something. Edinburgh is a great city. I went there a few years ago for the festival. It's got such a great vibe, doesn't it? Okay, what did you do next? Next, I took a trip with Prue through Asia. We went to Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, Malaysia, Singapore, and did a couple of months in India, ending up on the beach in Goa. That sounds amazing. What was your favorite place? That is such a hard question to answer. There are so many amazing places there. The Taj Mahal is so stunning, with its eggshell-like exterior. Prue and I pose for selfies like Lady Di. Lady Di posed at the Taj Mahal? You know, that famous picture of her looking beautiful and sad sitting in front of it. He gives me a blank stare. Google it, I tell him. It's iconic. I also loved the beaches in Thailand and the royal palace in Bangkok. Oh, and those floating markets they have where you can get all the fresh fruit and roasted bugs you could ever want. I'd have to say the roasted bugs would be a hard pass for me. Don't knock it till you try it. You tried them? No! Ugh! I pull a face and Noah laughs. What else? Ho Chi Minh City has this gorgeous old architecture, and everyone rides around on bicycles or motorbikes. It's mayhem. The women wear these wide-brimmed hats and long gloves up to here. I indicate my upper arm, so they don't get tanned, which of course Prue and I laughed about because we spent half our time on the gorgeous golden Vietnamese beaches, roasting ourselves to a crisp under the sun. Like the bugs? I snort giggle. Yeah, like the bugs. So that trip was for six months, right? What did you do next? I moved to London, got the gallery, and have been living and working there ever since. There you go. My life in a nutshell. Not a bad nutshell. How did you manage to buy a gallery? You'd have been what, 23 or 24 at the time? I was 23. That's pretty young to own a gallery, especially in London. I suppose. Daddy bought it for me. His features change. Right. But he lets me run it the way I want to, so it really is my gallery. I reply firmly, because 496 is my gallery, in all but name. It's just I don't own it on paper, that's all. I make all the decisions and pay the staff and balance the books. Yeah, I get it. It's your gallery. It is. He studies my face for a beat before he lifts his lips in a smile and says, I'm happy for you. You're lucky to have such a generous dad who's in a position to do that for you. Things have taken a turn for uncomfortable right now. I don't need to be reminded of my privilege with him. What about boyfriends? He asks. You want my full dating history? Just the highlight package. Well, I suppose there have been one or two. Nothing serious. Nothing? I chew on my lip. Well, there was one guy, but it was all a horrible mistake. Is this the guy you were engaged to? My hand freezes in his. How did you know about that? My dad told me. Was it meant to be some big secret? No, I... I look down. We're being honest with one another, and I want to be open with him about this. I push out a breath and begin. I started seeing this guy not that long after we had broken up. 
We went out for a few years, and then when he asked me to marry him, everyone thought it was a great idea. Looking back, I realize I said yes to Magnus because I thought I ought to. And I know that sounds really awful, but when he asked me, it felt like the right thing to do. Everyone loved him. My family, my friends. Well, everyone except Zara. She thought he was a prize idiot. Zara always had her head screwed on right, he replies, and I'm relieved to hear a note of amusement in his voice. Emboldened by Fenella's revelation earlier today, I say, I know this is going to sound mad, but I think I said yes to Magnus because of us, because of you and me. Why? He was the guy my family approved of. And I was the one they didn't. I chew on my lip and nod. I want you to know it never felt right with him, and eventually I told him I couldn't go through with it. He, well, he never compared to you, Noah. Didn't even come close. I lift my gaze to his and see his eyes have softened. That's nice to hear. We share a smile and it's like the past has begun to unravel, taking its sting away so that its hold over us is becoming less and less. Your turn. Tell me what you've been doing for the last twelve years. A lot. Like? I lead. Like becoming an art dealer. Is he going to hold out on me after I've said what I said? That's all you're going to give me? You became an art dealer? Hello? I knew that already. I tease. I guess I changed a lot about my life after I knew you. I decided to leave Marlingworth soon after you went off to university. It felt like the right thing to do. But you had always wanted to become a mechanic and take your dad's garage over one day. What changed? He toys with my fingers, his eyes cast down. He looks back up at me. I guess being with you made me look at life differently. Want different things. I blink at him. You left Marlingworth because of me? In a way, yeah. You showed me that there were other paths. I saw that I might have been born into a certain life, but that shouldn't limit me. So I left. Got a job working on a cruise ship and ended up traveling the world. You worked on a cruise ship? How amazing! It was a lot of fun, and I got to see so many incredible places, places beyond Marlingworth and my dad's garage. I worked with a guy who liked to paint, like me, and he was saving his paycheck to put himself through art school in the States. It got me thinking. To make a long story short, I saved my money, applied to a bunch of schools, and ended up being accepted at one. You studied art in the States. Actually, I did both an undergrad and master's in art history at UCLA. My jaw drops. Literally. You have a master's in art. Art history. It's for those of us who like the idea of being able to paint, but can't really do it. I think of the artworks Noah used to paint when we were together. They were simple landscapes with exquisite detailing of the trees and fences and sheep. He had talent, that's for certain. Don't put yourself down. I love your art, and you've got stacks of talent. I know you gave me two paintings, if you recall, one for each of my birthdays. What happened to those paintings I made for you? Do you still have them? I press my lips together and nod. Admitting I've kept Noah's paintings after all these years tells him how much they meant to me, how much they still mean to me. The truth is, I kept the paintings because Noah painted them for me. I've never had anyone make anything for me before or since. They hold a special place in my heart. His lips curve into a smile. I'm glad to hear it. Why? because you'd hate me to have deprived the world of original Noah Grant artwork. Well, there's that, he replies with a laugh. 
And the fact you kept them all this time feels good. They mean a lot to me. I look up at him and find him smiling. They're on the wall in my flat. He lifts his lips in a smile. That's nice to know. You'll have to show me where. I will. We share a moment, and I know there's no looking back for us now. We've admitted the impact we've had on one another's lives. Moving ahead seems so much more straightforward now. There's one more thing I need to know. Noah, can I ask you a question? Shoot. It's something Fenn said to me earlier today, something I never knew about until a short while ago. I pause, not sure how to ask the question that's been rolling around in my head all morning. Are you gonna spill the tea or do I have to guess? Fenn said you came to the big house after we'd broken up and Daddy made you leave. She said he went to see your dad. Is it true? He lets out a breath. Yeah, I did do that. I was upset and I wanted to see you before you left. Your dad told me you'd already gone. Stupid, I know. My heart breaks for him. Noah, I'm so sorry. I never knew. No one told me. Well, I guess you know now. I was a bit of a soap opera star that day. He's making light of what must have been a very painful experience for him. I push myself up, lean across the table, and kiss him lightly on the lips. I'm sorry. Yeah, me too. Breaking up is never easy. I sit back down and ask, what did Daddy say to your father? He made it pretty clear I wasn't the kind of guy he wanted around his daughter. I close my eyes and shake my head. That's awful. Hey, what's done is done. The joke's on him now anyway, since he doesn't seem to remember me. How many heartbroken guys have turned up at your place exactly? I know he's making a joke, but it doesn't help this feel any better. I grip his hand and say, Noah, I... I break off, suddenly shy. Tell me, he says, and the tenderness in his voice dispels any fears I held about opening up to him, to making myself vulnerable with him. I was going to say that I'm really pleased we've reconnected like this, after all that terrible business back then. It's nice, more than nice. He reaches out and touches my cheek. You know, Duchess... I've been thinking a lot about you since I saw you at Evelyn and Stanley's wedding. Enter the butterflies in my belly. Full freaking force. You have? I need to admit something to you. After seeing you that day, I asked around and found out that you ran 496. It wasn't a coincidence that I made the booking to meet with you. Oh, be still my beating heart. Vanilla was right. I wanted to see you again. And the fact we've ended up here together, well, that's been a wonderful turn of events I had only ever hoped for. Heat radiates through me, and my face lights up in a beaming smile. Can this really be happening? I've never stopped thinking about you since then, Noah. In fact, I've thought about you a lot over the last 12 years, when you just seemed to disappear. You tried to stalk me, huh? He teases and I snort giggle. No more than anyone else with access to social media. It's his turn to push himself up and lean into me, brushing his lips against mine. Can I ask you something? Is there anything else left? I ask, giddy. I'm not sure what you've got planned in the next while but I was wondering if you'd like to reconnect with me some more while we're back in London. Exhilaration bubbles up inside of me. Maybe. He raises his brows at me. Maybe. That'd be dandy. He returns my smile. Good, he says, 
holding my gaze as my heart beats hard in my chest, full to the brim with Noah. Chapter 26 Who knew Noah would come back to me? After all these years, after all the times I regretted ending things with him, now we're here, together, where it all began. The past has been left where it belongs, and now we can move on, together. And it feels incredible. Arriving in Dalton after the short drive from Marlingworth, we reach Jed's house at the end of the mews. I know you said Jed was super amped, but... Let's hope this goes better than yesterday, Noah says to me. I scrunch my eyes shut in mortification at the memory. I love that dog, but it could have been a total disaster. We are so lucky he's not angry. Or worse. Exactly. I pull the lever, and a moment later, Jed opens the door with a theatrical flourish, his eyes wild, his hair even more dock from Back to the Future than it was yesterday. Only this time it's got flecks of green and blue paint stuck in it. You're back, he pronounces, his eyes bright. Something brushes past my leg and I look down to see Petrov, Jed's cat, slink past. He's still flecked with paint. It's great to see you, Jed. I'm so glad things sound like they've worked out after what happened yesterday. He takes me by the arm and leads me inside. Yesterday was nothing short of extraordinary for me. No, no, that's the wrong word. It was revolutionary. That's it. Yesterday was revolutionary. I glance back at Noah, who's walking down the hallway behind us. He mock wipes his brow in relief. That's wonderful to hear, Noah tells him. I've been working all night, haven't had a wink of sleep. He blinks at me a few times, his face bright. Not a wink! You seem pumped, I reply. Oh, I am completely pumped. I've created what I think could be a new turning point, a new springboard for my work. Come, come. He gestures for Noah and me to follow him into his studio where the canvas echo ran across with wet paws, still lies. Today, however, it looks a lot less like a mistake and more like an actual work of art. Both Echo's and the cat's paw prints are still discernible, only now they look purposeful, as though they were always part of his plan to be precisely where they're positioned. I look from the painting to Jed, my jaw slack. This is just beautiful, I exclaim in astonishment. You did all this last night. He nods his head rapidly, his eyes wide with excitement. I can't believe it. I take in the huge canvas lying on the floor before us. As with all of Jed's work, it's colourful and bold, but he's held back enough for it to avoid being garish or tacky. The result is uplifting, exciting, and, from my gallerist perspective, completely saleable. He's incorporated the animal's paw prints as part of a wider pattern that arcs across the entire canvas, starting at one corner and finishing at another. And it's all done with strong brushstrokes, balanced with intricate detailing, right down to his characteristic figures, partially obscured by one of the prints. Is that one of your famous miniatures? I point at the figure. Jed grins at me, his exuberance seeping from every pore. It wouldn't be a Jed without one, would it? Prue would be happy to see one of her favourite non-Smurfs. No, you're right, I reply, grinning back at him. It's hard not to get swept up in his obvious euphoria, and why would I not want to? Thanks to recent Noah-related events... I'm feeling pretty euphoric myself. This is simply the icing on the cake. Noah is examining the artwork with a look of wonder on his face. He catches my eye and smiles, telling me just how much he likes it too. It's mesmerizing, he says. Jed, I love what you've done. 
It's a new direction for you, but still rooted in your signature style. I grin. I agree. You've really made some magic with this. I love it. He beams at us both like we're his stern parents, offering him long-awaited praise. I know. Me too. I love everything about it. The colors, the direction, the feel. I'm so excited about this, he exclaims as he jumps up and down on the spot, like his feet are connected to a couple of springs, Tom Cruise surfing the sofa style. It still needs some work, but I've got the foundations here. Tell me this. Why didn't I invite animals into my studio a long time ago? I don't know, I reply with a happy shrug, but he's on a roll. Animals are dynamic. Animals are action. He slaps his hands together and slides the top one off to illustrate his point. They have this primal raw energy that lights up the space, that brings out my own energy, you know? He grins at us before adding, So... I'm going to need your dog again. Like, now. Where is she? I'm so sorry, Jed. I didn't bring Echo today. I thought after yesterday that, well, it might be best to leave her elsewhere. But can't you see? He opens his arms wide. This came from the paws. This. The paws are everything. The paws are everything? Petrov slinks into the room and Jed scoops him up and holds him aloft. Perfect timing, Petrov, O oh bearer of the paws. The cat looks blankly at him and then glances nonchalantly around the room. Petrov clearly isn't as excited about all this as others in the room are. But then, he is a cat. And he did get chased by an over-eager Australian Kelpie through this very room only yesterday. With no dog, Petrov, you are it. You must help me tap into my primal self. Your paws are the key. Another bored stare from the cat. Jed pulls him against his chest and gives him a squeeze before placing the cat, who clearly doesn't care about Jed's primal anything, back on the floor. All three of us watch as he saunters across the canvas, sniffs a couple of spots, and then flops down on it and promptly begins to clean himself. Jed claps his hands together in glee. Isn't this incredible? We watch the cat as he drags a piece of grass from his fur and spits it onto the canvas. Yes, it is, I reply dubiously. Totally, Noah echoes. Jed lets out a sigh as the cat lifts his leg into the violin pose and continues his grooming. Petrov, 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 you've been my cat for seven years and only now I realise how important you are to my creative process. Noah clears his throat. <clears throat> Jed, can I ask you a question? Jed reluctantly pulls his attention from Petrov to Noah. Is it too early to ask if you're planning on selling this once it's done? Noah asks, cutting to the chase. As you know, my client is very interested in your work, and I suspect he'll love what you've done here. Absolutely. I'm planning on a whole series of paw-inspired work, starting with this. He does a sweeping gesture at the canvas. Only to Tabitha's gallery, though. I don't like to deal with the others. They're all too self-consciously hip, you know? Oh, I know. Noah replies with a grin, his eyes flashing to mine. Thank goodness you're not self-consciously hip, Tabitha. I'm not hip in the least, I reply, before I let out a thoroughly contented laugh. The echo-related disaster has worked out so much better than I could have expected. Jed is inspired, and Noah is getting what he came here for, which I'd begun to realise is a whole lot more than just some of Jed's artwork for his client. And I could not be happier about it. Chapter 27 Cupping my chamomile tea in my hands, 
I lean back against the sofa cushion in my Notting Hill flat and allow the huge grin I've been wearing since my visit to Dalton and Marlingworth with Noah morph into a contented sigh. Echo raises her sleepy head, her ears pricked up, before she lowers it onto my lap. She must be getting used to this behaviour by now, since she was there when it all happened between us, and has been with me ever since. After we'd viewed Jed's new artwork and come to an agreement with him on his new Primal Paul series, a work in progress name, I hope, we collected Echo from my family's home and Noah drove all of us back to London. We talked the whole way, sharing stories from the last 12 years and making plans to see one another when our schedules would allow in the coming week. As I kissed him goodbye, I remembered to invite him to my 30th birthday party this coming Saturday and we agreed once more that despite the 16 bedrooms at my parents' house, he would stay with his good mates, Baz and Maisie, at the Noble Pigeon. We got away with my parents not putting current day and past Noah together, but there's no need to tempt fate. Now, grinning like the cat who drank all the cream, I've been filling my friends in on the weekend's events, and they've been appropriately enthralled and excited for me, particularly since I'm the only single one among us. Does he kiss you like you remembered? Lottie asks. Belly-dwelling butterflies flap their wings at the memories. Oh yes, only better. Better how? Technique, expertise, passion level? Zara questions. Passion level? Kennedy repeats with a laugh. How can you make something so fun and sexy sound so clinical, Z? Like you can rate the passion on a scale. Or a multi-choice questionnaire, Lottie suggests. It's a perfectly reasonable question, Zara replies. Tabitha has kissed Noah before, and now she's kissed him again. She's got the perfect comparison. Kennedy lets out a laugh. <laughs> okay, I've got it. Tabitha, how satisfied were you with the passion level in your kiss with Noah? One dissatisfied. It was so much better when I was a teenager. Two, neutral. It was pretty much the same. Or three, ecstatic. The kiss was a significant improvement. You girls are hilarious, I deadpan. We know, but that doesn't answer the question, Kennedy replies pointedly. Do I have to rate it at a one, two, or three, or can I just tell you? I ask. Tell us, and don't spare the details, Lottie insists. I let out another contented sigh as I get momentarily lost in the kisses Noah and I have been sharing, and there have been a few. From that first kiss under the oak tree by the river, to the last kiss he gave me in his car on the street outside my flat when he dropped me off last night. I hold up my hand, showing my friends four fingers. A four? But that's not even on Kennedy's scale, Zara says, her eyes wide. Yup, kissing Noah has replaced Chardonnay and chocolate as my favorite thing, I tell them. Lottie moves forward in her seat. And you're now seeing one another, as in, you're now a thing? We've talked about seeing each other again tomorrow, and we've messaged about a gazillion times in the last 24 hours, so it feels like we're a thing. Lottie claps her hands together in glee. Oh, Tabitha, I am so happy for you. Zara puts her hand up in the air. I've got a question. I snort laugh, and it reminds me of Noah. Heck. Everything reminds me of Noah. What's your question? Are you sure you're falling for Noah and not just the memories of him? She asks. That's a good question, Kennedy says with a sage nod of her head. No, it's not. The heart wants what the heart wants. And Tabitha's heart wants Noah in the past, the present, and in the future. Lottie declares. Isn't that right, babe? 
The cynical, snarky version of me would have scoffed at her saying something quite so schmaltzy, but I'm not that person anymore. It's like Noah coming back into my life has reminded me how to be open, how to be happy, how to love. A fresh grin claims my face. I'm sure. He's still the same amazing person I knew back then, but he's a man now, not just a boy. Kennedy waggles her brows. Ooh, saucy. Tabitha's got herself a man. A man who kisses like a four out of three on the passion scale, Zara adds. Kennedy grins at me as she fans her face. Lucky, lucky girl. And there I go again, thinking about kissing Noah. Really, it's the next best thing to actually kissing him. Lottie's hand is placed across her heart. Oh, it's so romantic. Noah's your one that got away, but now you've got him back. That doesn't happen to many people, you know. The one that got away usually stays away, living on only in memory. But not for you. Your first love might end up being your forever love. Have you thought about that? Of course she hasn't, Lottie. It's only been a few days since they first kissed, remember? That's far too early for Tabitha to know anything, Zara pronounces with pragmatic confidence. Yes, but when you know, you know, you know, Lottie replies. I blink at her as I try to comprehend all the you knows. I'm not sure I know, Kennedy says with a laugh. It's like when I first kissed James at the Valentine's Day thing in the country. It was as though there was a direct link between my lips and my heart, telling me that he was the one for me. It was as simple as that, Zara asks. She gives a single nod of her head. Yup, as simple as that. So, Tabitha, do you know? Kennedy asks. With each drum of my heart, I know one thing for certain. I'm powerless to resist him. He's the one who has held my heart in his hands since that summer we first fell in love. And all that's happened now that he's back in my life is that I can finally admit to those deeply buried feelings. The feelings that meant I was never truly happy without him. The feelings that meant no man could ever compare, no matter how much I told myself they could. The feelings that told me breaking up with Noah was the worst decision of my life, one I have regretted every day of my life since. Through bad dates, my short-lived engagement to Magnus, and all my parting. Oh my, she does! She knows! Lottie proclaims as she and my other two friends watch me. A fresh, beaming smile claims my face, heat radiating through me. It reaches down my limbs and touches all the way to my fingers and toes. It's always been Noah, I say simply, because it has, always. Lottie lets out a squeal that has Echo pushing off my thigh and bouncing onto her four paws, her bleary eyes searching the living room for the imminent threat. Ow! I rub my thigh as Lottie collects me in a hug, followed quickly by Kennedy and Zara. We are so happy for you. Zara says, you totally deserve all the happiness in the world, girl, Kennedy adds. Lottie just makes weird noises that tell me she's ecstatically pleased for me, too. Okay, girls, enough, I say as I push them gently away. I might be starting something new and wonderful with my ex, but I'd prefer not to be suffocated before I get the chance. He's not just your ex, he's your one that got away, Lottie corrects. My one that got away, I concede, and I'm rewarded with, or punished by, depending on your point of view, a fresh squeal from Lottie that prompts Echo into a bark fest.
I leap from my seat to get a hold on her collar and stroke her fur to calm her, saying, It's okay, Echo, it's just Lottie making toddler noises. They're not toddler noises, she protests. Eventually, Echo settles back down again with her head on my lap, satisfied the squealing Lottie isn't going to murder us all. You're so good with her, Zara tells me. Good thing, considering I've agreed to have her for the week, I reply. Why? What happened to your neighbour? Zara asks. I don't think she's coping that well, to be honest. She's taken the children to stay with her mum up in Hartford, the mum who's developed some weird allergy to dogs that sounds totally dubious to me. But that means I get to hang out with this darling girl. She came to the gallery with me today. Tabitha, I know you try to hide it, but you are good people, Kennedy states. That definitely deserves chocolate. Zara rips the cellophane wrapper off the box of chocolates she brought over and proceeds to hand them around the room. Oh, chewy caramels coated in milk chocolate. My faves, Kennedy says as she selects hers. I bow, that's why I got them, Zora replies, her mouth stuffed with the aforementioned chewy caramels coated in milk chocolate. I raise a brow at her as I take a couple of chocolates for myself. That's easy for you to say, Z. Zara snort laughs. And once again, I think of Noah. Jeez, I've got it so bad and I don't even care. Have you invited Noah to your birthday party this Saturday? Kennedy asks. Oh, I hope so. I need to grill this man good. Zara's face is alight. I look at her in alarm. There will be no grilling, thank you very much, especially not at my party. I pull a face as a sinking feeling claims my belly. In all the Noah-induced excitement, I almost forgot. I'm turning 30 in only five days. Babe, it's really not that bad. We're all 30 and look at us, Lottie says. I look around at my friends. Each one has chocolate on their face, and both Kennedy and Zara are working on the chewy caramels. Yeah, you're all so very mature. Maturity's not all it's cracked up to be, you know, Kennedy replies. Lottie muses. I wonder what Noah will give you for your birthday. Something romantic, I'm sure, like Asher did at Zara's party. Zara smiles at the memory. The perfume bottle. I don't know. Maybe some chains? I suggest, and wait for their reaction. Chains? What the? As in necklaces? <laughs> None of the above, I reply with a laugh. It's a joke about how he suggested we chain ourselves to this tree in our village to stop the developers from chopping it down to build new luxury townhouses. Kennedy gives me a quizzical look. Why would you go doing something like that? Because it's a beautiful old tree, that's why. It was planted by Barnabas Babington many years ago. I can't quite believe I'm quoting Dot. Who's Barnabas Babington when he's at home? Lottie questions. I shrug. I have no clue. Kennedy places the chocolate box on the coffee table. So let me get this straight. You and Noah are going to chain yourselves to a tree because it's beautiful and was planted by some guy with a funny name many years ago? That does not seem super romantic to me. But hey, you do you. It's more than that. The tree means something to us. It's, well, it's where we first kissed all those years ago and where we both used the L word for the first time. Now that's romantic, Lottie declares once more. By saving the tree, you're saving your love for one another. It's totally symbolic. That's right. The tree is a symbol of your love, Kennedy says. The old cynical Tabitha rears her head. Now that's just too sappy. 
sappy tree, I get it, Kennedy replies. Oh, I laugh, unintentional, promise. Zara pulls her brows together. But you're not really going to chain yourselves to the tree, are you? We're going to join the protesters in Marlingworth at the weekend. We agreed on our way back here when I invited Noah to my party. My belly does a gymnastic flip at the thought of Noah in a dinner suit. We'll join you, won't we, girls? Zara says. We'll do what? Kennedy asks. We'll all be up there anyway. We would may as well join in the fun. What will we be doing? Zara asks. There's no way I'm chaining myself to some tree, no matter how much it means to Tabitha, Kennedy warns. We won't be doing that. We'll be walking around with placards, chanting, that sort of thing. I tell them, it'll be fun. Lottie pulls her lips together. I'll come along, but I'm not sure James will be too keen on doing anything political in another town. He is deputy mayor of London. Is he really? We didn't know. Zara's eyes are dancing with mischief, and she wins a gentle bat on the arm from Lottie. My doorbell chimes and Echo lifts her head and instantly begins to growl. It's okay, girl, I tell her as I spring to my feet and head to the door. She trails after me. Who's that? Lottie asks. Are you expecting anyone? Because it's already 9.30 at night, Kennedy warns. It's probably Maya. I'll bet she's forgotten one of the kids' toys and had to come back to get it, I reply as I swing the door open. But it's not Maya. It's Noah. Hi, I breathe my heart in my mouth at the sight of him. He's clearly been at work. He's wearing a lilac button-up shirt, open at the neck, under a black jacket that confirms my suspicions of just how gorgeous he's going to look in a dinner suit at my party. His dark hair is tussled, and his square jawline is lightly stubbled. In short, he looks good enough to eat. How yourself? He replies, his face creased in a sexy grin. What are you doing here? I didn't think I was seeing you until tomorrow. I've been at a work dinner and thought I'd stop by on my way back to my flat. I can leave if you prefer, he offers, his lips curved upwards, his eyes bright. I stand up on my tippy toes and brush a kiss against his lips. Don't you dare. Echo's tail bangs against my leg as she gazes up at Noah. He crouches down and pats her. Hey, girl, what are you doing here? Maya went to her mum and dad's and I said I'd care for her for the week. He straightens back up. Lucky Echo. We share a smile, my heart still going all kinds of crazy at the unexpected sight of him. Hello, a voice says behind me and I turn to see that all three of my friends have clamoured from the living room and crowded into my small hallway to get a look at him. Hey there, Noah says with a smile. I'm sorry, I didn't know you had company. It's fine, we were just catching up on news, Lottie declares. Why don't you come through to the living room and have a chat? Noah's eyes flick to mine. As long as I'm not intruding. You're not, I tell him with a squeeze to his arm. It's nice to have you here. He shrugs. Well, in that case, sure. Good. I'm Lottie, by the way. We met briefly at Stanley's wedding at the Black Cat. Lottie extends her hand and they shake. I remember. Nice to see you again, Lottie. And I know this face. He gestures at Zara who greets him with a kiss to the cheek. How are you, Zara? I'm great, she tells him. It's been a while. Noah's eyes flick to mine once more. Too long. A fresh smile claims my face as those belly-dwelling butterflies of mine bounce off the walls. I'm Kennedy. My boyfriend Charlie and I talked to you at the bar at the Black Cat once. 
you probably don't remember. Cottage pie, right? Noah replies. She rolls her eyes. You do remember. Charlie's obsessed. Why don't you come and sit down, Noah? Lottie offers, as though this were her place and not mine. Sure thing. Lottie and Zara lead him into the living room while Kennedy puts her hand on my arm and says under her breath, Booty call? No, we're so much more than that. It's 9.30 on a Monday night, babe. He said he just wanted to see me. I look over at Noah and catch his eye. He shoots me a quick smile before he returns his attention to the conversation with my other two friends. Kennedy cocks an eyebrow. Okay, I get it. The way he looks at you. What? Lucky girl. She replies with a grin, and I know my cheeks are flushing. Kennedy and I take our seats in my small living room, rendered smaller by Noah's six-foot-three muscular frame, and conversation turns to gleaning as many facts about Noah as is humanly possible. Are you single? Yes. Have you been married before? No. Any children we should be aware of? None. Any children we shouldn't be aware of? I have no children, period. But do you want to have children? Yes. What are your intentions towards Tabitha? To get to take her out on a date without getting the third degree from her friends? Although I know his response is tongue-in-cheek, the last one sparks me into action. It's time to intervene before the poor guy gets completely scared off by the third degree. The girls have agreed to come to the protest with us on Saturday, I say as I glare at my friends. That's awesome. You'll love the ragtag group there. They're really passionate about saving the tree and the field. The tree sounds truly amazing. Lottie leads, and I twist my mouth at her. Quite a special tree, I understand. It's beautiful, and it would be a crime if it were to be chopped down, he replies. Lottie leans back in her seat, a smile on her face. I thought you might say that, Noah. You did, he asks, his tone amused. We chat some more about the protest planning to be there for the afternoon before my party begins that night. After a while, Kennedy rises to her feet and gives an expansive yawn, complete with cat-like arm stretches. I'm beat. I think I'm gonna head home. I've got a lot of work to do in the morning. Lottie? Z? You coming? Zara bounces to her feet. Absolutely, I'm tired out too. Gosh. Is that the time? Lottie says, and before you can say, making a not-so-subtle exit so you two can be alone, they've said goodbye and are gone. I close the door over behind me and turn to find Noah standing in my hallway. It was a wonderful surprise to see you tonight, I say as we step into an embrace. I needed to tell you something. And it couldn't wait until our date tomorrow night. He brushes his lips against mine, making my whole body quiver. Nope. In that case, you'd better tell me right now. His eyes are soft as his gaze locks with mine. What I wanted to say is that whatever happens in the future, however this goes between us, I want you to know that I never stopped loving you. Not since the day we first kissed. My heart contracts. Really? Really. That's good to hear because I never stopped loving you either. I clasp his face in my hands and press my lips against his, feeling giddy with a whole host of emotions, every one of them telling me what I feel for this man. He knits his brows together as a cloud passes over his features. How did we waste so much time? Stupidity, I offer with a wry smile. 
that's got to be it. His lips crash down on mine once more, and he sweeps me up in the most emotion-filled, wonderful kiss of my life. Chapter 28 What do we want? The tree not to be chopped down and the field left as it is. When do we want it? Now! What do we want? The tree not to be chopped down and the field left as it is. When do we want it? Now! It's hard not to bumble our response line when Dot's voice booms out over the megaphone, and many fail, the result of which is the chant sounds like a garbled mess. Any bystander wanting to understand what we're protesting would be completely left in the dark. We've been marching around the old oak tree in a circular formation as Dot wields the megaphone with the obvious glee doing so gives her. Kennedy, Lottie and Zara have joined Noah and me with their respective partners, Asher and Charlie, although Lottie's boyfriend James is supporting us from the other side of the river so as to avoid questions being asked at his next council meeting. Charlie and Ash have been getting right into the swing of things, and Noah has done the all-important male bonding the men of this group like to do. I can report he's now officially part of the London Babes H.A.B.'s crew, husbands and boyfriends. And I could not be happier that he's mine. Not that any of the men are husbands yet, but really, with the way they look at their girlfriends... I know it's only a matter of time. We need to change that chant, and we need to do it now, Noah says as we march. Are you telling me we want the tree not to be chopped down and the field left as it is isn't snappy enough for you? I ask with a laugh. Weird, I know. I'm going to go suggest something to Dot. Okay, I'll keep up the good work here. He presses a kiss to my forehead before he leaves our spot, and I can't help a smile claiming my face as warmth spreads through my chest. Oh, you two are so dang cute together, Kennedy says as she sidles up to me. Charlie thinks he's a top bloke, as he put it, which is all the seal of approval you need from him. Isn't that right, honey? Charlie nods. Top bloke. He echoes. That is good to know. You talking about the new guy? Asha asks from behind us. Yeah, top bloke, Charlie repeats with a glint in his eye. You need to hold on to that one, Tabitha. I'm not sure I can go through one of your brief flings again when you're with the guy and then suddenly you're not. I need continuity in my life, you know? Asha says. Ash? Zara admonishes. What? She's had a couple of boyfriends. Oh, hold on. The tree to be chopped down and the field left to look like a tree. Asha copies the other protesters. Not quite on message. Now, he adds, and his sole voice rings out. Zara laughs. Oh, Ash, you do try, don't you? What? It's a stupid chant, he grumps. She hooks her arm through mine. Don't listen to Ash. We know why none of your other boyfriends hung around for long. We do? Ash asks. Because she's always held a candle for Noah, that's why. Zara replies. I look over at Noah. He's walking beside Dot, calmly waiting for her to finish her current chant to make his suggestion. I'll admit to a candle or two. Or a whole freaking fire, Kennedy replies with a laugh. I'm about to reply when I notice a familiar figure watching us protest from the road leading to the bridge. He's wearing his standard garb, a Shetland jacket, pocket square, and sensible corduroy trousers. He's got a scowl on his face his black Range Rover parked at a jaunty angle beside him, as though he's come to a sudden, screeching halt. What do we want? Dot asks over her megaphone. 
the tree not to be chopped down and the field left as it is. Everyone chants around me to varying degrees of success. When do we want it? Now! I declare along with everyone else as we march around the tree. What's your dad doing here? Zara asks. He doesn't look overly amused by all this. I have no clue. He looks over at us and his brows ping up to meet his hairline as he spots me before they slide back down his face into a frown. I lower my placard with the large red stop sign I painted on last night. I thought it was short, sweet and to the point. I'm going to go and talk to him. Be right back. Good luck, babe. He does not look like a happy camper to me, Zara says. When does he ever? I reply and she shrugs. I make my way through the throngs of protesters towards him. Hi, Daddy, I call out over the noise as I approach. Everything okay? He greets me with a kiss to the cheek. Hello, darling. When you and your friends dropped your suitcases off at the big house earlier today, I thought you were heading out for a pub lunch, not joining in with this carry-on. He gestures at the protesters with distaste. We did have lunch, I reply weakly, at the noble pigeon. He ignores my comment, which is fair enough, really. Us having a pub lunch is hardly the point. They call themselves S-O-F-T. Soft, he chortles. How ludicrous. I look over my shoulder at one of the protesters' signs that reads, Soft against the demolition. I know it's not the best acronym out there, but they mean well. He brushes my comment away with a flick of his wrist. What are you doing with these people? I'm protesting, Daddy. You're making a spectacle of yourself, Tabitha, darling. Aghast, I reply. I'm not making a spectacle of myself. I'm simply protesting along with many other concerned locals over the development of some dreadful houses on the field. It'll ruin the pretty outlook and change the village forever. Well, it's time to stop. You've had your fun and games, now pack up and come home. You've got a party to prepare for, darling. Remember? The big 3-0? He smiles at me, but it looks a little forced. No, Daddy. I won't. I believe in this cause. Even if you and Mummy don't, I'm staying. I beg your pardon, he asks, using his indignant, I can't believe you're talking back to me voice I'm all too familiar with. Resolved to stand up for my beliefs, I square my shoulders. What we're doing here is right. I've brought all of my friends up from London, and we're committed to stopping the developers from ruining our village. Our village. Might I remind you that you left just as soon as you could and never came back? I don't see how you can regard this as your village, Tabitha. Well, I do, and I care very much about it. Even though I know you and Mummy think it's fine for developers to destroy the field and chop down that beautiful old tree. But I'm a grown woman and I... He cuts me off by leaning in towards me and speaking with a low voice. Do you have any idea who the developer is? Yes, it's a consortium of business people called Wilson Construction. And... I pull my brows together. And they want to cut down the old oak tree and build on the field. You know that already. Why was he asking me this? Isn't it obvious? He purses his lips. Do I need to completely spell this out to you, darling? The cogs in my brain whir until I land on his gist. You're the developer? I ask. Wide-eyed. Me and another couple of others. I gape at him, utterly flabbergasted. But, but how? 
Why? It's business. We stand to make a lot of money from this development, and these protesters are a real bug in the ointment for us. Why didn't you tell me? You're not here, Tabitha. You're off swanning around London, running the gallery. If you were here, you could be involved in the work, just like Fenella and her husband are. Fen knows? Of course she does, and as a green, that makes you the developer. Because it's our family money that's bought this land. I can barely believe what he's saying to me. You do realize you're protesting against yourself. He looks amused at this revelation. Me? I'm jolted to the opposite end of that scale. Our family money, I echo blankly. I blink at him as my brain tries to assimilate this new information. My family will be responsible for the demolition of this gorgeous field and the old oak tree that means so much to Noah and me. The tree that represents our love. Talk about a bomb cluster being detonated in my head. Now, do the right thing and leave this rabble to their pointless protest and come back to the big house where you belong. But my friends and... and Noah... I say meekly as I look over to see him talking with Dot. My father wrinkles his brows. Noah Grant, the garage owner's boy. I snap my attention back to him. You knew? I ask, aghast. You can put a man in a suit and give him a decent job title, but you'll never change who he really is. But, but, you talked to him about art and investment and, and you knew. Tabitha, I'm a gentleman, and we know how to show good manners. He was a guest in my house, so I was welcoming. I swallow, my throat dry. I suppose you still don't think he's worthy of me, do you? He takes me by the shoulders and fixes me with his gaze. Tabitha, listen to me. You are not like these people, Noah Grant included. You're a green. You're from a long line of landed gentry, people who are set apart from the rest. The sooner you realize it, the sooner you can start to live up to your potential. Potential? What do you mean? I mean, it's all very well you having some fun with this lot and playing gallery owner and selling art to my friends. I'm equal parts indignant and shocked that he would say such a thing to me about my life. He puts his arm around my shoulders and gives me a squeeze. You need to remember who makes it all possible for you. I Cast my eyes down as a brick settles in my belly. You, Daddy. That's right. Me. So, what do you think the right course of action here is? Keep playing with your new friends, running around with banners and making up chants, protesting against your own family, or growing up into the woman you were born to be? I cast my eyes over at Noah once more. He's smiling at Dot as she says something, his face bright. This protest means a lot to him. I know it does. Daddy gives me another squeeze. I'll see you back at the big house. Your party's in only a few hours. I imagine you'll want to wear that dress your mother bought you. I open my mouth to reply, but I have no words. There's so much packed into that one speech, it's making my head spin. Nigel slinks over to us. Are you coming back, Tabitha? Thanks to Noah, we've got an excellent new chant we're all going to learn. Sure, yes, I mutter dumbly. Hello there, Mr. Green. Nigel Cossington. He extends his hand and Daddy takes it in his. You run a funeral home, don't you? You uh, dealt with my mother when she passed away. I never forget a face. 
Daddy replies. Do I, darling? No, Daddy, you're very good with faces, I murmur. Nigel bows his head. Of course, it was an honour to have Mrs. Green. It's jolly good of you to come to our protest today, sir. I'm sure it'll rally the troops. With trepidation, I lift my eyes to Daddy. Please don't tell him you're the developer. Oh, I'm not here to protest, just passing by, he replies. I let out a sigh of relief. Being outed as the daughter of the developer would put me in a very precarious position, particularly because I brought so many of my friends to protest here today. Nice to see you again, Mr. Cossington, Daddy says before he turns to me and adds. Think about what I said, darling, and we'll have a nice chat later. Cheerio. And before I have the chance to reply, he climbs into his Range Rover and drives away. Chapter 29 I stand and gaze at my reflection in the mirror of my childhood bedroom. In my Kate Middleton-inspired, slim-fitting, pale blue Jenny Packham dress Mummy bought me on her last visit to London a few weeks ago, the person staring back at me looks mature, poised, and completely put together. The person inside? Not so much. My father's revelations swirl around me in a fog, snapping at me like angry barracuda. He knew who Noah was when we had our impromptu visit last weekend, but he let us both think we'd got away with avoiding any unpleasantness. What's more, he still looks down his landed gentry nose at him, like Noah's a lesser being simply as a result of his birth, along with the other villagers. He's still just the mechanics kid who forgot his place and stepped out of line with his daughter. Noah. My belly tightens uncomfortably as my mind turns to him. How do I tell him that I can't be a part of the protest anymore, that I have a serious conflict of interest? How do I tell him that it's my family who is going to be responsible for chopping down our tree? Will he understand? There's a knock on my door, pulling me from my thoughts. Come in, I say turning to see who it is. Tabitha, you look gorgeous, Lottie exclaims as she, Zara, and Kennedy push through my door. You are killing it in that dress, girl, Kennedy says. Wearing floor-length gowns, each of them look absolutely beautiful. Lottie is in a pale yellow, off-the-shoulder number that looks gorgeous with her creamy skin. Zara is in a deep purple dress with lace cap sleeves and a pleated skirt that works perfectly with her long dark hair, and Kennedy looks almost otherworldly beautiful in her signature white. Will it do? I ask them. Oh, it'll do, babe. You look more Kate Middleton tonight than Kate herself, Zara tells me. But she still looks like Tabitha, not like she's playing Duchess of Cambridge dress-ups, Lottie remarks. Oh, totally Tabitha, Kennedy agrees. Well, being me is something I've got used to over the last 30 years. I pull a face at the fact today is not only my birthday party, but the actual day itself, too. I'm 30. How the heck did that happen? Zara grins at me. Welcome to our world, babe. I've got to tell you, even though I've not been in my 30s for that long, they totally rock. Forget the uncertainty and angst of being in your 20s when you think you know everything, but really, you know next to nothing. 30 is the age. You're going to love it. Kennedy pulls me into a hug and gives me a quick squeeze and I breathe in her floral perfume. It's so nice of your parents to let us all stay here, Lottie says, and I immediately think of Noah staying at the Noble Pigeon. 
Babe, they've got about three million rooms here. This place is a castle, Kennedy replies as she leans down to pat Echo. Lottie shrugs. No one's staying at the village pub, Zara says. That's only because Tabitha doesn't want her parents recognizing him. Right, Tabitha? Daddy's admission that he knew precisely who Noah was sits uncomfortably in my belly. I decide to come clean with my friends and tell them he knew who he was and still seems to think that he's a lesser being, thanks solely to his birth. I can't believe it! That's so old-fashioned, Lottie declares. Yeah, does he think this is Bridgerton or something? Because, newsflash, it's not, Kennedy questions. Zara shakes her head. He sounds just like my granny, but she's about a hundred years old, so at least she's got that as an excuse. Your dad needs to move with the times. What are you going to do? This from Lottie. I'm going to go to my party and think about it another time. That's what I'm going to do. I haven't even told them about the whole my family is the developer bombshell yet. That can wait. Good for you, Lottie says as she pulls me into a hug. The path of true love never runs smooth. Just look at all of us, she points at Zara. Fell in love with one of her besties only to discover he had a huge, life-changing secret. She points to Kennedy. Fell in love with a guy she hated who then turned out to be her boss. Boss's boss, I think. Kennedy corrects. Oh, I barely remember now. Lottie gestures with her thumb at herself. Fell in love with the guy I was pretending to be in love with while thinking I was actually in love with someone else. So you see, love is never straightforward. Yes, but it all worked out for you, I protest. And it'll work out for you too. Lottie replies, you'll see. Bolstered, I square my shoulders. You're right, Daddy will come around. Lottie winks at me. That's the spirit. Kennedy looks at her phone and says, it's time to get you to your party birthday, babe. Come on, ladies, it's almost eight. Zara smooths out her dress. Actually, before we go... I've got something to say before we head downstairs. What is it? I ask. It's a present. It's from all of us. Ash included, and he'll be annoyed he missed this. Miss what? Asher asks as he stands in the doorway, looking extremely handsome in his dinner suit and crisp white shirt. You made it! Zara crosses the floor and collects him in a hug, as though she hasn't spent all day with the guy. That's love for you. Did you do the thing yet? He asks. We're just about to. Ash's face breaks into a grin. Awesome. I glance around the room and notice one of my friends is missing. Where's Lottie gone? Zara waves her hand in the air. Oh, never you mind. She's just doing something. Okay, I reply, dubious. Ready, Lottie? Kennedy asks, and Lottie's head appears above the bed. Yup, ready. Are you going to do a dance routine for me? Because you know how I feel about you lot dancing, I warn with a smile. What are you saying? Kennedy asks. None of you are gifted and you should never dance in public. Speak for yourself, Tabitha. I have got the moves. Asha does a funny little dance that makes us all laugh. What? He asks, his eyes sparkling. I thought it was great. You were, babe, Zara says to him. Okay, I'll start. She clears her throat. <clears> throat> Tabitha, you and I have been partners in crime since the day we met as pimply teenage girls with terrible fashion sense back at boarding school. 
I had amazing fashion sense, I protest. No, you didn't. But since then, she continues pointedly, you have been one of my very best and closest friends, always there for me when I needed you most, especially when I've needed to have fun. She grins at me, and I grin back. I'm up next, Lottie tells me. I didn't meet you until we were in our early twenties, but boy, did we make up for lost time. You are the best fun to be around and the best friend when the chips are down. I can't believe I'm friends with someone who grew up in this freaking castle, but I'm so glad to have you in my life. I took my head to the side and mouthed, thank you, to her. It's Kennedy's turn to speak. I only met you when I moved to England a while back, but you have been such a huge part of my life here. In fact, I simply cannot imagine my life in London without Tabitha Green. I blow her a kiss. The same goes for me, Asha says with a grin. I'm not going to get all soppy and whatnot, but I think you're kind of great. I blow Asha a kiss too. All right, speech is over. It's time for your gift. We found it hard to think of what we could give the girl who, frankly, has way more than any of us, Zara says, and the others agree. So instead, we decided to give you something you already have on loan. I raise my brows at her. Which is? I lead. We spoke with Maya and she thought it was a great idea. What's my neighbour got to do with anything? No questions, Lottie snaps with her finger pointed at me. So, without further ado, Kennedy says with a smile, we give you your gift. Happy birthday, Tabitha. Lottie calls, Echo, here, girl. The next thing I know, Echo pads across the rug and looks out at us all as her tail wags slowly from side to side. She's wearing a large red velvet bow attached to her collar, and she doesn't look exactly thrilled about it either. I narrow my gaze. I don't get it. We're giving you Echo, silly, Lottie says. Maya said it would help her out tremendously, but she said you have to promise to bring her around to see the children every week or two. And because we're not cheap friends who are trying to get away without having to spend any money, you've got a sizable credit at Zara's crazy dog store, too, Ash says. Penelope's pooches, Zara interjects. Asha shakes his head. I am not saying that name. Anyway, Zara says, her eyes wide with amusement. You've got a credit for all the food and treats and whatever you need for Echo at Penelope's Pooches as our extra gift to you. I flick my gaze from Echo to my friends and back again. You got me Echo? I ask, barely believing what they're telling me. Yes, they all say in unison. And Maya is okay with this. Yes, they all reply again. She said it would really help her, actually, what with having the children and her husband being the scoundrel he is, Lottie replies. Kennedy nudges me. Aren't you going to pet your new dog? Are you kidding? Of course I am. I drop to my knees and Echo pads over to me, her head lowered. Come here, girl. I pull the oversized ribbon off. And immediately, she perks back up into full echo mode, her tail wagging her entire body from side to side as I pat her and plant kisses on top of her head. Who's a good girl then? Who's my good girl? Her tail wagging accelerates as her long pink tongue attempts to lick my cheek. Echo, we are going to have the best time together, I murmur into her fur. Ah, oh, look at you too. That's love for you. An American voice that's not Asher's says, and I look up from my spot on the floor to see Noah standing in front of me.
the sight of him almost takes my breath away. I've seen him in suits, looking ridiculously hot and chiselled. I've seen him as casual Noah, with his shirt sleeves rolled up, exposing his tanned, sinewy arms, his wet and paint-splattered shirt stuck to his arms. But this is a whole other level. He's got on a dinner suit, the stark white of the shirt showing off his olive complexion perfectly. He's shaved off his stubble, but his square jaw and high cheekbones still look like they've been chiselled from a block of stone, and his eyes dance and sparkle in the summer's soft evening light. My friends gave me echo, I tell him. He squats down next to me and strokes Echo's fur and his face breaks into a grin. To keep? I nod. Maya said it was okay. That's amazing, guys, he says to my friends. How did you pull that off? It was my idea, Lottie says, to looks from Zara, Asher and Kennedy. What? It was. Zara and I ran into Maya at the park with Echo and her kids, and she looked super stressed. We mentioned it to Lottie, Kennedy explains. Then Lottie picks up the mantle, and I had the brainwave to ask her if she would be interested in selling her to Tabitha. She looks at me, to which she said she would gladly give her to you as she knows how much you and Echo love one another, and then... We set this up. Isn't that incredible? I say to Noah. She can come to the gallery with me each day, just like she did this week, and we already know each other so well. I gaze at Echo, my heart full of love for her. Noah places his hand over mine and gives it a squeeze, his touch sending tingles through me. I'm so happy for you. I look up into his eyes. And as our gazes lock, I can't imagine any better feeling than this. I'm here with my new dog, and the man I have always loved has come back to me. You look so beautiful tonight, he murmurs. I beam at him. Thanks, you look pretty dang good too. Someone clears their throat. <clears throat> I think we're all gonna go downstairs to the party now. Yes, good idea. Let's go. See you down there, you two. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. And then the door is closed over and we find ourselves alone. Just Noah and me and one very happy looking Echo. I look around the empty room. Everyone left? Noah rises to his feet and offers me his hand. I can't say I'm sad about getting you all to myself, he says as he pulls me to my feet. We're standing together, our bodies close enough to touch, and I breathe in his scent as he trails his fingers up my bare arm, making my whole body quiver. I don't know if I have ever seen you look as beautiful as you do tonight, Duchess. He murmurs, his voice low as his fingers reach my shoulder and then begin to follow the contour of my collarbone. It shoots electricity through my body, making the hairs on my arms stand on end. Although to me, you've always been so beautiful. I reach up and hook my hands behind his neck and beam at him. Mind if I smudge some of that lipstick off? Is he kidding me? Who's thinking about lipstick right now? I run my fingers up his back and tangle them in his hair. Kiss me. He doesn't hesitate, his lips meeting mine almost immediately. Our kiss is long and deep, and when we finally part, we've got smiles on our faces, lipstick well and truly smudged. I let out a contented giggle as I wipe at my face and then do the same for him. If I knew you were going to kiss me like that, I'd make it my birthday every day. I can definitely kiss you like that every day. You know, if I have to. Oh, you have to. Happy birthday, by the way. 
I know I've already said it, but I wanted to say it as I gave you your gift. He turns and collects something wrapped in plain brown paper and tied with a simple ribbon and offers it to me. For you. Open it. I pull at the ribbon and it loosens, falling to the floor. Then I slide my finger under the tape holding the paper in place to reveal a painting. It's an oil painting, an abstract, with curls of subtle blues and greens growing from the dark. It's like it's inviting me into its world, filled with tree-like structures and a moon above. I look up at Noah. It's stunning. Who painted it? I did. He says simply, It's the painting I was going to give you that day after we broke up. Only I never got the chance. This is the painting? To my surprise, tears prick my eyes and I collect him in a hug. Thank you. I love it, Noah. You do? He asks, and the doubt in his voice makes a tear spill from my eyes. I pull back and regard his handsome face. I really do. And something else, too. What's that? I love you. His lips curve into a heart-melting smile. I love you too, Duchess. He claims my mouth with his once more, kissing me so long and well, I swear my knees give way beneath me as my heart soars above the clouds. Chapter 30 All grown up now, aren't you, Tabitha? My Uncle Jerry regards me through his 90s throwback wire glasses, the light from the chandelier above bouncing off his bald head. About time you got yourself hitched and sprogged up, eh? Can't have your younger sister beating you to all the spoils now, can we? Ah, uh, well, Uncle Jerry, she's already done that, I'm afraid, I reply with a shrug. I'm used to this line of conversation from my relatives. It's been happening ever since Fenella got married a few years ago. Really, it's a whole lot of fun for me. You'll need to play catch-up then, won't you? Uncle Jerry continues. Actually, there's not much point in me trying to compete with her, is there? Not unless I find myself a suitable man tonight, marry him tomorrow, have a child nine months later, then that child has their own at, what, sixteen or so? Then maybe I might have a slim chance of beating her to grandmotherhood. He pulls his thin white brows together. You what? Don't you approve of the plan? Well, I think there's no need to be so rash. I lean in towards him and say in a low voice, Should I cancel the church? He blinks at me a couple of times before he says, You do that. And turns to talk to someone who doesn't have a frankly ridiculous plan to win a non-existent race against her sister. Uncle Jerry giving you the speech, sis? Fenella asks as she appears at my side. She looks very pretty in her new grey Jenny Packham dress, another buy from Mummy for tonight's shindig. In fact, all three of us are in Jenny Packham dresses. Kate Middleton, it would seem, is every green woman's fashion idol tonight. It wouldn't be a green family party without an Uncle Jerry speech, would it? She giggles. I'm sorry I've been so successful on the marriage and baby's front. I'll try to mess up in the future. Perhaps one of the twins could enter the criminal underworld and steal cars or something. Throw in a murder and that would be great, thank you. I grin at her and she grins back. Actually, there is one thing you can help me with, Fen. What's the deal with this new development? Daddy says you know all about it. Which one? He's involved in a few right now. The one in the village on the field by the river, where they need to chop down the old oak. She grabs my arm and shushes me. Don't go blabbing about that, Tabitha. Daddy's worked really hard at keeping his name out of it. 
Imagine what the villagers would think if they knew he was involved. But he is involved. That's the problem. It's only a problem because of those pesky protesters. They're making a completely unnecessary ruckus about the whole thing. It's caused quite some delay in getting the project underway. So you think it's fine that they just bowl on in and cut down that tree and change the look of the village forever? It doesn't matter what I think. Daddy signed a deal with this consortium of business people, and they're hellbent on getting the win. You know what Daddy's like when he gets a bit between his teeth. Oh, yes, I know exactly what he's like. Happy birthday, a voice says, and I turn and come face to face with someone I've not laid eyes on for years. And with very good reason. Magnus? I ask, as I take in a tall, slim man with blonde hair and a huge grin. Put it here, Tabby. He collects me in a hug, and I almost choke on his shoulder blade as it pokes into my throat. Are you okay? Choking on your vino, are you? Magnus asks me. No, I'm fine, I tell him when I've recovered. I didn't know you were coming tonight. I don't add that I didn't invite him. Who invites their ex fiance they never loved to their birthday party? Your mother invited me, actually. Of course she did. Thought it was rather fun to see you again after all this time. He leans closer to me and I catch a whiff of his stale wine breath. Tell me, are you seeing anyone, Tabby? Cut right to the chase, why don't you? Magnus, do you remember my sister, Fenella? I say in reply. Of course I do. How are you, Fen? Wonderful, thanks, she says with a grin. I feel a hand slink around my waist from behind and turn to see Noah, smiling down at me. How's your party, birthday girl? I freeze in his arms, my eyes darting around the room to work out who can see him touching me. Luckily, neither of my parents are in sight. Noah notices right away. Everything okay? It's fine, absolutely fine, I bluster, feeling anything but. I'm kicking myself for letting Daddy's disapproval of Noah get to me. Haven't I been an adult for long enough not to care what he thinks? I force myself to relax and reach up and plant a quick kiss on his lips. Who cares if Daddy sees? I'm a grown woman and I choose Noah. But I still hope he hasn't seen. Hello there. Do you remember me? Fenella says, and I loosen my hold on Noah. Fenella? He asks, and she nods, grinning at him. I know exactly what she's thinking right now. Eighteen-year-old Noah in a wet T-shirt. Magic Mike. That's me, the little sister. Nice to see you again after all this time, Noah. She kisses him on each cheek. This is Magnus. Noah's eyes land on him, and I want to sink into the floor. I remember. How are you? He asks him graciously. Good, good, Magnus replies, clearly with no memory of Noah. He drains his glass and then announces, I'm going to get a top-up. See you all later. And, Tabitha, let's have a good old catch-up, eh? Sure. Was that the Magnus? Noah asks. My mother invited him. Ah. What are you doing back here, Noah? Fenella asks, and I'm deeply thankful for the change in subject. Noah knows I dumped him and moved on to Magnus, so seeing him here can't be a whole lot of fun. I mean, I know you're working with Tabitha, but are you living here now? I'm living in London, but it sure is great to be back. This place hasn't changed. Well, not if we manage to keep the developers away from that spot by the river, that is. Are you involved in the protests? She asks. I am. We both are. 
right, Duchess? Fenella's eyes alight on me. You were protesting? My chest tightens. I, that is, we, I pull my lips together as I struggle for the right words. How do I answer without looking like a traitor to the family in Fenella's eyes, or a straight-up liar in Noah's? It's a simple enough question. Were you protesting or not? Fenella asks, and both she and Noah watch me as they wait for my reply. I've got no choice but to come clean. Look, Fen, it's a beautiful area and it means a lot to us and to so many people. The development will ruin that. It will completely change the look of the village. When you sit outside having a meal at the Noble Pigeon, you'll be looking at somebody's back fence. Fenella's face is aghast. But you can't, Tabby. You know you can't, she hisses. What do you mean? Noah asks. Tabitha's entitled to protest about something she believes in. It's a free country. Fenella frowns. You don't understand, Noah, but Tabitha does. Noah's gaze moves from my sister to me. What's going on? I know I've got to tell him, but not here, not in the thick of the party. Come with me, I tell him, as I slip my hand into his. I lead him through the throngs and out into the hallway. Let's go to Daddy's study. Our heels click on the marble floor, echoing through the wide hallway. Once inside the study, I close the door behind us, the late evening light rendering the entire room aglow with soft shades of pink and orange. I hope you've brought me here to do something other than talk, he says, as he trails a finger along my jaw until he reaches my chin. He tilts my face up and regards me through soft eyes, although I do think you need to tell me what's going on. I take a deep breath and move away from him. It's not going to be easy telling him I need to pull back from the protests altogether, and it's almost impossible to concentrate when he touches me. Duchess, what is it? I swallow and turn to face him. I found something out today, something that changes things for me. Is this something to do with us? No, not us, I reply in a rush. The way I feel about you hasn't changed. His taut features relax into a smile. You had me go in there for a minute. I bite down on my lip. It's the development down at the river. In a weird turn of events, I found out today that my family is one of the members of the consortium who plan to develop the land. He blinks at me in surprise. Your family? I nod, my pulse quickening. I've got what I believe is called a conflict of interest. I try out a laugh, but it sounds hollow in the spacious room. His gaze is on me. Sure, I guess you do. Daddy's told me that even though it's not known that he's involved, it isn't wise for me to protest anymore, especially as people know I'm his daughter, and I can totally see his point. You don't want to invest a huge sum of money in a project, only for a member of your own family to do her best to thwart it. No, I can see that. His voice has become small. A rush of relief floods me, and I cross the room and wrap my arms around him. Noah, I'm so glad you can see it from my perspective, and I'm so sorry I have to pull back. I don't want them to destroy the field, but my hands are tied. I pull him into a hug, feeling so much better than I did a moment ago. And the tree, he says. Yes. And the tree. After a beat, I notice he's not hugging me back, his hands loosely held at my waist. 
I pull back and peer up at him. Noah? I question. Is that it? Is your mind made up? I purse my lips and nod. It has to be. He pulls back from me, turns, and begins to pace the room. Tension crackles around us. This doesn't change anything. We're still us. We're still going to be together. He stops in his tracks and turns to face me. You froze when I touched you out there. When? I ask, knowing exactly when. Just before, when you were with Fenella. Only because I got a surprise, nothing more. Really? I drop my shoulders. I can't lie to him. He deserves my honesty. I didn't want my parents seeing us like that. But they didn't even recognize me. They did. Daddy told me he was being polite. Polite, he echoes. Right. Anxiety makes my belly churn as I take a handful of steps closer to him. You've got to give me some time with them. Our history, it's not easy. He focuses on something out of the large window overlooking the gardens. I guess not. I reach out and take his hand in mine. We can still be together, just not around them. Not yet. So we're back to where we were all those years ago. He turns back to face me, and the coldness in his eyes sends panic through me. No! I'm not going to be your dirty little secret, Tabitha. Not again. I'm so sorry. It was a stupid moment back there with Fenella, and I regret it. You mean so much to me, and reconnecting the way we have this past week has been all that I've ever wanted. He nods, his jaw tight. Do you want to know what your dad said to me and my father that day we broke up? I hang my head, shame claiming my chest. He told me I would never be good enough for you. My heart thuds in my ears. He said that. He told me to get out of town and never come back, or he would ruin my dad's business. That's what a great guy your father is, Tabitha. A really great guy. No, that can't be true. I don't believe you, I protest. But in the back of my head, a voice asks me whether he could. I knew Daddy didn't approve of me dating Noah for all his ridiculous, archaic reasons of class and upbringing and the right kinds of people. But he wouldn't go so far as to run someone out of town. It's all a little too reality TV show for the Green family. Why do you think I left? Answer me that. Because... Because you wanted to work on a cruise ship and see the world. You told me that. Tabitha, I had no choice. I needed to leave to protect my dad's garage, the business that he and my mom came to England to run. He wasn't going to try to start again somewhere new. It's hard to do, to pick up the pieces and start again. You never had to do it. You've led this totally charmed life with... Everything offered to you on a silver platter. That's not true. I work hard at the gallery and, and... He's not listening. He begins to count things off on his fingers. Your parents put you through college. They bought you the gallery. They set you up in your flat. I chew on my lip. I know everything he's saying is true. There's nothing wrong with that, you know, and even if there was, I can't help it that I come from a family with means. I didn't ask for any of it, you know. I'm not some poor little rich girl. He places his warm palms against the cool skin of my upper arms, and I lift my eyes to see softness in his. I'm not calling you a poor little rich girl. I'm asking you not to repeat what you did to us 12 years ago. I pull my brows together. 
I'm not breaking up with you, if that's what you mean. He shakes his head. I mean that I'm asking you to stand up for yourself. To be Tabitha Green, not Francis Green's daughter. You mean I should stand by my convictions and fight to save the field? The field and the tree. The tree that means so much to us. Doesn't that mean something to you? Of course it does, but it's not that simple. I know, I get it. Since your dad is the developer, you'll be going against his wishes. I get it. I understand this is hard for you. All I'm saying is, isn't it about time you made your own mind up about something important? Isn't it about time you stood on your own two feet? My breaths are shallow as I gaze back at Noah. I know what he's saying makes sense, but this situation is so much more complicated than that. I take a deep breath, my limbs trembling. Noah, this is my family. I can't just fight something they're trying to do, no matter whether I think it's right or wrong. His features harden. Actually, you can, because you do think it's wrong. You said so yourself. That was before I knew. I lower my gaze, my heart twisting in pain. Noah, please don't make me choose between you and them. I'm not, and I need you to understand that. I'm asking you to stand up for what you believe in, and I know you want to save our tree. Ah, tree. The words tug on my heart, hard. I want to save the tree. I don't want Daddy to develop the land. I want it to stay the way it is. It's beautiful. Building on that land will change the village forever. But I can't go against my father's wishes. Not now, not ever. Not even to save our tree. And I know what this will mean for us. I know Noah will be hurt. Slowly, with my heart thudding, I lift my gaze to his. With my hand on his arm, I murmur, I can't. I'm sorry. His jaw tightens, his Adam's apple dropping before it rises once more. He stares at me for a long beat before he finally opens his mouth to speak. I wish it could be different. I wish. He drops his hands from my arms, and panic sets in. What? What do you wish? Tell me. I wish you'd changed. I, I hoped you had. He heaves out a breath, looking crestfallen. You said it was a good thing that I hadn't changed, remember? Not about this. I step closer to him, my hands grasping his forearms. Noah, I've grown up. I've got a great life and a purpose, and finding you again has been all I've ever wanted. But you're still the same Tabitha I knew back then. The Tabitha who couldn't stand up to her family or her friends for what she wanted— for fear of their disapproval. You might be older, but in this, you're the same as you always were. That's not true, I object. None of your snooty boarding school friends liked me back then. They looked down on me, just like your family did. They thought I was some fling, your bit of rough. Not someone to get serious about. I open my mouth to protest but almost those exact words had fallen from Prue's lips. My friends never wanted Noah included in our events that summer, even nicknaming him the Grease Monkey because he was a mechanic. Zara was my only friend who accepted him, but her lone voice was lost in the tidal wave of disapproval from everyone else. You couldn't stand up to them then, and you can't. Stand up to them now. I know he's right. I may think of myself as this modern, confident woman in charge of my own life, but I'm not. I'm sorry. 
I mutter, as my throat tightens, my chest heavy. He stares at me for a beat, and I will him to forgive me, to make things go back to the way they were before. But he pulls his gaze away and slowly loops his jacket over his forearm, pulls the door open, and then leaves the room. I turn and follow him out into the hallway and stand, rooted to the spot, as I watch him walk away from me. He pauses once to look back at me, and I can see the pain etched across his features before he turns away once more and disappears around the corner. And then he's gone, and I'm left staring after him, wondering how we'd come to this, and knowing with a sickening sensation that this time, as well as the last, I'm the one to blame. Chapter 31 I sit with my friends at a picnic table in the warm midday sun at the Noble Pigeon. I've got my back to the view of the river and the old oak tree beyond. I can't look at it. Not today. Not after Noah left the party last night after we spoke, never to return. Are you sure he's gone? Lottie asks, concern etched on her face. Yup, is my efficient reply. As in gone, gone, left Marlingworth. I shrug. His car's not parked on the street and there's no sign of him, so I can only assume he's left. Why don't you try his mobile again? He might have had time to cool off and reconsider things, Zara suggests. My chest tightens and the heavy feeling in my belly that has been there ever since I watched him drive away last night seems to grow even heavier as I say the words. There's no point. He hasn't returned any of my messages or calls. Do it anyway, Zara encourages. Z's right. You should definitely check. He might have lost his cell, Kennedy suggests. I give her a look. He hasn't lost it. Zara points at my phone lying face down on the table. Check it. Only to shut you up. I pick up my phone and scan my messages seeing only the ones I've sent Noah. Despite having next to no expectation of having heard from him, my belly grows still heavier. Nothing. Just as I said, he's made it clear. It's over before it's even really begun. I can't believe he expects you to go against your dad like that, Lottie says. You can't come back into someone's life for five minutes after disappearing off the face of the earth for years and expect them to turn against your own father. I mean, he's your dad. Have you not met her dad? He's not exactly the easygoing type. Kennedy flicks a gaze to me. Sorry, girl, but it's true. He told me last night my problem is I'm an American refugee and should go back home where I belong. He said what? Lottie guffaws. How rude. He's never been an easy person, has he, babe? Zara says, and I pull my mouth into a line and give a small shake of my head. Not being an easy person is probably the understatement of the day. He's always had very specific ideas about who everyone is and where they belong. He's always been like that, for as long as I can remember, Zara says. It's the US for me, apparently, Kennedy replies with a smirk. Lottie shakes her head. But he's family. That means something, even if he's a little difficult, doesn't it? Zara says. Just because he's family doesn't make him right. I mean, look at the field over there. Isn't it gorgeous? And that tree, breathtaking. My friends gaze out at the view. I, on the other hand, keep my eyes firmly trained on the exterior wall of the pub, much safer in my current state. Why would you want to go ruining that view just to make a few quid? Zara continues. 
the people of this village don't want it, and nor does his flesh and blood. Why can't he listen to them? See reason. I twist my mouth as I shrug. Because he's made up his mind and he won't let anything get in his way. So he's an obstinate person, Lottie begins. Kennedy interrupts with, good word, Lottie. Thanks, she replies. Noah wants you to continue to protest because it's your tree at stake here. Right, Tabitha? Kennedy's eyes light up. He's a romantic. He doesn't want the tree to get chopped down because you two started your love affair there when you were teenagers. And now that he's back, or was at any rate, he wants to preserve the memory because he never stopped loving you. She sits back in her seat, satisfied with her summation. Thanks for that, I grind out, although she's got it 100% right. Oh, babe, Lottie rubs my arm. For what it's worth, I really hoped it would work out with him. But if you feel you can't go against your dad, I guess you have to draw a line under Noah and move on. Lottie's right, you know. And the sooner you do it, the better, hun, Kennedy adds. It's like ripping off a band-aid on a super hairy part of your leg. It'll hurt a heck of a lot more if you leave it too long. That's a lovely image, Zara says with a smile. Better than bikini waxing? Kennedy asks. Zara shudders. Definitely. Hey there, girls. Want some company? A voice says, and I look up to see Asha accompanied by my other friends' boyfriends, Charlie and James. You'll need to move another table over because we won't all fit at this one, Zara instructs. The next few minutes are used up with the guys moving a table next to ours and then everyone working out what they want for lunch. James sits down next to Lottie and drapes his arm around her shoulders. Where's that guy from last night? Noah, right? He receives a quick bat on the arm from his girlfriend. What was that for? He complains. I'll tell you later, Lottie says through clenched teeth. I've had enough. I swing my legs around the end of the picnic table seat and stand up. All right, you lot. Tell me what you want to eat and I'll order it. Following is a lengthy discussion about what to order. I zone right out as I find myself looking at the tree across the river against my better judgment. I know, I know. I'd avoided looking at it before, but now that I'm standing, it's right in my line of sight, and I find myself drawn to it, just as I am drawn to Noah. I heave out a breath as thoughts of Noah swirl. I don't blame him for walking out on me last night, how can I? Kennedy was right. The tree does mean a lot to him. And to me. It represents us, him and me, together. I think we've got it, Zara tells me finally, punctuating my thoughts. She proceeds to list off the order. And I'm grateful to have something else to think about for a while. Be right back. Talk among yourselves and not about me, I say as I turn to leave, knowing I will definitely be the top of the discussion points list for them all. Me and my latest failed relationship. Just another one in the line. I make my way inside and over to the bar where I greet Mr. Mayhew with the best smile I can muster. Lovely to see you, Tabitha. Nice party last night. I lost the one man I've ever loved who can't see the position I've been put in and expects me to make a stand against my father. Not going to say that. Instead, I reply brightly. It was. Thank you, Mr. Mayhew. I've come in to place a lunch order, please. Right you are, love. Let me just grab my pen and paper. He reaches around and produces what he was looking for. What'll you have? I list off the order and then lean my elbows on the bar and wait as Mr. Mayhew writes down everyone's choices. All right.
right, let's see. We've got four steak and kidney, two chicken and leek, and one cottage pie. Drinks? Three Diet Cokes and two Fat Cokes, please, Mr. Mayhew. And I'll have a... I pause as he scribbles the list on his pad. After Noah left the party last night, my friends offered me a brandy to calm my nerves. I took it and it worked. At least until it wore off and I was left feeling heartbroken and alone once more. It's so tempting to feel that sense of calm alcohol can provide, but it doesn't last long. I know, I used it for years after Noah and I broke up. It numbed my pain and regret and made life feel more livable. But I don't want to go back to the old Tabitha. I've come too far for that. What'll you have, love? Make mine a Diet Coke too, please. Right you are. He rattles the drinks list off to me, and I get out my card and pay. Mr. Mayhew, can I ask you something? He turns his attention from filling one of the glasses on the bar from the fizzy drinks dispenser. Course you can. I try to affect a casual air when I ask, Is Noah Grant still here, or has he checked out? Only I wanted to catch up with him today. His bushy brows ping up and he replaces the drinks dispenser on its hook, the glasses only half filled. Noah Grant, you say? Hold on a minute, love. He turns and walks over to the open door behind the bar and bellows. Maisie! You're needed out front for that special reason we talked about before. Special reason? He returns to his task and offers me a smile. I'm not certified to answer that for you, love, but my Maisie will be out here any minute now. Certified? What the heck is going on? All right. As Mr. Mayhew finishes filling the glasses with the fizzy drinks, my eyes drift to the pictures on the wall. The old photo of Marlingworth from when there was no seal on the roads and women wore path-sweeping dresses and men wore top hats. The picture of a very youthful-looking queen in all her royal splendor. Then my eyes land on the Frisksits painting, and I gaze at it, wondering once more how the Mayhews ended up with it. Mrs. Mayhew enters the bar, pulling my attention. She and her husband share a look, and she gestures for me to move away from the other customers to the quiet, darkened end of the bar next to the fruit machines. She leans her elbows on the bar, and I get a lungful of her heavy floral scent. Mixed with beer and cooked pies, it really is a smell sensation. You were asking about our Noah, were you? I can't keep the hurt from my voice at his name on someone else's lips. He, he left the party last night. We had a few words. Did you now? Well, that explains that then. That explains nothing. What do you mean? I ask. He was in a right hump with the world when he left this morning. Said he wouldn't be back until the weekend. And then after that, he might not be back for some time, which is a shame as he's here so often, what with his painting and what not. I blink at her in disbelief. He only came back here with me last Saturday. That was the first time he'd been here in years. That's what he told you, was it? Well, I'm sure he had his reasons. She leans in closer to me and adds, although why he'd not tell you of all people, he's been here is beyond me. My throat tightens. Noah has been visiting Marlingworth for years. Why didn't he tell me? What does he do when he's here? I ask. Oh, he's always taking off to paint this or that. My mind turns to the picture he gave me last night. More recently, of course, you and he have been campaigning with that lot to save the field and tree from those awful developers who want to ruin our lovely village. She nods at a table by the window, 
and I spot Dot, Caro and Nigel and some of the others sitting together, no doubt designing new chants and strategies to thwart the developers, to thwart my family. One of them notices me and they all turn and wave with big welcoming smiles on their faces. I give them a half-hearted wave in return before I look away, shame mingled with helplessness and resignation gripping my belly. But they're not reading my mood. As I begin to toy with a cardboard coaster on the bar, Dot and Caro come over to me. Only six days to go before they do it. Dot tells me without preamble. Do what? I ask. Destroy the field and chop down Barnabas Babington's tree. A dark, dark day for Marlingworth, Caro says. A dark day for Marlingworth indeed. Mrs. Mayhew agrees with a grim look on her face. That's not good. Sorry about that, I reply really not wanting to have this conversation right now. We're planning big things on the day. Big things, Dot declares. Are you in? Sorry, what? I ask dumbly. My head is not in this conversation. In on the big things we're going to plan, she replies. Oh, I'll be working in London then. I'm sorry. I say quickly because there's no way I can be at that protest. But it's on Saturday, Caro protests. My gallery is open on Saturdays and I'm rostered on to work. Ah, she replies. Dot nods. I've used up all my annual leave up what with all the protests we've been doing, but lucky for me I can swap a shift with Edwina at the care home and come. You're lucky you've got such a flexible job, Dot, Caro says. We can count on you, though, can't we, Maisie? Oh, absolutely. I'll get Fergus to cover for the lunch shift and me and my Basil will be there with you in force, Mrs Mayhew replies. Good girl, Dot quips. Are you sure you can't make it on the 23rd? She asks me. Quite sure, sorry, I reply feeling about the size of a mouse. Dot places her hand on my shoulder. Well, thanks for all you've done. What with joining in and bringing your friends to protest yesterday, we do appreciate it. You're welcome, I say with a forced smile. When Dot and Caro return to their table, I try to ask Mrs Mayhew as casually as I can. Does Noah always stay here at the pub when he comes to visit? Oh, yes. Why would he stay anywhere else? What with his parents down in Portsmouth? That boy's like a second son to me and Basil. Well, he's a man now, isn't he? Not a boy. Yeah, a man, I reply dumbly. Are you going to tell me what happened between you two then? Mrs Mayhew asks her voice clipped. She's clearly on Noah's side in all this, and I can hardly blame her. I'm the bad guy here. He might have driven away last night, but I'm the one who put the keys in his hand. I... I messed it all up again. I know I did, but my hands are tied. I can't... I break off, sadness rising up and tightening my throat. I want to choose Noah but it's not possible. I heave out a breath, my body crumpling in on itself. Oh, sweetheart, she says, her voice softening with concern. You are wretched, aren't you? The heat in my throat intensifies as I try to concentrate on studying the image of a pigeon wearing a bow tie and monocle on the cardboard coaster in my hands. Is it over between you two? I think it is, I reply thickly. Why, you're made for each other. I lift my gaze to hers and the tenderness in her eyes makes my heart clench. We're not. I thought we were, but I was wrong. It's all too hard. The past, now, all of it. 
she places her warm hand over mine. You love him, don't you? I nod, my heart breaking in two at the thought. Well, you know what they say. If you're going to fall in love again, best make it with the same person. I let out a defeated laugh. I'm not in the least bit exciting, am I? What do you mean, love? Where's the fun in finding the love of your life at just sixteen? She rubs my hand, her face pulled into a warm smile. That's the best fun of all. I give her a watery smile. But I've messed it all up, Mrs. Mayhew. Well, best you go and fix it then, love. I pull my lips into a line. How can I fix it? How can I win Noah back? As I collect the drinks on the tray Mrs. Mayhew helpfully offers me, I know there's no going back. I've lost him. For the second time. And my heart has already broken. Chapter 32 Trudging through the summer rain with Echo at my side, the unseasonal chill in the air reflects my now constantly low mood. It's been seven days since Noah left my party, seven days since I've heard anything from him. I've messaged him, I've called him, I've taken my new dog, Echo, and yes, I love being able to say that, to the park and waited and waited for Noah to go running by. I've even made my friends hang around the Black Cat pub in case he decides to drop by for a meal. But my efforts have come to nothing, and it's as though that wonderful week we spent together was a hallucination, and I'm back to where I've been for the last twelve years, missing him, filled with regret, and alone again. Always alone. So I stopped calling him and I stopped looking for him at the park and at the pub. What's the point? The man had wanted to disappear before and had done it successfully for almost twelve years. He knows what he's doing and he quite clearly doesn't want me to find him. I unlock the door and push into the darkened gallery, my laptop bag slung over my shoulder and my plastic-wrapped parcel held protectively under my arm. I flick on the lights and look around the stark white space. Echo heads immediately for her dog bed next to the desk. After giving in to my sorrow for a few days and doing my best to replace all macronutrients in my diet with chocolate, I've been getting into the gallery extra early. I've needed to. There's a lot to be done. Jed has been in contact with me most days, telling me how he's been borrowing people's pets to help him with his art. Apparently, Liam, the boy who lives down the mews, has a guinea pig called Bolt. Bolt was a surprise hit with his little footprints, egged on by Liam who literally dangled a carrot for him on the other side of the canvas. Jed has told me to expect quite a number of works featuring Bolt's footprints in the not-too-distant future. In fact, Jed's art has become quite the highlight for Dalton, and people have been queuing up to have him use their pet's prints in his next work. So much so, he's told me he's got three pieces for Noah's client already, and plans on having enough for a sole artist exhibition at the gallery in late autumn. But more than that, I've been doing a lot of work myself. After Daddy not so delicately pointed out to me that he's the reason why I have the life I've got, I decided it was high time I had a good look at myself. I might have changed my parting ways, but I found there was a lot left to be done. A few things in my life no longer sit as well as they once did with me. Things like the fact Daddy owns the gallery I work in, and he owns my flat, too. Over the last few days, an uncomfortable fact has been rising to the surface, a fact I now can no longer ignore. Noah was right. 
I've never really stood on my own two feet. I've always had my family's backing in whatever I do. Don't get me wrong, coming from money definitely has its perks. I didn't need to have jobs to help pay for my university. When I moved to London, Daddy presented me with a gallery and my own flat. No questions asked and no debt to be repaid. Well, not to financial debt, anyway. The thing I've realised is that I have a debt to him in another way, and that debt has cost me a lot. It's cost me Noah. Twice. So, instead of sitting around feeling sorry for myself as the original poor little rich girl, I've been working out my precise financial position. I know what the gallery makes, what its costs are, what my father's initial outlay was to purchase it. What's more, I've developed a robust business plan based firmly in reality, and I know what this place is now worth. And today is the day. Daddy is coming to London, and I've asked him to meet with me. I'm lost in my work sometime later when I look up from my laptop screen as the front door is pushed open. Morning, darling, Prue breezes into the gallery, shaking her umbrella out at the door. Frightful rain today, whatever happened to the sun? Got you a coffee? I know you'll need one. You've been working so hard lately. It can't be good for you. She hands me my reusable mug as she waltzes past, shrugging off her raincoat. Hello, Echo. Echo's tail thumps against her bed. Thanks, Prue. You're an angel sent from the coffee heavens, I say as I take a grateful sip of my latte. We can't have you falling asleep on the job now, can we? Shall I open up? It's ten already. Sure. I glance back at my laptop and I'm instantly hit with a wave of anxiety. One hour until he's here. Oh, hello, Mr. Green. How lovely to see you, Prue says. I look up to see Daddy being greeted with a double air kiss by Prue. He's in his city attire today of a navy pinstripe suit, white shirt, and old school tie, literally. My heart leaps into my mouth. It doesn't matter that he's early, it's showtime. On trembling legs, I make my way over to them. Daddy, hello, I say, as I give him a kiss on his cheek. I'm a touch early, he says. Is now good for you, only I need to get back to Marlingworth earlier than expected. He reaches down and pats Echo's head. Absolutely, Prue. Daddy and I are going to have a chat in the back. All right, see you soon. She flashes me an encouraging smile. I told her of my plans yesterday, and she had some mixed feelings about it, specifically concern over whether she'll still have a job tomorrow. I assured her she would, just as long as the conversation goes where I hope it will. Daddy follows me to the back of the gallery, where I hang up his raincoat and offer him a seat at the small table. I collect my laptop and remote from the desk, and a moment later I sit down next to him and light up the screen. You're giving me a presentation, are you? He asks, as I pull up my first slide. I am, if that's all right with you. He leans back in his chair. Fire away. I clear my throat and prepare to begin. <clears throat> you mentioned when I saw you in the village on the day of my party that you made my life here possible, and I agree with you, at first. Now things are a little different, and I want to show you that. I'm all ears. I click on the remote and the screen flicks over to the first slide. This is where it all began. I was fresh back from my time abroad, looking for something to do with my life, and you offered me this gallery. I remember. You bought the gallery that was here already, as well as the building it's in, which also houses offices for an accountant, a podiatrist, and a small legal practice. All the businesses, 
other than my gallery, pay you rent, which covers the building costs and makes you a profit. I flick to the next slide. Under my leadership, the gallery took some time to turn a profit. Five years, I believe. Five years and four months, actually. Any other new business would have gone under in that time, but I know I was lucky that you allowed me to continue to run it. Where are you going with this, darling? I thought we might pop out for coffee. I'm getting to my point, Daddy. I flick to the next slide. Since then, however, the gallery began to make a small profit, and over the six or so months, it's turned a profit to a very healthy tune. A sizable profit figure flashes up on the screen, one I'm very proud of, and one that I could not have achieved when I was leading my party lifestyle. This is according to your accountants, Bailey, Pete and Brown, who provided me with all the info I needed for my presentation today. That was very good of them, he says with an amused scoff. I click on the next slide. This is what I project for the coming financial year, based on last year's figures. As you can see, we've got an exclusive agreement with Jed, who has a new collection coming online soon, as well as working with other artists who we know well and are loyal to us. It all adds up to a very profitable business I'm proud to run. I can see you're doing very well with it these days. I beam at him. Thanks. I click on the remote and another slide fills the screen. This is how I intend to run the gallery from now on. Based on the rents you receive from the other businesses, I've worked out that I should be paying this amount of rent each month per square footage. On top of that, I want to repay you for your initial outlay in purchasing the gallery, which I'd like to pay in installments over the next three years. You don't have to do that, darling. I bought this business for you and the building, too. But it's not mine, Daddy. It's yours, and we both know that. I'm 30 years old now. It's time I stopped relying on you and Mummy. That's what this is all about. Me growing up. Do I get to keep the building, or is that part of your grand plan too? He asks with a wry smile. I can't afford to buy the building from you, but I do hope you'll keep it. Oh, I plan on keeping this building. It turns a tidy profit, and the capital gains are well worth it. Now, tell me, what about your flat? Is it part of this whole thing about you growing up? Or did you conveniently forget about it? I ignore the jibe. I did not forget about it. I thank you for the use of it over the last seven years, and now I would like to hand it back to you. Hand it back to me? Where are you going to live? Don't be foolish, darling. I'm not being foolish, I reply calmly. I told you, I'm growing up. I'm doing what I should have done years ago, when all my friends did it. They left university and lived in dive flats while they earned a pittance, whereas I never went through that. I'm quite sure it's not all it's cracked up to be. But can't you see what I'm trying to do here? I'm moving out of home and becoming my own person. I can't keep taking your handouts. Not if I want to be the person I know I can be. He arches his brows at me. You mean poor? I shake my head at him. Daddy, I really hope you can understand what I'm trying to do. What I need to do. He rises to his feet and walks calmly over to the hook to collect his coat. What I see here is a person who thinks they know what they're doing, when really, they've got no clue. That's not fair. I've put a lot of time into this. I've done all the research. I know how much this place makes and how much it costs. Daddy, I'm good at my job. I'm good at being a gallerist. And I love doing it. I know it's taken me a long time to get to this point. 
too long, but I'm here now, and all I'm asking is that you cut me free so I can keep doing it on my own terms. He pauses for a beat, studying my face. Is it that Noah Grant? Did he put you up to this? Taken aback, I reply, no, he's got nothing to do with this which is not entirely true. It's his words that have been ringing in my brain. His words that have made me see what's been so obvious to everyone else all this time. But I'm not doing it for him. I'm doing it for me. And it's about time. Are you completely sure it's nothing to do with him? Because none of this sounds like the Tabitha Green I know and love. She's quite happy to take my handouts. That's the old Tabitha. I'm not her anymore, Daddy, and I haven't really been her for a long time now. I place my hand against my chest. This is all from me, about how I want things to work from now on. It's the way they should work. He pulls his lips into a thin line and gestures at my laptop on the table. This is what you really want? It is. I'll keep the building. You'll pay some rent. A fair rent, based on the square footage of the gallery, just like all the other tenants. All right. You'll pay me a fair rent, and you'll find someplace else to live. Exactly. I have no idea where I'll end up. But Kennedy has told me there's a room over the black cat that I can rent until I find something more permanent, and it sounds perfect to me. He studies me for a beat before he says, I'll have my lawyer draw up some things and we can discuss some figures. Happiness threatens to burst out of me. Thank you, Daddy, I gush as I wrap my arms around him. He pats my arm uncomfortable with a non-green family-approved display of physical affection. All right, then. You're going to be proud of me, I promise. I already am, he mutters, before he clears his throat and takes a step back from me. That might not be a lot for your average person, but coming from my father, it's a pretty big deal. Really, he's veritably gushing. Thanks, Daddy, I say, beaming at him. I'll let you get on with running this place, then. I can't stop smiling, which might seem mad to most, considering up until a moment ago I lived and worked rent-free and now I've lumbered myself with debt, rent and nowhere to live. But for me, this feels amazing, like I'm free and I can finally hold my head up high. Thanks again for everything. I mean it. Yes, yes. He's avoiding eye contact, but I can see he's trying to conceal his smile. I never thought a child of mine would ask me not to pay for them. You certainly are your own person, Tabitha. I'm becoming my own person, Daddy. That's the whole point. He slips his raincoat on and begins to leave when he turns back and adds, Despite this newfound independence of yours, I'm jolly pleased to hear you're no longer cavorting with that Grant. He was never worthy of you, not my Tabitha. I lift my chin. Actually, Daddy, I think it's me who was never worthy of him. What a ridiculous thing to say. I chew on my lip as I work up to saying what I've wanted to tell him for days, ever since that terrible day I lost Noah again, ever since I worked out why. You said to me you can put a man in a suit and give him a fancy job, but you'll never be able to change who he really is. Well, Daddy, you were right. You can't change Noah and nor should you ever want to. He's a good, decent guy, with a big heart. So what if he's not from our background? None of that matters one jot to me. Are you telling me you're seeing this man? 
I cast my eyes down. I'm not. Well, that's something. I lift my gaze to his once more. But I need you to know I love him. Ever since you made it so clear you didn't approve of us, when you went to see his father and made Noah leave town. And I've never stopped loving him. He's lodged in here. Permanently. I place my hand over my heart. It's pointless for me to ever try to get him out. He's it for me, Daddy. He pulls his brows together. I did what I thought was right at the time and I stand by it. I know you do. But it's not going to change the way I feel about Noah. Emboldened, I take a breath and say, Do you want to know why I was protesting about the development? It's because the old oak tree is the place where Noah and I shared our very first kiss. It's where I fell in love with him. It's where he told me he loved me too. It means so much to me, and I want to preserve it. He examines me for a beat, and for one wild moment, I wonder whether I've got through to him, made him see a point of view that's not his own. He opens his mouth to reply, then closes it again. Perhaps he thought better of it, or perhaps he simply realised there's no point in arguing with me about Noah. We'll see you up at the big house soon, he asks me. I lift my chin and nod, smiling. You will. I'll come back more often if you'd like. I'm sure your mother and Fenella would be very happy to see you. He pulls me in for a green-style hug, short on warmth and length, and then bids me goodbye. I stand and watch as he pulls his coat collar up against the rain on the damp footpath, a sense of peace pervading me. How did it go, Tabby? Prue asks me. You still have a job, I tell her. Oh, thank goodness for that, she gushes. As Prue helps some customers, I return to the desk to reply to emails and think about what I've done. I can barely believe Daddy agreed to my scheme, and I begin to feel like I'm finally taking control of my life. A couple of hours later, out the back of the gallery, Prue points at the carefully wrapped parcel I leaned up against the wall when I arrived earlier today. What's that? Oh, that's actually a painting Noah did for me. I thought I'd put it in the hold. Really, I brought it into the gallery to get it out of my flat. It had sat there on my dresser, taunting me, reminding me that I've lost him. Again. Who needs a daily reminder of that? Noah painted a picture? Who knew he had such talents? I offer her a half smile. I did. Unless, of course, it's utterly ghastly. A guy that hot can't be good at painting. She picks it up and before I can stop her, she rips the packaging off. Prue, don't, I tell her leaping up from my spot at the table. But it's too late. The packaging drops to the floor, and she's holding the painting in her hands. The memory of the night he gave it to me comes flooding back, in a sudden whoosh that sucks the air from my lungs. There's no signature, is her first comment. That's weird, isn't it? She turns to me and lowers the painting. Gosh, Tabby, are you okay? I'm fine. Just got up too fast. I bluff. She holds the painting up once more. I have got to stop her doing that. Why didn't he sign it? He's not an artist. It's just a hobby. Funny, it looks familiar. Without another word, she makes her way into the gallery. I follow her through the open door to see her holding up Noah's painting next to my beloved Frisksit's abstract. What are you doing, Prue? Can't you see it? They look so similar. 
the brush strokes, the colour palette, the composition, even the little detailing here. She points at the familiar set of parallel lines embedded in the bottom left-hand corner of my Frisksitz painting, and then points at an almost exact replica in Noah's painting. And they're both trees, which is weird. The Frisksitz isn't a tree prue, it's an abstract. Yes, of a tree, silly. I regard my beloved painting, but all I can see is the familiar abstract painting staring back at me. You're wrong. Squint your eyes like this. Prue narrows her eyes. I'm not going to do that. Just try it. You'll see a big old tree. I did it on a morning tea break yonks ago, and I've not been able to unsee the tree ever since. Seriously, it's a tree. I hesitate for a moment before I narrow my gaze. Within a few seconds, the abstract shapes and lines I know so well seem to rearrange on the canvas, revealing a large tree with a twisted trunk, its branches heavy with foliage. My mouth drops open. But I never saw that before. See? Told you. Prue beams at me. She looks down at Noah's painting in her hands. Do you think Noah copied Mr. First Kiss's style? Because that's not on if he did. Not on at all. What did you say? I ask, my voice sounding weird, like it's coming from someone else. I said that I wondered if Noah copied his style, because if he did, I cut her off. No, not... That part. The name you used. Oh, that? That's just my silly way of remembering his name. I always forget because it's so odd. Foreign, I suppose. So I rearranged the letters one day on a piece of paper and realised Frisksitz is an anagram of first kiss. Cute, isn't it? Frisksitz. First kiss. Her words hit me like a bolt of lightning in a summer storm. First kiss. Tree. My breath catches in my throat. Noah. I dash across the floor and grab Noah's painting from Prue. Gosh, you're keen, she says as she jerks back in surprise. Sorry, I... I scan Noah's painting and then flick my eyes to the frisk sits. No, it can't be. It's not possible. Is it? I regard both the paintings and wonder, my mouth forming an O. Oh. They do look very similar, just as Prue said. It could be that Noah copied Frisksit's style, but didn't he say he painted this for me when he was 18? And if that's the case, then... Looking up at her, I say... What's today's date? She shoots me a questioning look. You're acting very strange, Tabby. The date, Prue, what is it? I think it's the 23rd or the 24th? Not sure. Which is it? I snap. Then, sorry, I just really need to know what the date is. She taps on her watch and says, It's the 23rd. Why? I make a decision. I've got to go. Her eyes bulge. You're leaving. I dash about, grabbing my raincoat and handbag from the hook and clipping Echo's lead onto her collar. I'll explain everything later. Can you hold down the fort? Of course. I snap my laptop shut and dash across the polished concrete floor. As I reach the door, I turn back to her. You know how you thought Noah wasn't good enough for me? When? Back when we were teenagers, you told me to drop him and go out with Magnus instead. She juts out her chin. You did. You even got engaged to him. I wave her comment away. You were wrong. You and my family and all the others. So wrong. Okay? She replies uncertainly. 
I push the door open and begin to dash down the street, Echo bouncing along at my side as though this is the most fun she's had all day, which it probably is. Where are you going? Prue calls after us. I stop and turn. I'm going to find him, and I'm going to tell him how wrong I've been. Chapter 33 I've been tapping my fingers against my thighs so much I'm in fear of wearing a hole in my skirt. Seriously, how long can a train take? It's meant to be a fast train, stopping only at two other stations on my way to Dalton. But it feels like it's being run by a lazy group of sloths in no hurry to get anywhere at all. I stare out the window, willing the train to move faster as we sail through the countryside. Echo has been lying in the well at my feet, looking up occasionally to check on her highly strung human. I glance down at her and tell her we'll be there soon, but she keeps a wary eye on me, not sure what I'm going to do next. I can't blame her. I'm like a tightly coiled spring, ready to jerk out of my box and hit a wall at a hundred miles an hour. Eventually, after my heart has been thudding so hard for so long that I'm in fear of needing a defibrillator, the train pulls into Dalton Station with a screech of wheels. The moment the doors open, Echo and I dash out onto the platform and hightail it to the taxi stand where, luckily, there's a taxi waiting to take my fare. Do you take dogs? I ask. The driver looks Echo up and down. Nope. She's really well behaved, I promise, and I'll pay you extra. How much extra? I'll double the fare? Triple it. Triple it? I guffaw. Take it or leave it. It's daylight robbery, but all right. I concede with a sigh. I pull the door open and Echo jumps in. To Marlingworth, please, I instruct the driver, who peers at me in his rearview mirror before he starts the engine and pulls the car from the curb. There's a bit of a hullabaloo going on over there today. You sure you want to go? What's happening? I ask, hoping he's going to give me the answer I want to hear. Some big protest about the new development. They all need to keep their hair on as far as I can see. Yes. Is it still going on? Oh, yeah. My girlfriend called me only a few minutes ago to say the contractors have arrived to start chopping that big tree down and they're making a right fuss of it. Anxiety grips me. What are they doing? They were yelling and carrying on, and some of them have even tied themselves to the blinking tree. Can you believe it? I allow myself a small smile through my nerves. I can believe it, yes. Can you take me right into the village? I need to get to that protest. He sizes my black jacket and pencil skirt up in his rearview mirror. Funny. You don't look like one of those tree-hugging types to me. A rush of nerves and excitement moves through me. I only want to hug one tree, I reply. The taxi picks up speed as it leaves Dalton and heads out onto the country lanes. In my head, I know it's only an 18-minute drive between Dalton and Marlingworth, but it feels like the trip takes forever. As we finally pull into the village, the driver slows to a crawl as pedestrians block the road. This will do just fine, thanks, I tell him, and he gladly pulls the car to the curb. I hand him way too much cash and thank him for the ride, and he says, You be careful out there. I don't want to read in the news about a girl in a black suit getting herself hurt. I will. Thanks again. I jump out of the car. And together, Echo and I rush along the street towards the bridge, weaving through the crowds who have gathered to watch the action. I'm not sure Marlingworth has ever seen so many people in one place in its long history, and I wonder whether any of the locals have stayed home today. 
It's noisy and it's busy, and I can hear Dot's distorted chants blaring out from her megaphone from the other side of the river. As Echo and I reach the noble pigeon, someone calls my name, and I turn to see Maisie and Basil Mayhew standing outside their pub, watching the scene unfold. Well, if it isn't Tabitha Green, looking all fancy in a suit, Mrs. Mayhew says with a smile on her face. Tabitha is always fancy, my love. She's a green, Mr. Mayhew corrects. I'm not fancy, I tell them, agitated to move on to find Noah. A question burns in my mind. Although I'm certain I already know the answer, I ask, that painting you've got in the pub, the frisk sits, Noah gave it to you, didn't he? Of course he did, love. That one he painted from his room above the pub, looking out at the field and oak tree. He's forever painting that tree. No wonder he's here protesting. Why do you ask? Mrs. Mayhew says. He's forever painting that tree. My belly flips. No reason. I've got all the confirmation I need. Mrs. Mayhew shoots me a pointed look. Are you here to clean up a certain mess, love? I am. She beams at me. He's over there. She gestures at the old oak tree across the river, and my heart leaps into my mouth. Noah, you go get your love. I'm going to try my best, Mrs. Mayhew, and thank you for everything. I reply, my nerves making my voice warble, probably not unlike the sound of one of Dot's native birds that nest in the oak tree. Who's she getting? And what mess? Is it in the pub? I won't be happy if it's in the pub, Mr. Mayhew asks his wife, but I don't stick around to hear her reply. Instead, I weave my way through the crowd blocking the traffic on the bridge and over to the other side of the river. There, I glance at a group of people in high-vis jackets and hard hats, waiting by their trucks, looking entirely unhappy with the situation unfolding before them. The crew here to cut down the tree. I scan the protesters, desperately searching for Noah. I spot Dot and Caro and a bunch of the other protesters, all in matching T-shirts with the logo soft, chanting with heightened gusto, but no sign of Noah. Tabitha! A voice calls, and I snap my attention to the person yelling in the wild hope it's Noah. It's Jed. Isn't this fantastic? He asks, his eyes shining bright. This whole sea of humanity with directed gusto and just cause. I love it. That's great, Jed. And Echo, the creature with which my creative story began. He places a hand tentatively on Echo's head and she shoots him a suspicious look. You know, Tabitha, I'm going to channel this raw, excited energy into my next project. You see, I've been working with a chicken lately. Her name is Doris and she's got these really amazing feet. A chicken with amazing feet? And her name is Doris. This is too much information for my mind to process right now. I'm so pleased for you, Jed, I reply, as I continue to scan the scene for Noah. Hey, have you seen Noah Grant, the art dealer? He's here? Well, that's just wonderful. It would be if I could find him. Go, run, be gone, both of you, Jed tells me with a hand flourish. Find what you are seeking. I'm not quite sure how to respond, so I simply say, All right, I will. Enjoy your sea of humanity. How can I not, Tabitha? How can I not? I leave Jed and make my way through the knots of people filling the field as I head towards the oak tree. And that's when my eyes finally land on him. 
I come to a sudden stop, Echo pulling on her lead beside me. Wearing a pair of jeans, work boots, and one of the soft T-shirts, Noah standing with a wide, strong stance in front of the tree, a determined look on his face. His arms are looped with Nigel on one side, and a small elderly woman wearing a purple felt hat on the other. He's joining in the chants, telling the tree cutters just how unwelcome they are here, and my heart squeezes for him. It's now or never, Tabitha. On unsteady feet, encased in impractical city heels, I walk across the grass towards him. My nerves are jangling in my belly and making my mouth as dry as a desert. He's in the middle of repeating one of Dot's chants along with the rest of the protesters. A much improved, developers out, the tree must stay, when his eyes land on me. He comes to an abrupt stop, his mouth clamping shut, his expression rendered unreadable. Soaked in trepidation, I approach him. Hello, Noah. I see you're being a human chain. He pulls his lips together and nods. Okay, no humour there. I try a different tack. I glance down at his T-shirt. You're wearing a shirt that says soft. I'm part of the protest, unlike you. He replies pointedly. This may be harder than I first thought. Echo sniffs his hand, her tail wagging, but he's like an impenetrable piece of stone. I plump for direct speech. Can we talk? I'm kind of busy right now. He gestures at Nigel and the woman on his other side. Nigel notices me and his face lights up in a smile. Tabitha, how good of you to come. Join us. He unhooks his arm and gestures for me to stand between him and Noah. I see an inn. If you're sure. My eyes glide from Nigel to Noah, the real target of my question. Sure. Noah replies, his expression still veiled. Nigel's response is a considerably more enthusiastic. Heck yes! Come on in here, Tabitha! I slot myself into place and hook my arm through Nigel's as he bursts into a fresh chant. Holding Echo's lead in my hand, I turn to look at Noah. After a beat, he lifts his arm for me to hook mine through his. I'm so pleased I found you, I say to him over the noise. I need to tell you some things, lots of things, but first I need to... Come on, Tabitha! Nigel interrupts me with a Mexican wave, and I lift my arms and shortly after, Noah follows suit. I try again. What I want to say is... Everyone around me breaks into a chant. Developers out! The tree must stay! Developers out! The tree must stay! Noah, please, I say to him. Another Mexican wave appears and Nigel lifts our arms again before I pass it on to Noah. This is not helpful, I exclaim in exasperation. What, the Mexican wave? Noah asks, and I'm certain he's deriving some enjoyment from my frustration. Yes, the Mexican wave and the chanting, I pause, fully expecting the wave to work its way around the tree again, but everyone's arms stay down. I try again. Noah, I know you're Frisk sits, I say in his ear, so no one else will hear. I expect him to be shocked, to reel back from me with this revelation. Instead, he keeps his expression neutral, his eyes staring straight ahead. How long have you known? Not long. I worked it out this morning. Well, Prue did, really. But as soon as I found out, I had to come and find you. Developers out! The tree must stay, everyone chants, and I join in half-heartedly. Noah turns to face me for the first time since I joined the chain, his eyes boring into me. With his jaw tight, he asks, Why? To get me as a client for your gallery? No, I exclaim aghast. 
the thought hadn't even occurred to me, which is the honest truth. Nigel lifts our arms again, and this time I pull away from him in the tree and turn to Noah. I've hit my limit. There are only so many Mexican waves and chants a girl can contend with when she's trying her best to win the love of her life back. Noah, please look at me, I plead, and wait until he turns back to face me before I launch into the speech I rehearsed on the train here. It's loud and hard to be heard, but I press on, my voice raised above the noise. You were right. I hadn't changed. I was still the same girl who was afraid to step outside the realms of what everyone told me I ought to do, who I ought to be. My friends and family, my dad especially, told me you weren't good enough for me back then. But they were wrong, Noah. So wrong. You're twice the person I am, and I was lucky to have you in my life for those fifteen months. He pulls his gaze from mine as another Mexican wave rolls around the tree. Dot calls out a fresh chant, and it enlivens the group who repeat it back to her. Kill the tree! Kill the village! Kill the tree! Kill the village! They chant with gusto. You broke my heart, he admits, staring off into the distance. Back then, when you ended things with me, I never got over it. Regret and guilt and sorrow swell inside me. I reach out for his hand. I know I did. I broke my own heart, too. He turns his gaze back to me, and I'm certain I sense a softening in his eyes. I need you to know I've told Daddy I'm going to buy him out of the gallery, and I'm giving him back his flat, too. Don't do any of that for me, he warns. I'm not. It's for me, I promise, and it's been a long time coming. I... I need to learn to stand on my own two feet, to live up to my own standards, not those set for me by my family or my friends or anyone. He studies my face for a beat, before he unhooks his arm from the old woman's and tells Nigel to take his place. He steps closer to me, and my pulse quickens. What about the protest? The tree? I thought you were telling me to choose between what you want and what my dad wants. But I can see what you mean now. This place. This tree. I gesture around me. It means the world to you. You come here and you paint it because you love it, don't you? He gives a tight nod. And you kept it from me because you thought I didn't want to be with you. Because I broke your heart. My heart is hammering so loud, I swear the people around me can hear it over the chance. Noah, I know now that at my party, you were asking me to be my own person, to stand up for what I believe in. I want to save this tree because it represents us, and I choose you, Noah. I choose us, because I love you with all my heart, and I have loved you ever since that day we first kissed under this very tree. I look up into the sea of foliage above our heads, the dappled light flashing into my eyes. Turning back to Noah, I say, I've never stopped. It's always been you, Noah. Always. He's watching me, his eyes intense. It's always been you too, Duchess. At the mention of my nickname, I know he's truly heard me, and I couldn't stop my huge grin from spreading ear to ear for all the oak trees Barnabas Babington planted in England. I beam at him, my heart full. You don't know how long I've waited to hear that. Twelve or so years? He asks, those thoroughly kissable lips of his lifting into a heart-melting smile. Since our first kiss under this tree, Mr. First Kiss. He lets out a laugh and it makes me giddy. Did you only just work that one out? 
I tap the side of my head. Not too smart. Oh, I think you're plenty smart. In one move, he covers the ground between us and wraps his big, strong arms around me, pulling me against his firm body. I love you so much, Tabitha Green. He murmurs in my ear, his warm breath tingling my neck. And then his lips find mine in the most exquisite kiss of my life, his unadulterated passion for me literally sweeping me off my feet. Light-headed with joy, I kiss him right back, my knees weak, my heart full with my love, my Noah. The sound of cheering pulls us both back to reality, and at first, I think it's for us. But as we look around, we see the workers in the high-vis jackets climbing into their trucks and leaving. And I know it's for the victory the protesters have achieved here today. Do you see that? I ask Noah excitedly. They're leaving. Can you believe it? I laugh out loud tears filling my eyes. It's incredible. The protesters dance and whoop and celebrate their win, slapping Noah on the back and beaming at me. I look around me with satisfaction, Noah's arms slung protectively around my shoulder, Echo watching the action with excited eyes, her tail wagging. My eyes land on a familiar figure at the edge of the field, Wearing a Shetland jacket and a pair of corduroy trousers, he's turning away, but not before he catches my eye. He gives me a smile and a wink. I lift my hand to wave at him, and then he turns and walks away. Was that your father? Noah asks. Do you, do you think he called it off? Well, they're all leaving. I watch as my father's figure gets lost in the crowd, and a sense of contentment spreads across my chest. Perhaps Daddy listened to me when I saw him earlier today? Perhaps he has finally seen my worth. Right in this moment, I can't know the truth. All I can know is that the workers have gone, and I have Noah back. Deliriously happy doesn't even begin to express how I feel. Dot's voice blares over the megaphone. Today, we have seen a victory, she says to an uproarious cheer. Today, we have seen the developers back down. More cheering. Today, we have saved the field and the tree. A fresh cheer erupts and people around us begin to chant, Soft, soft, soft. I let out a giggle. They have really got to get a better acronym. I don't know. Soft has a certain ring to it. Noah replies. Our gazes lock and we share a smile. Who wants to celebrate to the noble pigeon? Dot announces. As the protesters disperse around us on their way to the pub across the bridge, Noah takes me by the hand and leads Echo and me to the other side of the old oak tree, the side hidden from view. He pulls me against him, and I slide my hands around his firm waist, feeling the sinew of his muscular torso beneath the soft fabric of his T-shirt. He buries his face in my hair, his breath warm on my neck. Remember when we came here when we were just sixteen? He asks, how could I forget? It was the best first kiss of my life. The only first kiss that's ever mattered. I loved you before I even brought you here. A smile claims my face. I did too. He leans down and brushes his lips tantalizingly against mine, leaving me wanting so much more from him. Let's do this properly this time, okay? Do you mean kiss? Well, kiss, obviously. But also, let's not mess it up. Let's make it stick. I grin up at him. Make it stick. I like the sound of that. 
This time, it's my turn to pull him in for a kiss. And as I do, the memory of our first kiss merges with the here and now. And I know with certainty that Noah Grant is my one and only true love. Epilogue One Year Later I glance down the long table, covered in a series of white tablecloths, Mrs. Mayhew, who now insists I too call her and her husband by their first names, got in specifically for my birthday dinner. Fenella and her husband are busy feeding their children, Persephone balanced on Fen's knee as Teddy keeps the twins happy with strawberries and slices of watermelon. They're flanked by Mummy and Daddy, who are dressed as they always are in their respective uniforms, looking deeply uncomfortable to be eating at the Noble Pigeon, but here all the same. I shoot them a smile. Grateful they are here to help me celebrate turning the grand old age of 31. I know, I'm old, ancient. But, as my London babes put it to me earlier today, when they gave me another year's supply of dog food and treats from Penelope's pooches for Echo, when you run a successful gallery, live in a rented flat that you adore in Notting Hill, and most importantly, have won back the man you've always, always loved, being 31 really isn't so bad. In fact, it's pretty dang good. Noah rises to his feet at my side and clinks a fork against his half-filled pint glass. My family, the London babes, Prue and her family, the Mayhews, Jed, and Caro, Dot, and Nigel from Soft quiet their chatting and look at him. I just wanted to say a few words, and I won't be too long because I know we've got some important dancing to do after dinner. First of all, thank you to Maisie and Basil for this incredible pie feast today. Charlie, I know you in particular appreciate the cottage pie here, and I hope everyone has enjoyed their selection. Second favorite after the black cats, Charlie replies. You're rating a London pub's cottage pie higher than ours, Mrs. Mayhew asks, indignant. It's only because he eats it several times a week, Mrs. Mayhew, Kennedy replies. Well, you'll be sure to come back here and eat ours more often and see if we can't change your mind, she sniffs. Charlie grins at her. With great pleasure, Mrs. Mayhew, believe me. Noah clears his throat. Can we focus here, people? Go ahead, Noah, Kennedy tells him. Along with the Mayhews, I also want to thank the sometimes unreliable British summer for playing its part today. Because as we former Californians know, he looks at Asha and Kennedy, it sure loves to rain in this country. Liquid sunshine, Asha calls out from down the other end of the table, his glass raised. Now, we all know why we're here today, and that's to celebrate the birth of this woman by my side. He smiles down at me, and I can't help but beam back at him. It's hard to believe it's been a year since we found one another again. And I, for one, am so happy to have this incredible, brave, and beautiful person back in my life. I let out a contented laugh. I do so love it when he says things like that. So, can we all raise our glasses to toast the birthday girl, Tabitha? 31 today. Each person raises their glass. Even my nephews, Hades and Ares, get in on the action by holding their plates up above their heads and giggling as bits of fruit land on both them and the table. Fenella rolls her eyes at me before her face breaks into a smile. My clever Greek gods, she tells the table to laughter. Speech, Tabitha, speech, Zara calls, and I rise to my feet and kiss Noah before he takes his seat and everyone hushes once more. My good friend Kennedy, 
told me that your thirties totally rock. And you know what? She's 100% correct. They rock hard. Most of you will know that I was a bit of a mess in my twenties. No! Zara, Lottie, Asha and Kennedy all say with a laugh, winning a good-humoured glare from me. But, so far, my thirties have been amazing. I flick my gaze to Noah to see him smiling up at me from his seat. I've got a few people to thank for that. First of all, my wonderful and long-suffering friends, who have been there for me when I've been at my lowest. Kennedy, Lottie, Zara, Asha, Prue. I love each and every one of you, and without you, my life would certainly not be the same. We love you too, Tabby, Prue says from her spot next to her husband. On to my family. We greens don't show how much we love each other the way other families do, but I want you all to know that I love you very much, and I'm so happy you came here today. I grin at my parents, and they offer me tight smiles in return. So very green. It's also amazing to have Caro, Nigel, and Dot here, the all-important members of SOFT, who helped save the old oak tree that means so much to so many. To SOFT, Asher says, raising his glass. May our hearts be forever soft, but please keep our abs hard. He flashes us his grin as Zara nudges him with her elbow. I let out a surprised laugh. I wondered where you were going with that. Always PG, you know me, he replies with a wink. Shall I get back to my speech? Hey, it's your party, he replies. I also want to say that being back here in Marlingworth is made extra special by this guy right here. My Noah, we share a smile. Thank you for coming back into my life and buying all of Jed's artwork. Hear, hear, a tiddly Jed says, with his empty glass raised, and for making me absolutely beyond happy. I finish. Noah rises to his feet and plants a kiss on my cheek. You're welcome, he says with a laugh. We share a moment before I tell everyone that dessert is on its way, and we sit back down at the long table. Sometime later, after saying goodnight to the children and their respective parents, and seeing my own parents off as well, we dance into the night under the glowing festoon lights strung up above us. As the evening light begins to fade, Noah takes me by the hand and leads me from the group, across the river to the other side. Let's go see our tree, he tells me. We walk hand in hand, through the field with its long grass, a new chill in the air, as the evening sun begins to fade. The birds call good night, and the crickets chirp their love songs. As we reach our tree, I inspect the progress on the new development. The frames are up and the foundations laid, ready to be made into the collection of houses Daddy and his fellow Wilson construction owners envisioned. Only, it's just a handful of houses, not the full development they originally planned. You see, that big day of the protest, almost a year ago, my father did something for the very first time in his life. He compromised, a word once so foreign to him, you could yell it right in his face and he still wouldn't understand you. But, to his credit, the day I presented him with my business plan for 496, he went away and thought about what I had said, particularly about what I wanted. Apparently, not one green in the history of the family had ever turned down family money, preferring instead to drink the well dry. His daughter surprised him that day, and it worked. When he reached Marlingworth, he persuaded his business partners to reduce the size of the development 
so that they could save the tree and part of the field and still make a decent wad of cash while appeasing the very loud villagers. It was the perfect compromise for everyone, even for Dot's long list of birds. As for Noah, well, that's another story. Although my parents have not exactly welcomed him with open arms into the fold, it turns out keeping his daughter happy is somewhat of a priority for my father these days. So, he's accepted that I love a man he would prefer I did not, and has even employed Noah to help him purchase some new artwork. Through 496, naturally. As for Noah and me... Let's just say I never imagined it could be this good between two people. But now that I know, there is no way on this sweet earth that I'm ever going to let him go. Standing under the old oak tree, Noah takes my hands in his. Did you know I love you, Duchess? He asks, his voice low and intimate. I've had my suspicions for some time now. He chuckles. I've got a question for you. As long as you kiss me first. He leans down and brushes his lips against mine. There's more of that to come. There had better be, Mr. Grant, I warn. What's your question? He reaches into the back pocket of his jeans and produces a small velvet box. I gaze at it barely believing my eyes, my pulse quickening. Could this mean what I think it means? I flick my gaze to his and see the depth of love he has for me in his eyes. My question is, he begins, before he drops to one knee. Immediately my hands fly to my mouth and I suck in a sharp breath. Oh, my, it does mean what I think it means. Tabitha Green. He begins, looking up at me. My Duchess, I have loved you since before I became a man, and even though I tried, I could never get you out of my heart. My own heart is beating out of my chest, and I'm trembling all over. This is really happening. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I want babies with you. I want Echo to have a daddy. I give a gurgling laugh, which ends in a snort. He opens the box to reveal an oval sapphire, surrounded by diamonds, glinting at me from its soft cushion. Tabitha Green, love of my life, will you marry me? It's Kate's ring, I exclaim. Well, a replica. Oh, Noah, it's gorgeous. I tell him, thank you. You haven't answered my question, you know. Oh, yes, yes, a million times yes, I will marry you. I leap into his arms, plunking my bum down on his bent knee and peppering him with kisses. My heart is so full of love for this man, it's in fear of bursting. I hoped you'd say that, he replies, before he pulls me into a swoony kiss to end all swoony kisses, our bodies pressed against one another, our arms holding us close. She said yes, Noah calls out, and a cheer goes up across the river. I look over to see my friends grouped on the riverbank, watching us. Go, Tabitha! We love you guys! You two are the best! Yeah! I let out a giggle and wave at them before I turn to Noah. They knew, I ask. I only mentioned it to Asher, Charlie, and James on the golf course this morning. And they told my friends. I guess they did. I let out a contented laugh as I shake my head at him. I love you so bloomin' much. Did you know that? I kinda hoped you did. He pulls the ring from the box and slips it on the ring finger on my left hand. It looks perfect. I gaze down at it. It does. Who knew we'd be back here, 
under this tree, where it all began. He asks, as he pulls me back into him. I didn't dare dream it, but now that we're here, it feels like it was always meant to be. We share a smile, and then I loop my hands around the back of his neck. You're the only man I've ever loved. Let's keep it that way, shall we? I pull him into another kiss and murmur. Oh, I fully intend to. The end. This has been Never Fall for Your One That Got Away, book four in the It's Complicated series, written by Kate O'Keefe, narrated by Holly Warren, produced by Blake Long Audio.